Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto inherited the most insane genetically mutated Mokaton bloodline limit? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. Naruto was a quiet child at the young age of six. His violet eyes carried the innocence befitting of a child his age. For the first four years of his life, all he has seen was a laboratory and a small room. The pale-faced man with slitted eyes was the only adult he ever saw. He doesn't remember much of the man, considering all the contact he had with him was when the man injected him with painful injections. Those just made him feel weird. He didn't think his life was terrible, though. He was fed daily and had a roof on his head, so he never complained. However, this changed when one day, an old man wearing a red hat and white robes came barging into the lab, followed by a dozen masked men. The pale-faced man was able to flee. However, only Naruto and one other child, who was slightly older than him, were all that were left alive after the man's sick experiments. Naruto did not have his name when he was rescued, however, he was always called by the pale man by his tag number. It was two years ago when he found out that people actually had names instead of numbers. He still remembers. He was taken to a room with white walls and no windows, along with the other child, who he distinctly remembered seeing in the lab once. A blonde man with a ponytail, probably in his early twenties, stood in front of them. The man saw their nervousness and thought that maybe some good food would make the children open up slightly. He told them to wait and came back carrying two bowls of something. Eat up. The man dawdled. Neither of the children moved. This is ramen, it won't do you any harm. Of course, considering that you don't just eat ramen every day. The man attempted a joke, but no one laughed. Of course, they don't know how to use chopsticks. He palmed his forehead. Here, I'll help. He offered and used the chopsticks to begin feeding them. After eating the first bite, he admitted to himself, mentally, of course, that ramen was the most incredible thing he had ever had. It didn't matter that all he was used to eating was dry and packaged food. This was the first time he had eaten anything that had anything resembling flavor. He stared at the man with wide eyes. The man chuckled. It is good, hum. It even has my favorite topping, Naruto Maki. The man laughed, seeing the child's astound expression. He was still looking at the bowl. Naruto, he mumbled as he looked at the swirly pattern thing. When both of them had finished eating, the man faced them again. Let's see now, my name is Yamanaka Inoichi. What are your names? Do you remember anything before you were at that place? His tone was gentle. He called me number 17, the man arched an eyebrow at that. Numbers. I was number 4, the older of the two said. Well, now. That won't do at all. Say say. What is it that you like the most? The man asked them childishly, grinning. He did not want to scare them at all now that they were finally talking. The children were quiet for a while. Suddenly, the younger of the two, the blonde-haired kid, replied in a meek voice, Ramen. Inoichi laughed loudly at the response. Ramen, hum. All right. How about? He stopped to think, tapping his chin with his index finger. Naruto. Do you like the name Naruto? The man ruffled his hair. Naruto nodded a little. The other child, however, was silent. The man faced him and said, What about you? Do you like anything? He did not reply. Seeing this, the man sighed. Ah. If that's the case, then, how about Tenzo? Hum. The child looked at him confusingly and mumbled, Ten. Zo? However, the man perceived his tone as accepting and nodded. Then let's get going now, Naruto, Tenzo. After that Naruto, and a still confused Tenzo was admitted to an orphanage. However, Tenzo mysteriously disappeared one day and would not be seen for a few years. That was when he found out about his love for all things ramen. He might regret naming himself after a ramen topping when he grows up, but right now, the only thing Naruto loved was ramen. The orphanage matron was a woman in her late fifties, simply called by the kids as, Granny. She was a kind lady who loved taking care of children. The orphanage had a, box, where people may give anything they would like. When the box was sufficiently filled, the things were distributed among the kids by the matron. It usually had toys for children so, Naruto never took anything after the first few times. One such day, the matron came to him, Naruto? 
She knocked and then entered the room. She found him sitting on the bed, practicing his writing. His room was plain. Brown painted walls, four beds, one in each corner, and a window. He was almost always alone, either practicing his calligraphy in a notebook or usually sitting under a tree near the river, listening to the song of insects and chirping of the birds. Naruto always felt oddly at peace near the river and the trees and never liked closed rooms after the first four years spent in isolation. Other kids usually avoided him because he rarely spoke more than a few words and never showed any interest in playing games with them, and thus was dubbed as the boring kid. She sat across from him on the bed and looked at him. I want you to have this, she showed something in her hand. I know you don't like toys, so I wanted to give you this. It was a thin object, wrapped in a cloth. Curiosity got the better of him, and he took it in his hands. Upon unraveling it, he looked at it, mesmerized. It was a brown colored flute somewhat old but well cared for, and had black highlights. He looked into her eyes, surprised. I know that you never knew your birthday, but today, the 17th of January, is the day when you came here last year, so it could be your birthday in a way after all. She grinned at him. This belonged to my mother when I was your age. I loved when she played it. I could never learn how to play, so I kept it with me all this time, but I think it would be better if you kept it. Happy birthday, Naruto. He felt something in his chest, something painful and pleasant at the same time, and grabbed at it. Happiness. Is this what happiness feels like? He thought with moist eyes but stayed silent. He looked at Granny, and she smiled, knowing what he was feeling. She patted his head lovingly and stood up to leave. She heard a muffled, thank you, when she was standing at the door and looked over her shoulder. Naruto was a good kid, and she had really been trying to make him feel happier. It was the first time in his life that young Naruto smiled, and it was breathtakingly beautiful. That day, somehow, the trees and flowers bloomed all around the village of Konoha unlike ever before. On October 10, he experienced fear for perhaps the first time in his admittedly short life. He was out in the park, sitting alone on a swing and watching other kids playing. Granny has been pushing him to make some friends since he had none, but he wasn't very enthusiastic about it. The first thing he saw was a great fire in the distance. People started panicking. They scooped their children and started running out of the park. He followed them too. That's when he first saw it. A giant fox thrashed in the middle of the village as it destroyed everything around it. He stood motionless in the middle of the street. Feeling so small and insignificant, watching with wide eyes as the giant fox was suddenly trapped with golden chains. It roared as debris flew everywhere. He surely would have died if not for a black-haired girl around his age, who was carrying a baby with her, grabbed him by the hand and pulled him along. He was too shocked to even resist. If he would have looked around instead of being fixed on the fox, he would have noticed the countless dead bodies surrounding him. Come with me. Quick, the girl shouted. The girl put on a brave face. However, Naruto could see her hands trembling. She was perhaps even more scared than him, but she was still running and holding the baby protectively. Naruto wondered if there would ever be anything so important to him that he'd protect it with his life. It sounded stupid to him and made his head hurt at the same time, so he stopped thinking about it. Why were you not moving? Do you not want to live? She asked him when they reached the shelter. However, Naruto did not react to her question and kept staring at the baby in her arms, eyes containing curiosity. Upon noticing where he was staring, she told him, This is Sasuke, my little brother. Naruto averted his eyes and did not say anything. Hours passed, and finally, it was all quiet. The raven-haired girl had earlier left to find her parents. When they all went outside, everything was in rubbles around them. People were silent, mourning. Even though he knew he never had anything to lose. Even though he knew he had no one important to him, he still couldn't figure out why he felt like he lost something very important today, why? Why was he still crying? Sarutobi Hirazan was having an awful day. Yesterday he was with his wife at his home, smoking his pipe and enjoying the weather. It all changed in a single day. His wife was dead. His successor, Namikaze Minato, and his wife Uzumaki Kashina gave their lives for the village and left their child orphaned. Half the village was in ruins. He just wanted this nightmare to end, wanted to go back to his home, where his wife would surely be waiting for him, and gaze outside the window while smoking his pipe. But this was no dream, and his wife was very dead. A council meeting was called. All the clan heads were summoned since all of them survived the attack. His old friends and advisors, Yutatane Kaharu, 
Mitokado Homura, and Shimura Danzo, were present as well. In the corner was a cradle with a baby sleeping in it. Konoha has lost her Hokage. Twelve hours ago, Kayubi was somehow extracted from its previous Jinchuriki, Uzumaki Kashina. Minato and Kashina did not survive, unfortunately, but they saved us all by sealing the beast inside of this child. Hiruzen had a face that made it obvious he was tired. His eyes had dark bags underneath them, and his face was even more wrinkled somehow. The mood around the table was somber, and no one spoke for a while. It was one thing to hear about the rumors of the Hokage's death and another thing to have it confirmed. This child, is it Yandaimi's? Homura asked. It was not well known, but the only Uzumaki in the village was in a relationship with Minato, so it was not far-fetched. Hiruzen was silent, and everyone drew their conclusions. Konoha has lost a lot of her shinobi, we don't need other nations sniffing around at our moment of weakness. Give me the guardianship of the Jinchuriki, and I will train this child to be the most powerful shinobi of Konoha. It's perfect weapon. It was Danzo who said this, and no one was surprised. However, almost everyone present knew what he meant by it. However flawless it might seem to his advisors, the idea had its own demerits, and Hiruzen was all too quick to point them out. I cannot let you do that, Danzo, he spoke with a grave but authoritative voice. Even if what you say is right, a Jinchuriki's true strength comes from their emotions. Your methods may look promising on the surface, but it will be counterproductive in the long run. Perhaps, he might have been a bit biased because of the child's ancestry, but the three had known Serutobi long enough to know that he would not be budging. Danzo stared at him with his lone eye but did not speak again. The civilians and all the shinobi below rank Junin will be prohibited from this knowledge. We all know how the Jinchuriki are treated. People fear what they do not understand. That fear turns to anger, and anger turns to hatred. If this child was hated by the village and grew to hate the village back, it would be most disastrous. Shikaku, the Nara clan head, nodded his head in agreement. However, it didn't seem like everyone present agreed with it. No one could tell what the Uchiha and Hyuga clan heads, or Danzo for that matter, were thinking due to their stoic faces. No one voiced any objections if they had any, and other matters were discussed. It would be a long while before anything resembling an order is established. When the council was adjourned, Hiruzen covered his face with his palms and took a deep breath, dismissing his anbu. He spoke to apparently no one. Jiraiya. A tall man with spiky, waist length white hair and red lines under his eyes suddenly materialized out of thin air, his hands crossed. His expressions were set grim in stone. I'll find out the bastard, Jiraiya said with gritted teeth. I'll find out who did this. He was too late. He was ashamed to admit that while his student was fighting for his life, he was out there peeping on women in a bathhouse. He came as soon as he could, but Minato was already gone. Hiruzen didn't reply for a long time. The Yandaimi is gone. Konoha needs a new Hokage, one that. No, Jiraiya refused even before he was finished. A master does not succeed his own student, and I'm not even half as worthy of being Hokage as Minato was. Seems you will have to retake the seat, Sensei, he spoke with a sad smile. Seems like it, Hiruzen sighed. Well, do you wish to see your goddaughter? He asked him, and Jiraiya moved to see the cradle in the corner. A bittersweet smile adorned the toad sage's face. She looks just like her parents, he thought, so much that it almost hurt him to just look. I know, Jiraiya, I know, his sensei only looked at his face to realize what he was thinking about. Will you take her with you? Kakashi is too young, and they named you her godfather for precisely this reason after all. No, sensei, he shook his head. I'm constantly on the move. I can't always take her with me. If she is with me, then her life would be in even more trouble than it already will be. And Orochimaru is still out there. She would be safer in the village. I will look out for her anyway. It was sound logic, and his sensei didn't argue. Well then. I suppose it is time I return to my research. I'm sure Minato would want me to continue writing his favorite books. His voice cracked with emotion as he attempted to laugh in his usual persona to find some sense of normality. He moved to the window and turned his face away from his teacher. Hiruzen didn't need to look at his student's face to know he was crying. Farewell, sensei, he let out before jumping out of the window. Hiruzen felt oddly alone in his office now. His student, Jiraiya, considered Minato a son. Hiruzen could not claim that he knew how it felt. Losing a son was not something he wanted to experience. 
He looked at the sleeping child, and his eyes softened. Minato, Kashina. Watch over her. Naruto-chan, are you sure about this? It has been four months since Kyubi's rampage, and after a large amount of damage control, Konoha was able to recover somewhat. Since a large number of shinobi were lost in the attack, the children were being encouraged to join the academy at an early age. After little consideration, Naruto decided to join the academy. He did not want to feel weak ever again, he promised himself. That feeling of hopelessness he felt back then was terrifying. He wanted to be strong. Thus, he voiced his decision to join the academy to Granny. And naturally, she was not very convinced. Naruto has become one of her favorite kids over the past few months. And he was always insisting on helping her, be it with the groceries, laundry, or in the kitchen. Yes. I really want to be a ninja. I want to be strong too. He insisted, determination in his eyes. Honestly, she just didn't want to see him go. She knew as soon as an orphan gets admitted to the academy, they are eligible for a stipend to rent an apartment until they graduate. Naruto will similarly be living at his own place if he wishes to. Sometimes Naruto wondered if this was what having a mother felt like. It made him happy, but she overdid it sometimes. Granny sighed. Fine, we'll get you admitted to the ninja academy. She ruffled his hair and smiled sadly. Naruto smiled toothily a little, and Granny giggled. Wah. Why are you laughing? He tilted his head. She continued to giggle. It's nothing. I just like watching you smile. She didn't lie but didn't tell him the true reason she was laughing for. His missing tooth made him look even cuter when he smiled. She will miss him. The academy started in the summer. Naruto chose to live in his own small apartment. The stipend was just enough for him to buy his groceries and pay monthly rent while saving some money for other things. They were required to pass a reasonably easy aptitude test for the entrance, and Naruto had no problem in that department. Naruto was wearing a white t-shirt with gray shorts. There were a lot of children present. Most of them were with their parents, but a fair bit were standing alone. Naruto felt somewhat nervous, being around so many people. He looked around a bit and noticed that the raven-haired girl that saved his life was here as well. She was present with a man, who he assumed was her father, and her mother carrying her younger brother. He looked as the baby kept whining to be held by his sister, but the girl just smiled at her brother in apology and said something. The baby pouted and looked away, directly in his direction. Upon noticing where her little brother was looking, the girl's eyes widened in recognition, and she waved at him. Naruto, embarrassed that he was caught staring, snapped his face to where the Hokage was giving his welcome speech. Congratulations on your acceptance to the academy, everyone. Hiruzen briefly looked over the audience, his eyes lingering on Naruto's hair for a bit more than rest. He blinked his eyes and shoved the impossible thought to the back of his mind, resuming his speech. Naruto was confused. For a second, he swore that the Hokage recognized him, but he doesn't remember ever talking to him. After the speech was over, the academy classes were started, and the parents left their children. Naruto took a seat back in the left corner. He watched as the class was filled up and the raven-haired girl took a seat in the front row. She glanced at him once and then, huffing, puffed her cheeks and turned away from him. Naruto twitched a brow. What did he do to annoy her? Soon, a fairly large man with brown hair, wearing the standard Konoha uniform, entered the class. Congratulations to everyone. From today onward, we will start our curriculum. I hope all of you will work hard and become excellent shinobi. My name is Dekoku Funeno, rank Chunin, and I will be your teacher for the foreseeable future. Let's do the introductions. Just your name is enough for now. Soon everyone started introducing themselves and soon the raven-haired girl stood up at her turn. Uchiha Izumi. As soon as she said this, some kids started whispering among themselves. Uchiha. I heard they are very stuck up, she's so pretty. K. I bet she's here only because she's part of a big clan. Izumi glared at the last one but ignored the first two. I'll show you. Enough. You are not here to gossip or spread rumors. Next, Funeno barked. A girl with tattoo markings on her face stood up with confidence. I'm Inazuka Hana. Soon it was his turn, and as he stood up, he saw Izumi looking at him from the corner of her eye. I'm Naruto. I hope we get along, he bowed a bit, just like he was taught. Some kids laughed. Wait, he is named Fishcake. What kind of parents name their kid Fishcake? Even their sensei was failing to hide his smile. He sat down in embarrassment and turned away, mumbling bitterly, 
who said my parents were there to name me. His voice was drowned in the laughter, but he noticed Izumi looking at him owlishly. After introductions, they talked about the essential things for being a shinobi, rank, jutsu, etc. Soon it was midday, and they were taken out for lunch. He saw everyone forming groups and sighed. Granny would nag me to make some friends, he found himself a tree and sat under it, away from everyone else. As soon as he opened his lunchbox, he saw someone's feet. Following up with his eyes, he saw it was that raven-haired girl named Izumi. She looked at him scrutinizingly. I was shocked, I was sure you were mute. You never said anything back when we first met, she said cheekily, squinting her eyes. You know, it's pretty rude to ignore someone who's waving at you. I was just startled. He ignored the last statement and didn't look into her eyes. Uh huh. Her tone laced with sarcasm. Thanks for that day, I would have died if not for you. He scratched his cheek and looked away. It's all right. If you're really thankful, we can just say that you owe me a favor, she grinned. Naruto smiled awkwardly. Anyway, I'll see you later. It was nice meeting you, Fishcake. She ran away laughing when she saw him almost pouting. What a weird girl. When the lunch was over, they were brought in a clearing. We'll be having friendly spars to make out the basic standings of class. Let's see, first. Naruto, and Izumi. Step in the middle, and make the unison sign before you begin. You will stop when I say so or if your back touches the ground. Both the children copied the sign he showed them and took their respective positions. Naruto took a deep breath and faced Izumi, looking into her eyes. He took a makeshift stance. Izumi just stood with one hand above her abdomen, still making the seal. Their hands met in the sign of unison and the warmth faded from her eyes, something that made him uneasy. Begin. The instructor barked, and Naruto ran at Izumi fast as he could. It all happened in a moment. One moment he was facing her, standing. The next moment he was looking at the blue sky, Izumi above him. Her two fingers that were used to make the seal were pointing between his eyes. He stared at her, wide eyed. Everyone was silent. The kids who made fun of her earlier were gaping. She smiled suddenly and got off him, and offered her right hand to him, still making the seal. Naruto couldn't believe it. He never would have imagined that this skinny girl, who was probably a year younger than him, would be this strong. He forgot to breathe and coughed suddenly. I am weak. He took her hand shakily and stood up, dusting his pants. He didn't look in her eyes. Yu Uchiha Izumi wins. The instructor got his voice under control. The other kids were still gaping. It was to be expected. Her skills would put even some genin to shame. Well, it was kind of expected from the Uchiha princess. Uchiha Izumi was one to keep an eye on for sure. Soon all the spars were concluded, and it became clear that the children who were from a ninja clan had an advantage over their civilian counterparts. As the last of the tests were completed, one of which was throwing kanai, in which he was barely able to get one on the target, and that two was pretty far from the mark, the class standings were put out on the board for everyone to see. Uchiha Izumi got the first ranking by a vast margin. Naruto was among the last 10% of students. Soon, it was evening, and the class got over. Everyone was moving out of the room while talking to their newly made friends. Naruto stood up from his seat and moved out dejectedly, not looking at anything and facing down. When he was out of the academy grounds, he started running and didn't look back. Izumi saw him and frowned. Was I too tough on him? Maybe I should have taken it a bit easier, she shook her head. He ran, and ran, and ran until the buildings blurred into trees and the smell of damp wood replaced the smell of street food. He reached his usual clearing, the tree near the riverbank. The sun was not yet set, but it was getting close. He fell down on his backside, leaning on the tree with hands behind his head. The branches seemed to move towards him. It was almost like they were trying to comfort him. He took a deep breath. I knew I won't be the best, but I never thought there'd be this much of a difference, it was pretty humiliating, if he was to be honest. He had to get stronger, but how? He would need some basic guidance, it would seem. And if he wants to surpass the kids at the academy, he might have to do something extra. Maybe try his hand on the library. It was rare for any of the students to show any interest in books, so no one should disturb him. Yes. He nodded to himself. That sounds like a plan. He would start from the absolute beginning. Naruto sighed and relaxed, looking at the sunset now that his problem was solved, he decided it wouldn't be so bad if he were to stay for a while, and took out his flute from the backpack. No one was waiting at his home. 
After all, he had his own apartment now. Uchiha Izumi was born on July 9 to Uchiha Fugaku, the Uchiha clan head and his wife Uchiha Makoto. When she was born, her father tried his absolute best to feel disappointed and act as distant as he could since he wanted a boy, an heir who would be seen as the pride of the Uchiha. But upon looking into her eyes, eyes that contained so much innocence in them, even Fugaku, Uchiha Fugaku, who was known to be as stuck up as they come, was reduced to a man-child. It was a rumor among the clan that Fugaku cried like a little girl when Izumi uttered her first word, which was, Papa. Fugaku managed to get his, fatherly instincts, under control as Izumi grew up, but his love for his daughter was still undeniable. Makoto wasn't any better. She was always dressing her up in different clothes, gushing over her. Her best friend, Uzumaki Kashina, was taken by her as well, to the point where she loved her as though she was her own daughter. It played a large part in her recovering from her first child's death which broke her completely, and Makoto knew this, so she frequently called Kashina over or visited her. The Uchiha clan as a whole, however, was split. The older generation among the population believed her to only be good for marrying off to another Uchiha, a strong male of their preference. It was because, in Uchiha clan, even though girls are trained well, they are expected to become stay-at-home wives when they get married. On the other hand, the younger generation had a more open point of view. It was also a rumor that when some old Uchiha councilmen brought forth this idea, Fugaku had flat out refused to ever marry his precious daughter and giving her off to some guy, even threatening the old coot with bodily harm if he ever pursues his clearly insane plan, according to him anyway. But rumors are just rumors, right? When Izumi was three, her father started her training after some, polite discussions with his wife. There was no way his daughter, Uchiha Fugaku's daughter, was going to be a weak sissy, and he was pleasantly surprised. His daughter was a genius. She quickly picked up things that any three-year-old child had no right of doing. Fugaku's chest would have burst from so much pride. When Izumi was four years old, her younger brother Sasuke was born. Fugaku was so happy that he almost smiled in front of the doctor. Almost. Now he had a son, and his clearly superior genes would allow Sasuke to be just as talented as his older sister, and he could finally shut up the old coots of the clan. When Izumi saw her younger brother for the first time, she was instantly attached and promised herself to always protect him. Sasuke seemed to return her affections, so that was really cool. When she was five, her father got her admitted to the ninja academy. She was very excited for the first day. She wanted to make lots of friends and go on awesome missions as soon as possible. Izumi was standing with her parents and her brother while the Hokage gave the welcome speech. Her brother kept insisting her to notice him, almost falling down from her mother's hip. She smiled apologetically. Maybe next time Sasuke. Her brother pouted and looked away. She followed his gaze and found the same weird and mute kid that she saved that day. She waved at him, and he looked away abruptly. HMPH, how rude. She totally kicked his ass for that in the spar that day but then felt a bit bad after watching him leave so dejectedly. It couldn't be helped though, she just had to apologize next time she sees him. When she got home, her father was the first one to greet her. He seemed quieter than usual, but she ignored it. Izumi, she stopped in her tracks. Father? Walk with me. I'd like to show you something. The duo walked out, and Fugaku took her hand, guiding her. They passed the Uchiha market, people greeting them on the way. Izumi looked at her father's face and thought about where he would be taking her. Soon they arrived at a large clearing, littered with countless small tombstones and a big red one. These are all the people that were lost in the previous war, we won, but it was not without any costs. The countless dead were buried here, for some of them, their bodies were not found, while for some, only a part of their bodies remained to bury for their families. Some of them were as young as nine, Jenin fresh out of the academy, Fugaku said with a grim face. He didn't look at her and stared ahead. Father, why are you showing me all of this? Izumi asked with a trembling voice. She was not used to death despite watching it so closely during the Kyubi attack. She was acting for her brother's safety, purely on adrenaline. Fugaku's eyes softened, but he didn't look at her. A shinobi's life is never safe. We're in constant danger, even when we are at our home. We might feel like we are safe, but it's just an illusion of safety. A shinobi should always stay on their guard. A good shinobi always learns to distrust people. Those are rules I go by, and it'd be wise for you to do so too. He put his hand on her head. 
You started your journey as a shinobi today when you joined the academy. From this day onwards, don't expect me to treat you like a child. His voice was harsh all of a sudden, and he clamped on her shoulders somewhat forcefully. This is the cold reality of our world. Izumi didn't show it if she was uncomfortable. She kept looking at the names on the tombstone. I thought shinobi were supposed to protect. Yet, so many, so many died. And many of them were so young. Why? Father. Why do we kill? What drives a person to kill another person? How can we kill someone, knowing their families were waiting for them, and they will never see them again? Why? Fugaku clamped tightly on her shoulder and allowed himself to feel proud. His daughter was taking this much better than he expected her to. He was afraid she might hate him or start crying. But she showed she could be mature beyond her age when the situation asks for it. That is something I cannot tell you. You will have to find the answer out yourself one day. She did not speak as they walked back to the district in silence, she was still mulling on all of this. Father, do you hear that sound? She asked suddenly. Hum. What sound? Fugaku looked around. It's probably some animal. We are still far in the woods. I'll be back later, she suddenly darted in the direction where she heard it. Fugaku raised an eyebrow but shook his head and started walking back home. He didn't have to worry. His daughter rarely got lost, if ever. She followed the sound, which was more like a sweet melody. It felt enchanting to her as she kept walking towards it. She noticed the trees moving, swaying, almost dancing to the melody. She saw as a deer calf was sleeping with who was probably its mother. Looking at the branches, she found a lot of birds sitting on them. The flowers felt more alive to her than ever. It was phenomenal. She followed the sound into a clearing, and what she found shocked her. The sun was set, and Naruto stopped playing his flute. It was getting late, and he supposed he should go back to his apartment now. He proba. Whoa, you're really good. He was startled suddenly. Gee ghost? He was ashamed to admit it, but he was absolutely terrified of ghosts. How do you fight something you can't see or touch? He fell on his bum and frantically looked left and right. The voice sounded like a kid's, and it was familiar for some reason. Hey. I'm up here. He looked at the tree he was sitting under and saw that girl who beat him today. She was smiling while sitting on a branch, swaying her legs. How long have you been watching me? He asked warily. It was suspicious. Long enough to hear your beautiful song. You are really good. She grinned at him and winked. Naruto's cheeks had a faint red hue due to embarrassment. He looked away from her to hide his face. It's rude to spy on people. Who said I was spying? I just heard a sound and came here to investigate, but I didn't want to disturb you, so I was quiet. Says the stalker, Naruto mumbled. Hey, he stood up abruptly, facing away from her. You beat me pretty easily today, you're really strong, so. Hey hey sorry for today, I didn't mean to be so hard. Please, be my friend, and help me get stronger, he bowed. Eh? Izumi was confused. She was sure he would say something accusing and petty, but friends? Well, it's just duh, he trailed off, scratching his cheek. Why is this so hard? Is it because this is my first time making a friend? Okay. He looked up abruptly, blinking. Okay. But. No buts. I know. Let's make a deal. Since friends are supposed to help each other. I'll help you to get stronger, while in return, you'll just have to buy me Pocky every Sunday. Naruto deadpanned. Great. I'll see you tomorrow. She said and didn't wait for an answer, turning on her toes. If one had seen her face, they'd see a relieved expression. She was in a bad mood after her walk with her father. That is part of the reason she ran away so quickly. But now she felt much better. Naruto stood standing for a while, his hair blowing in the wind. He felt oddly excited and, a little happy, his first friend. A smile bloomed on his face as he started running back to his home with a skip in his step. It was the start of a beautiful friendship. Naruto ducked under a punch and jumped back, distancing himself from his opponent. He heard more than see wood shuriken flying at him and deflected them with a stick. Since he was still a student, he couldn't buy real weapons and had to improvise. But it was fine as long as he keeps on improving himself. He couldn't see his opponent anywhere and grew tense, looking from the corner of his eyes. He was alert, knowing his opponent was better than him. He was not given any time and was forced to jump over a leg sweep. He threw a feint, but his opponent expected it, and Naruto clenched his stomach as he felt a punch connect to his midsection. He ended up on his back, wheezing and curling into himself. 
A ah, he coughed and took heavy breaths. Why you hit really hard, senpei. It was winter in the land of fire, and it had been snowing heavily all around Konoha for the past week. A thick blanket of snow covered the clearing and trees. He was wearing a white jacket, with black stripes from outside his shoulders along his arms, and an orange undershirt paired with black trousers. He was yet to get up, still breathing heavily, his warm breath visible in the cold. Naruto glared mockingly at the person standing above him with arms on their hips. Man, both of you are getting incredibly strong for your age. I might have to start pushing myself even more in order to stay ahead. Naruto sat up and started limping towards the river. I can't see myself surpassing you, Shisui Senpei, you're only four years older than me but already a junin, he said, taking gulps of water from the river. I'm not even a genin yet. Ever since that day two years ago, Naruto started training daily with Izumi. The next day when he went to the library, he issued several books on shinobi history and basics. He was very inspired by Senju Tobarama and Uchiha Madara. Tobarama for his ingenious intellect, and Madara for his absolute destructive battle powers. Many of the modern-day jutsu were based on stuff that Tobarama invented. For Madara, his name was enough to inspire terror within a full-grown man, even after so many years. Another shinobi he greatly respected was Namikaze Minato. Even though he was the Hokage for only a year, he was among the strongest shinobi of his time. Till now, he's the only person to have a flea on sight, order to his name. However, it was due to the fact that Minato was able to kill the Kayubi, a being that Naruto was absolutely terrified of, that he respected him the most out of the three. When they first started training together, he was a little more than a punching bag for Izumi. But as the days blurred into weeks, weeks into months, he found himself catching up. He started running in the mornings and evenings, strengthening his knuckles and legs by punching and kicking posts. He even learned to call on his chakra after a few months in training. One such day, when they were sparring in a clearing in the forest, Uchiha Shisui noticed them and invited them for a spar. He was older than themselves, but not by much. Shisui was a very humble and down-to-earth individual. He had short, unkempt dark-colored hair and well-defined eyelashes. They couldn't even touch him, but something about them impressed Shisui, and he offered to take them under his mentorship. Since then, they started sparring and doing survival exercise with him whenever they could. Over time, he became somewhat of an older brother figure for Izumi and Naruto. Sometimes when they sparred, Izumi would bring along her brother Sasuke because apparently, that kid loved his sister more than his parents. Sasuke was a cute kid, but he had a borderline antagonistic relationship with Naruto, to their surprise. What did he do? Shisui mainly helped them in honing their speed and technique. Since Shisui said ninjutsu was off limits for now, they couldn't do much in that department. Of course, that isn't to say he didn't teach them any ninjutsu. By the age of seven and eight, Izumi and Naruto had already mastered the three academy basics and shadow clones. Being an Uchiha, Izumi could already do the great fireball jutsu. Naruto got her to teach him, but he wasn't nearly as good. The shadow clone was pretty handy for them because since they were already ahead of academy level, they didn't have to attend it every day. Just sending their clones would suffice. They were all amazed when Naruto managed to make his shadow clone on the first try, even though it took Izumi a while. Shisui told him that he should look into multi-shadow clone jutsu, which takes considerably more chakra. Because it turns out he had chakra in spades, it shouldn't take too long. I was given a field promotion, so it was different for me. But I believe you will at least be a chunin by the time you are my age. Shisui grinned at him, and he, too, skipped a stone. Then he threw another stone, and it struck the previous one. Naruto deadpanned. Stop showing off. I can do it too, you know? Oh. By all means, show me. Huh? I mean, yeah. Just look at me. He threw a stone and aimed to throw another one behind it, sticking out his tongue in concentration. As he threw it, both the boys followed it with their eyes, leaning towards the river, one with amusement and the other with anticipation. There was a loud splash all of a sudden. Both of them fell into the river at the same time the stones connected. He resurfaced to see Izumi cackling on the ground, holding her stomach. Sasuke clapped in the background, wearing an oversized jacket and giggling. Naruto spat water from his mouth and got out of the river, hugging himself as his teeth tattered. Oh oh I I, what are you laughing at, ch chibi? He swore he saw Sasuke smirking at him. You two were taking so long. 
so I came to get you. Sasuke was nice enough to accompany me. Right, Sasuke-chan? Sasuke laughed again and clapped. Your brother is not nice. Sasuke-chan is an angel. Angel, oh yeah, totally. Is that sarcasm? Since when did you start using sarcasm? Since the day your brother named me his mortal enemy. That never happened. Never mind that. What did you want to talk about? And wait. Where did Shisui Senpei go? He said he was going to show me something cool today. Well, he used a substitution jutsu and disappeared when I pushed him in the river. She gave him an embarrassed smile. It was stupid to think that I'd get the drop on him. Anyway, since the academy teachers now know that we can use the shadow clone, which was all your fault, they have been talking about an early promotion. I already told my father, and he was intrigued when I told him that there is another student who is graduating early. More so that I had a friend. Now, he wants to meet you. She finished with a slightly forced smile. Naruto looked at her, surprised. They could see Sasuke as he pretended to play in the snow, but his eyes were fixed on Naruto. It wasn't my fault my clone picked up a fight and got itself dispelled when it escalated. Some of them have entirely different personalities compared to me. It was frustrating, to be honest. Anyway, let's go meet your father then. Izumi hesitated. Just a warning, he can be a bit eccentric when it comes to me. Naruto raised a brow and whipped his wet hair, the ice-cold water splashing on Sasuke's face as he stood beside his sister, making him narrow his eyes. It was intentional, and they both knew this. It was well established that one of them always keeps trying to get the better of the other. Naruto flashed him an uncharacteristic evil smirk, much to the Uchiha's childish ire. How bad could it be anyway? Let's go. He hoped he didn't jinx it. Uchiha Fugaku had short, brown hair that reached to his shoulders and onyx-colored eyes, with visible creases below them, the latter of which Izumi inherited on a lesser scale. He wore a simple green kimono with gray pants, with the symbol of Uchiha on the back. He cut an imposing figure with his permanent scowl and stern eyes. Well, Naruto was already nervous. It had been three minutes, and no one has yet spoken a word. The three of them were sitting in Fugaku's study. Nearby was a short-legged table with two cups of tea, which was probably made by Azumi's mother. Naruto kept looking into the older man's eyes and didn't look away. Fugaku's frown deepened. He had been shocked when he learned from his wife that his daughter managed to make a friend. Typically, it wouldn't be a big problem. His daughter was very cheerful and would probably attract many friends if it were any normal situation. But it wasn't a normal situation. Ever since that night, four years ago, the village's higher-ups have been slowly distancing the Uchiha clan from the village center. It was a common rumor among the ordinary shinobi by now that the Uchiha clan was behind the Kyubi attack. Be it civilians or shinobi, everyone could see the Sharingan spinning in the beast's eyes at the night of the attack. During the attack, the Uchiha police force was tasked by the authorities to ensure the civilians were safely escorted to the shelters, which was suspicious by itself as they were much more suitable on the front lines, and it didn't add any points in their favor when they were asked the critical question. Where was your clan that night? It didn't matter if it were the higher-ups that passed the order or Fugaku. What mattered were the consequences due to that decision. A seed of distrust was sown in the general populace. The shinobi, who were good teammates with an Uchiha, started seeing their comrades in suspicion. The other clans pretty much distanced themselves from the Uchiha clan. And, someone, has been fanning out these rumors recently. Fugaku would bet his right eye it's those three old councilmen. Ever since Konoha was established, the Senju has always been the one in authority. Even though Hashirama and Madara played equal parts in building the village, it was Senju Hashirama that was chosen as the first Hokage. The second Hokage, Senju Tobarama, was extremely wary of the Uchiha. Tobarama created the Konoha police force for the Uchiha to run, which was publicly a sign of trust, but the clan felt marginalized. And, naturally, his ideals would be inherited by his students. The only exception he could see was Hiruzen, who was pretty much neutral. But even the Hokage has to consider the opinions of his advisors. Shimura Danzo, one of the Hokage's advisors and a very influential person, was the one that took Tobarama's ideologies way too hard, even more than Tobarama himself. He has been one of the people to subtly make the Uchiha clan lose its position. Even though he knows that the clan is probably the most powerful in the whole village and an asset. So why would he want to lose the support of Uchiha? The answer that gives Fugaku both pride, and a tiny bit of terror, is that Danzo is afraid of the Uchiha. 
fearful of it gaining too much standing, power and reputation. Danzo likes power in his hands, at his beck and call. However, he's afraid that once the Uchiha gain too much power, it would be difficult to control them. So, he subtly spread rumors against them and always watched them like a hawk, using his private Anbu route. He had seen those blank masks, after all. He doesn't know how long the clan's patience will last, but if situations keep worsening, he's afraid they might have a coup on their hands. However, those things don't matter nearly as much to him as his daughter Izumi does. Sure, if he was the Fugaku of ten years ago, he might be having very different views. He knows that his daughter is a genius, so he was not at all surprised when the academy teachers informed him of his daughter's early graduation. However, another student, who claims to have no clan, and no past training, manages to do the same. Well, either that boy is a genius or a trained spy. And he cannot be sure what is true when he knows how Danzo recruits his root agents. Some people, like his clearly much too innocent wife Makoto, may say he was being paranoid. Well, he was. At least say something, it's been ten minutes since we sat down, and no one has spoken a word. Quiet, Izumi, Fugaku said, without taking his eyes off a currently sweating Naruto, I need to talk to your friend. Alone. Izumi looked at Naruto, worried, but relaxed once he nodded to her and stood up. Fine. I'll leave you two alone. She grumbled while shutting off the sliding door. Fugaku kept looking into his eyes, but he stubbornly matched the older man's gaze with his own. HN. Fugaku finally spoke, I can read a person by looking into their eyes, but I won't comment on that, his eyes narrowed. What do you want from my daughter? After watching Naruto squirm under his gaze till now, he could deduce that this boy was no spy. Or a rather good one. But he doesn't want to doubt his intuition and admit that the boy next to him is better at acting than he is at looking past illusions. Naruto's eyes widened slightly, but he pinched himself on his thigh and calmed down. She's my dearest friend, he spoke with sincerity. She saved my life once, and I've yet to repay her. I'll walk with her to the depths of hell if she asks me to. He panicked at the last part. Because while what he said might be true, he did not mean to say that out loud. He looked at Fugaku to see him staring at him with an amused smirk. It is impossible to lie to me because of these eyes. His eyes were red, with three tomo, and Naruto couldn't look away. Now for my next questions, Fugaku's smirk widened, almost maliciously. Naruto gulped Makoto was peeling an apple as she hummed a tune while she sat on her chair in the kitchen. She was a fair-skinned woman with long, straight black hair with bangs hanging on either side of her face to roughly frame her cheeks and black eyes. She wore a simple dark purple blouse with a red plum skirt and a light yellow apron worn over it. She watched as the boy that she told her husband about, Naruto, if she remembers correctly, came running and hurriedly scrambled out of the front door, wearing both his sandals in the wrong feet. Makoto sent a disapproving glance at her husband, who came out of the room with an amused, almost satisfied smile on his face. Was it really necessary? She frowned. He was such a well-mannered boy. He even brought homemade cookies as a present. She pointed at the packed box on the kitchen table. Yes. His smile turned into a thin neutral line. Yes, it was. With times like this, you cannot trust anyone, even if it is a mere boy. And he's not naive, despite being only nine year old, he knew I was testing him all this time. He said thoughtfully, if my daughter considers him a friend, then I am willing to put my trust in him. But doesn't mean that I cannot test him to be completely sure. So, are you sure now? Because you have to apologize to him the next time he comes over. And he will. Because I am going to invite him for Sasuke's birthday. My daughter finally has a friend. And, it's a cute boy. She put her hands on her cheek, forgetting the apple for now. I wonder if they will get married when they grow up. Fugaku's jaw tensed at that, and his wife noticed. Ah uh ah, -uh, he passed your little test, didn't he? That means you approve of him as well. A coy smile appeared on her lips. A long-suffering sigh escaped Fugaku as he heard his wife. So, we have two students who are being considered for early graduations. It is incredibly rare out of war times, but it would not be wise to hold them back, an old-sounding voice said. Some real-life experience should do them well. Yes. Hokage-sama, Uchiha Izumi, and one Naruto. The academy instructor Funeno said, kneeling down. Both of them were able to do the three basic jutsu, and they can already make shadow clones. While Izumi has always been at the top of the class, Naruto used to be at the bottom during the first few months. 
but he slowly caught up with her and now is in second place. I would recommend placing them in the same team with a student from the upcoming graduating class. They have shown a healthy rivalry, which should help both of them to keep growing. The Hokage was quiet for a while as he contemplated. He was reluctant to allow the children to graduate before the proper age, but they could not be choosy now when they were just barely recovering from the Kyubi's rampage. So be it then, I will allow it. He waved his left in dismissal. You may go now. Yes, Hokage sama. Hirazan looked out of the window, his arms behind his back. It was nighttime, and he could see as the store owners were shutting down their shops, the streets were getting empty by the minute. It was times like this that he could enjoy. Just looking over at the village that he has led for so long, watching it prosper like this, it was a satisfying feeling. His thoughts shifted to the two children, Naruto more than Izumi. The boy they found in his student's abandoned lab. Even though he absolutely detested his students' inhuman experiments, he was still somewhat interested in the outcome. Out of the sixty kids they found, only two were alive. Their DNAs couldn't be matched with anyone, so they were put into an orphanage. He knew Danzo took the other child. While they may differ in their ideologies, he could not deny that Danzo loved the village just as much as he did. It was just his way of doing things that sometimes irked Hirazan. But he cannot do anything, for he knows Danzo is a necessary evil. The tree leaves that bathe in sunlight can prosper only if the roots that grow in the dark are strong. A balance, if you will. Yin and yang. Light and dark. One cannot exist without the other. He rubbed his forehead and thought about other things, such as the current situation with the Uchiha. How is he going to solve this mess? Yo, Kakashi. An obnoxiously loud voice called. Hitaki Kakashi was a man of few words. His spiky silver hair, an uncaring black colored eye, and a tilted hite ate that covered his other eye gave him a unique look. He didn't look up from his book and kept walking, dressed in an armor that vaguely resembled the Anbu one, ignoring the voice. The other person followed him. Come on, Kakashi. Do you not want to see? The voice was even louder now. Do you not want to pit your flames of youth against mine? To see who prevails in this passionate duel between two hot blooded men. What type of man are you? The man spoke in a louder voice while making a ridiculous gesture with his hands. Hum. Guy? How long have you been here? He spoke coolly. The now identified guy hung his head in defeat, and dark clouds comically appeared above him. Maida Guy was a man with a questionable sense of fashion and a youthful passion. He was a tall and well muscled man. Having fair skin, a strong jawline, and a somewhat large nose, Guy was most noticeable for his thick brows, shiny bowl style haircut, and his trademark green jumpsuit with orange leg warmers. He turned away from his friend, curses. Your hip and cool attitude won't work on me anymore. If I cannot convince you to have a contest of youthful passion with me, I will run 300 laps around the training field, using only my right hand. And if I cannot do da. Fine. He finally looked up from his book and cast his half lidded disinterested stare over to Guy flipping his book into his hip pouch. Fine. But just one match, our scores are still tied at 72 to 72. Guy made a sound of victory and put his left arm around Kakashi's shoulder, dragging him along. Naruto watched the two teens leave and shook his head. After his hasty retreat from the Uchiha household, he ended up sitting on a bench in the park. The upper half of his face was under the shade from the tree as he tilted his head back. It was a horrible experience with Izumi's father. He was asking questions too close for his heart for his liking. And what made the experience worse was that he was basically held a captive and asked questions to which he could not lie to. And that I. Sharingan. It wasn't something he was unaware of. He knew Shisui had his own, although he never used it against them. He has heard Izumi always talking about getting hers but never thought much about it till now. But if a simple look from the eye could do this. Well. He might have to look for a counter. But what? His stomach made a sound. He stood up from the bench, messing up his hair irritably with his hands. Problems will have to wait for a while. He was feeling hungry, and ramen sounded just perfect right now. A few months later, both of them graduated from the academy. According to the tradition, they were put along in teams of three. Fortunately, both of them were on the same team. Their third member, however. I can't believe I'm stuck with snot nosed brats. What are you like, five? Arg. Azumo Tenma. Tenma developed a reputation as a bully during his last year at the academy. When he first encountered Izumi, 
he confronted her about her clan's supposed involvement in the Kayubi attack, wishing for retribution for his uncle's death. Izumi denied any knowledge about the attack and thus, refused to apologize. Tenma attacked her, but she managed to avoid him by tricking him with a clone. Tenma was furious to be teamed up with them, prompting their new squad leader to accuse him of being jealous. But he silently gritted his teeth while on the missions to do the job and kept his opinion for times out of duty. When a past mission went wrong, and Tenma was about to lose his life, Izumi saved him, and he reluctantly admitted her superiority and promised to repay her for it. But it didn't mean he had to like her. It has been a year since they were put on Team 2 under Jun and Minazuki Yuki's leadership. Yuki had short dark hair, unkempt eyebrows, and a goatee. He had a tiny mouth. He appeared to be a competent teacher on the outside but had a jealous streak when it came to prospective Jenin who outclassed him in skill. I'm nine. And you should be grateful to us. Naruto and I are the ones who do the heavy lifting in this team. The team had a strange dynamic. Tenma hated the both of them and was constantly reminding them of the same. Izumi bickered back with him, while Naruto played interference in stopping their fights. Even though the older boy annoyed him, he was still a teammate and Naruto was ashamed to admit that he didn't have many friends other than Izumi and Shisui, so he couldn't afford to be overly rude to potential friends. Even though they were not the most compatible, it was undeniable that the three of them were close friends. A year of being together in the same team would bring people together, or at least bring along a sense of familiarity. That Tenma would vehemently decline if someone ever asked him about this. They have already completed over 90 d rank missions and 11 c rank ones. Team 2 was gaining popularity as a strong rookie team, mainly due to Izumi and Naruto. And right now, they were on a mission to guard the fire daimyo himself as he traveled to Konoha. Their main concern being getting the daimyo to Konoha on time, as the roads were expected to be free of danger. Quiet down, you two. Show some respect while you were in daimyo-sama's presence, their leader chastised. He bowed, I apologize for my shinobi, daimyo-sama, they. It's all right, he spoke, chuckling. They remind me of my children when they were still young. Naruto was not looking at them, scouting the area. This was a vital mission, and it was crucial that it goes without a hitch. Their Chunin exam participation depends on it. An unpleasant smell assaulted his nose, making him curious and putting him on guard. It was a smell he had been accustomed to nowadays but didn't mean he liked it one bit. The smell of blood, what is that? The area was suddenly covered in a thick mist, obscuring their view of the path, and everyone was put on their guards. Their leader stopped them with a subtle gesture. Do not move until I say so. The three genin nodded their heads, not like Yuki could see it. The Junin squad leader slowly made his way into the mist, carefully. His stride was silent and cautionary, searching all around him for any sign of danger. As he went further into the mist, he felt his seasoned senses screaming to him telling him to get away from this place, to go as far away as possible. But his pride won't allow it, and he never left a mission, ran away due to it being dangerous. Why must he start now? Soon, the visage of a person came within his vision, instantly making him tense his body. There was something about the person in front of him that inspired a deep fear within the man. Perhaps, it was the yellow mask with black flame-like patterns, or, the waist-length spiky black hair or quite possibly the spinning blood red eye visible in the lone orifice in the face mask. An Uchiha, then, quite possibly a rogue. A dangerous predicament indeed. Are you the one responsible for this mist? He asked with faux casualness. The man didn't say a word, quietly leaning against a tree trunk with his hands crossed and his head tipped a bit. Yuki shifted a bit, making himself comfortable with the surroundings in case a fight breaks out. He had a horrible feeling about this. This is the fire daimyo entourage, he said as he flicked a kanai in his left hand. Please step aside, or I'll have to use force. Hum. The main finally let out, in a voice that was eerily grave. He made a show of thinking by rubbing his finger on the mask, where his chin was supposed to be, I don't think I will. The clearing erupted into a chaos of blood and gore as soon as he said that. Yuki didn't have any time to blink or scream before he felt a painful tug on his neck, and he felt his world swirl around him. When he stopped, he was horrified to find himself looking at his now headless body. The smell of blood was now almost unbearable, to the point where even an ordinary civilian could identify it. The three genin shinobi tensed and took defensive stances. The daimyo shut the curtains of his royal litter, leaving the guards that were carrying outside terrified. 
There was a foreboding silence in the clearing for a whole minute, and they feared what might have happened. The mist cleared, and what they saw made their legs weak. Yuki's body was lying in his blood, his severed head lying near the man's legs, a horrifying visage of silent scream etched on his face. Tenma emptied his stomach where he stood. The guards were shaking. Their faces said that they were almost considering letting the vehicle fall and run for their lives. Izumi and Naruto quickly went to the front in a defensive position. This was turning out to be the worst possible situation. The most vital member of their team was down without a fight. Naruto felt his heartbeat escalating, cursing himself as the fear of being weak surfaced yet again. Who's to say the man won't just kill them where they stood? He certainly was capable of doing it, considering he had no problem with their leader. Sorry about that. You see, we had a small disagreement, his tone was entirely unapologetic, he wanted to live, but, I wanted him to die. The masked man shrugged, almost casually. This was not a fight that they could win, and they knew it. Naruto looked from the corner of if his eyes, and escape, anything. Azumi's hand shook as she pointed a kanai at the man and shouted, What do you want from us? It doesn't matter what he wants. If we don't do anything, we're going to die. Naruto half shouted, half whispered. The man looked into Azumi's eyes and clicked his teeth in disappointment. One more push. That you are, he confirmed. Tenma walked in front of them with trembling legs at first, then somehow gaining strength and standing firm. He took a kanai out of his pouch, took a stance, his legs apart, and held the kanai with both hands. He looked over his shoulder, directly into Azumi's eyes, with a resigned look, before looking at Naruto, nodding. All. I'll try to buy some time. Escape as soon as I charge at him. He gulped before calming himself. Hey, at least, I'll not die in debt of a toddler. He charged at the man with incredible speed, for a genin. Both of them watched, horrified as a blood-stained sword emerged out of his back, showering the surrounding area in blood. The masked man flicked the blade, and Tenma was thrown aside. Naruto heard an ear-piercing scream, filled with such anguish, and covered his ears. He was horrified to notice that it was coming from Izumi. Her hair was covering her face as she bowed down and cried, still screaming, covering her own ears with her hands. It pained him to watch her like this. The masked man chuckled darkly, and something snapped inside of Naruto. This man, this man killed half his team in cold blood, Tenma was his friend, and even Yuki Sensei's presence felt comforting to him. And now it was just the two of them left. Excellent, the man clapped mockingly, it should make killing you even more enjoyable. You bastard. Naruto looked at the man with unadulterated rage in his eyes, I'll kill you. He found something bubbling inside of himself, but he couldn't care about what it was. He grabbed the feeling within him and pulled at it. Bringing his hands together instinctively, an insane amount of dense chakra built within him. Holding the position, he looked at the man. And then he roared. Trees emerged from the spot beneath the man, splitting the earth and binding him. The trees kept on growing, with thick branches emerging from them. The earth shook. He poured his all in it. Finally, he lost the strength in his legs and went down on both his knees, breathing heavily. The clearing was filled with trees. Luckily, they were in a forest near the village, so it won't look too out of place. He was shocked by this new development. Of course, he knew what it was. He'd have to be an idiot to not know about the legendary wood release. The first Hokage was said to possess it. However, it was not passed down to his children. But how did he use it? Did it mean that he was related to the Senju somehow? There were many questions within his mind, but he shoved them back when he noticed something terrifying. He watched in horror as the masked man walked out of the miniature forest, completely unharmed. He started chuckling quietly. Hum, so, it was true, after all. I admit, I had my doubts about you when Zetsu brought this piece of information to me. After all, it's not every day that a wood-style user is found. It seems that the only thing you two needed was a small push. His work done. The man turned around and started walking away from them. He was out to scout potential members for his organization. And Zetsu had brought an interesting piece of information. The Uchiha princess, said to be the most skilled Uchiha of her generation, one with incredible potential. And a wood-style user with natural affinity. He knew this was one of the kids that Orochimaru used for his DNA mutation project. He would be foolish to assume that the boy's powers were only due to genetic mutations. With the amount of talent he showed for someone using wood release for the first time, no, 
It had to be a natural user. He might have to visit the snake, it seemed. Maybe he could recruit Orochimaru as well, his body suddenly started getting absorbed in a spiral-shaped distortion. We'll meet again. I hope you two are stronger the next time, he let out before he vanished, for your own sakes. Naruto's face hit the ground as he took wheezing breaths, he didn't show it, but using that jutsu felt like it would almost kill him. His eyes drooped as he hung at the edge of unconsciousness. The last thing he noticed was looking into two concerned red eyes as someone called his name. The next day he woke up in the hospital bed. Apparently, during all the chaos from Naruto's outburst, the daimyo and his guards were able to flee. While Naruto was unconscious, Izumi sealed her teammates' corpses in a scroll and, putting his arm around her shoulders, carried him to a nearby Konoha outpost. A message was sent to the village, and Anbu were sent to escort the two genin back home. The mission briefing was delayed by a week by the Hokage, to give them the time to mourn and recover. He was discharged from the hospital in a few hours because he had no physical injuries. The funeral was attended by Tenma's family, Naruto, and Izumi. Yuki lived alone, so no one came from his side, other than a few colleagues. It didn't rain during the funeral. It was a clear, sunny day which contrasted their feelings. Tenma's mother hadn't stopped shedding her tears, and once in a while she would look at the two of them with clear loathing in her eyes, almost as if scorning them for being alive when her son wasn't, but she never did approach either of them. They didn't talk to each other, not even inquiring about the other's newly awakened powers and kept standing motionlessly, even after everyone left. Finally, after hours of standing and doing nothing, the sun set and they went to their separate paths, not looking back. Azumi's parents were worried, but they acted as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. For Fugaku, he had no idea how to console someone, especially a child that had their whole team brutally murdered right in front of their eyes. The atmosphere around the table during dinner that night was very tense. No one spoke a word. Even Sasuke, who was used to talking while eating his dinner, a habit that got him a disapproving glare from their mother every time, was quiet. He could see something was troubling his elder sister but didn't know what. After the dinner was over and Izumi stood up, her mother couldn't take it and embraced her. When her daughter did not return the gesture, Makoto frowned sadly and reluctantly let her go. Izumi set her plates in the sink and walked outside to their lawn, sitting down at the veranda. She leaned herself against the wooden pillar and feasted her eyes on the cold white light of the beautiful full moon. She was no stranger to death anymore, making her first kill only four months in becoming a genin. But the death of her team hit her hard. They were friends, weren't they? What is life? What is death? Why do people kill? She was nowhere near the answer to the question that she asked her father all those years ago. She hated to kill, to steal someone's life, she really did. But isn't that what shinobi do? She took a deep breath, gazing at the full moon, searching the heavenly body for the answers that would not come to her. Hearing footsteps, she glanced over her shoulder and noticed her brother, Sasuke, approaching her. Nay, San. Sasuke saw as her face shone silver in the moonlight. Feeling the need to comfort his elder sister, even though he did not know the cause, he did the only thing that he remembered would make his sister happy. He sat beside her and leaned his head in her lap, eventually falling asleep as she lovingly stroked his hair, almost unconsciously. Izumi looked down at her brother's sleeping face and thought to herself, Will the day come when you possess these eyes too? The day when you come to know what sadness is? Her red eyes with two tomo in them prickled with tears. She embraced her brother and shed them silently. She was not surprised when she felt tiny arms wrap around her. Naruto walked the busy streets with his hands in his pockets and his back hunched. He had no place in mind. The chatter of the people was drowned on him. He looked up with half-lidded eyes. A full moon, he never realized when he ended up near a small ramen shop. He was not in the mood to cook dinner tonight, so he might as well. He entered the small shop and was instantly assaulted with a mouth-watering aroma. Welcome to Ichiraku Ramen, what would you have? A middle-aged man and a girl his age stood behind the stall, bowing while greeting. He could tell this was not a very popular shop, despite the homely feeling he got from the place. Two miso, right away. He sat on the chair and folded his hands on the stall, putting his chin on them. Naruto felt confused. He had always felt at peace with the nature. The trees would often resonate with his mood, but he always thought it was the imagination of the childish part in his mind. But the wood release doesn't make any sense. Of course, he knew about Orochimaru. 
Ever since he could go to the library, he has been studying various things, the famous and infamous shinobi being one of them. He realized he was experimented on as a child. Probably snatched from his parents, and then they were killed as well. Because when he was subjected to blood tests, they could not find any matches. Either his parents never existed, which was absurd, or their samples were not available. But there was a third possibility that he was leaning towards. Somebody tampered with his reports. But who? At this point, the only one who could know his parents was Orochimaru, and he was out of his reach, being a most wanted criminal and all. He suddenly heard grumbling and looked behind him, noticing a child hiding behind the curtains. A little girl of around four, with red hair set in two pigtails and whisker marks? Realizing that the grumble probably came from her stomach, he took pity on her. Her appearance showed that she has not been eating enough. He gestured to her with his fingers and patted the spot next to him. The child looked shocked and hesitated, just for a second, but then slowly went to the chair and hopped on it, shyly looking at him. One more miso, he ordered for her, coming up. The girl slowly broke out of her shyness and waited in anticipation, swaying her legs, often stealing a glance at him when she thought he wasn't looking. Soon their orders were placed, and Naruto was pleasantly surprised. He has been eating ramen for years now, and not one of them came even close to this. His shock must have shown on his face, for he could see the chef smiling proudly. He ended up having two more bowls, and to his surprise, the girl managed to match him, bowl for bowl. She patted her clearly bloated stomach and burped shamelessly. He looked at her and sighed. Both of them left the stall, and he noticed how short she actually was. Let's get you back to your home. Do you know where it is? The girl looked down. Do you have somewhere to spend the night? She looked at him with squinted eyes and smiled somewhat embarrassedly, but it seemed incredibly sad to him. The Ofnage lady won, Lemmy in any more. For being a bad INFL influ, bad girl. But it wasn't me, they called me a tomato first, she started out quietly, but then her voice grew louder. Naruto was shocked, and he bit his lip. Why would Granny do that? It sounded ridiculous to him. Kicking a little girl out to fend for herself. She heard what he said and looked at him with wide eyes. You know old lady Gran. The other kids said that she was very ill, and that she won't be coming anymore. Naruto stopped in his tracks, but I think that she is just talking care of other kids at some other orphanage, and then, she was always kind to me. Naruto wiped his moist eyes and looked at her. Oi, Chibi, what's your name? Uzumaki Natsumi. And, thanks for treating me to ramen. Hee <laughs> hee. It was the best, yeah, no. She grinned at him, and for a brief moment, everything stopped mattering as he looked at her. Her smile was so innocent and so pure. What type of monster was this new matron? She smiled a dozen times tonight, but he felt as it was the most genuine one yet. I'm Naruto. You can sleep at my apartment tonight, and we'll see what we can do tomorrow, he grinned back a little. Really? And, also, your name is Fishka. Yes. Yes, it is Fishcake. Are you happy now? He said miserably. What is it with people and his name? Can't they see how cool it is? Yes, she giggled. He sighed and kept walking. However, there was a slight smile on his face as he looked ahead. Things may be hard now, but that doesn't mean they won't get any better. He just has to persevere, and he'll find out his answers. Somewhere, in a dark room barely illuminated by a candle, a door creaked open. Orochimaru-sama, a male voice said. Everything went according to your plan. The child shows great promise. Yellow slitted eyes widened in sickly glee. Uzumaki Natsumi was born on the dreaded night of October 10, four years ago. A night when many people in Konoha lost someone they loved. A night of dread and terror. She was put in an orphanage in the earlier months of her life. The first intelligent observation that she made was that people would treat her differently they would treat others. Maybe she did something wrong without knowing it. It was a thought that she often had, and almost accepted it. By the time she was three, there was only one person who did not look at her with scorn the old matron of the orphanage. But soon, she, too, stopped seeing her. There were rumors about her bad health. It made her feel sad. When the new matron came, her worst fears were proven true. She looked at her with those same eyes as everyone else, eyes filled with hate, disgust, and fear. The other kids learned from her. Obviously, if the new matron didn't like the weird girl, then something was clearly wrong with the redhead. They started to treat her the same. They never let her play with them. And there were two kids who kept stealing her food, 
but when she complained to the matron, all she got was a slap on the cheek for lying. So, she stopped complaining. The three kids were emboldened by this and started to tease her daily. And, she too, started taking it in stride when it became a daily occurrence. But one day, she had enough. Oi oi, what's this? A whiny voice said, you finished your lunch already? Where is our part? The last part was followed by a light shove on her shoulder. Looks like she needs to learn her lesson, another childish voice said, followed by another shove, rougher. She glared into their eyes and ground her teeth. I'm not giving you anything. The dumb lady only gives me half of what everyone else gets. She shouted, and her face got a slight red hue with anger. Say that again, you freak. I said, I am not giving you anything. She ground out each word separately, clenching her teeth. The two kids laughed. Look, look, she's turning red. Just like her stupid hair. One of them grabbed a fistful of her hair. She's like a tomato. Soon, all the kids present started laughing. She felt her cheeks burn with humiliation but focused on the two boys who were yanking on her hair. Tomato. 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 Slamming her plate on the table with a rattle, she rounded up on them, grabbing the hand that was in her hair. I am not a tomato, she shouted and bit the hand that was grabbing her hair. Hard. The boy cried and started punching her face to make her stop. She bit even harder. Arg. Stop. Stop. No. The other kid came to the rescue and started kicking her. She left the first boy and tackled him, throwing him on the ground and sitting on his chest, punching his face. Punch. I'm, punch, not, punch, a tomato. Her face was bloody, and her red hair was in a mess. There were no tears in her eyes, though, just anger as she took heavy breaths. She finally stopped hitting him, and the two slightly older boys scrambled away. She took a calming breath, but then noticed the silence that had encompassed the whole room. She's a monster. The lady was right. The children started to whisper among themselves. I'm scared of her, they observed her cautiously, as if avoiding a wild animal, and inched away from her when she walked by them. She didn't give them any response as she dragged herself to the washroom. She stood up on a stool in front of the mirror to see herself but only saw a broken little girl in the mirror, and tears prickled in her eyes as her lower lip quivered. She looked pathetic. You animal. Come here. The lady grabbed her by the forearm and roughly pulled her along. It was inevitable, she knew it. This is why she never fought back. She could see the two beat up kids, standing with the other kids, looking way too smug for some bullies who just got their butt handed to them by a little girl. It was clear that they complained to the matron, and she finally got an excuse to throw her out. Don't come back again. This is a place for kids, not for freaks. She threw her out and shut the door. Ah. The girl hit the ground on her face, yelping as she unsuccessfully tried to balance herself with her hands, to do something to stop the momentum. Her eyes were wide and trembling as she got on her unsteady hands and knees. She hoped against hope that she would hear the door would creak open any time now, that they won't lock her out alone, to fend for herself. One long look at the closed door and her hopes were crushed. She picked herself up and dusted her clothes, it was the only thing she had on her right now. The whisper of the crowd that had gathered to watch the commotion reached her ears as she stiffened. She didn't notice there were so many people. But they weren't approaching her. To help her. No one was. No one ever did. And their eyes. Look. It's that kid. Hate. Don't look at her. You don't know what she would do. Fear. The freak got what was coming for her. K. Look at the nerve. To walk amongst us, pretending to be a little girl. Loathing she kicked the orphanage gate in anger and turned away, not wanting to hear their murmurings, running to the only place where she knew no one would look at her with eyes like those, where no one would deny her existence, or call her names. The village of Konoha was vast, she noticed. Sitting on the fourth head on the mountain, she looked down at the village. The whole village seemed to be mocking her as she sat there, observing the perfect families. She saw children playing and laughing as they sat on their parents' shoulders saw the obvious love between them. Maybe, her parents would have done the same with her if they were together? Her eyes grew heavy. Maybe, maybe it won't be too bad for her to just let go. It will hurt, but only for a moment. Then she will finally be with her dad and Mo. She squashed the thought like a bug and stood up tall, as tall as a four-year-old could be. Taking a deep breath, she shouted at the top of her lungs. My name is Uzumaki Natsumi. She raised her hand to the sun and looked through it, 
and I'll make all of you acknowledge me one day. Remember it, Yano. She grinned brightly, her previous mood broken, and she laughed to herself. She won't give up. Won't let them break her. It felt good to do that. That night, she would meet Naruto for the first time, scrambling to find something to eat. And he would call her and look at her with those concerned eyes, completely different to what she was used to. And he would ask her the most important question. Oi, Chibi, what's your name? She truly smiled for the first time in her life. She finally found someone who accepted her existence. Made her feel that. She was not the monster or the freak but, Uzumaki Natsumi. And, thanks for treating me to ramen. It was the best, ya, yeah, no. She wanted to cry out of sheer joy for the first time, but she squinted her eyes as much as she could and gave him a toothy grin. So. The Hokage scratched his graying beard, this masked man killed your team, Jonin Minazuki Yuki and Genin Azumo Tenma. And you, Naruto, discovered that you can use wood style and Izumi awakened her Sharingan, the Hokage summarized. Yes, Hokage-sama. They spoke simultaneously, voice devoid of emotion. There was silence for a while as the Hokage took a puff from his pipe. I'm truly sorry for your loss. As the Hokage, it pains me when any of my people die. I hope you two will be alright. It was truly a tragedy, and we will be looking further into it. He took a weary breath. But on to other matters, we cannot allow the knowledge of Konoha having two wood style users to spread, until at least you reach the rank of Jonin. The wood release was no mere bloodline. If word were to spread that the first Hokage's bloodline limit still exists, it would cause unrest among the other nations. The leaders would send assassins after Naruto in order to kill him before he reaches his full potential. The peace right now was shaky at best. Naruto looked at him, shocked. There's another one? I know what you must be thinking, and yes, it is true. I believe, that you two are somewhat acquainted already. He was able to awaken his affinity quite earlier. From what I've been told, he said, for the next Chunin exams, we'll have him as your third team member. I'll arrange for one of my Jonin to act as your squad leader for the time being. And I have no doubt that both of you will succeed. He smiled in the end. We'll not let you down, Hokage sama. Good, good, you may leave now. He dismissed them and looked at his paperwork in sadness. Izumi looked at Naruto and raised her brow when he didn't move. He shook his head. She shrugged minutely and went out of the office, leaving the two of them. You have something else to say. He didn't look up from his desk as he concluded. Yes, Hokage-sama. Permission to speak freely? Granted. Yesterday, I found a child, a little girl, Uzumaki Natsumi. Here is intense at the name, but that was all. She was barred from entering the orphanage by the matron and had no place to sleep for the night. The Hokage gripped his paperwork tightly as he heard. I offered her asylum in my apartment for the night. However, now I'm not sure what to do. I do not consider myself capable of taking care of a child. She is waiting on the other side of the door as we speak. Hiruzen was saddened by this information, but he couldn't say he was shocked. He was afraid somehow the information regarding her Jinchuriki status would leak, and it would come to this. But he had faith in his people, in their will of fire. But it seems his faith was misplaced. He frowned. The majority of the population of Konoha was hostile towards her. He could not trust anyone to not kill her while she sleeps if he assigns a guardian for her. The only thing he could do now was give Natsumi her own apartment and have his Anbu guard her from the shadows. Well, first. Send her in, he called to his receptionist in a soft voice. Natsumi meekly poked her head through the gate and looked around. Noticing some old man and Naruto talking, she made her way to him grabbing the hem of his shirt and hid behind his legs. I'll talk to her and take it from here, you may leave. Yes, Hokage-sama. He bowed and sent her a reassuring smile before leaving. Later that evening, he was taking a stroll in the market area when he noticed something. He was being followed. Naruto weaved his way through the crowd, into different stores and circled around the area for a while. He was still being followed. Realizing he couldn't shake them off easily, he decided to confront them. He reached a clearing, and before he could call them out, he was alerted to the telltale signs of Shunshin. Dropping in a guarded stance with his right hand hovering above his hip pouch, he noticed that the person following him was an Anbu. Well, at least he resembled an ANBU, other than the blank mask. Anbu Shinobi wear animal face masks, of that he knew. Genin Naruto, Danzo-sama wishes to meet with you. 
You are to be at this address in 30 minutes, he handed him a slip. Do not make him wait. Another shunshun, and he was gone. Naruto checked the address inside. Why would some old council advisor want to meet him? Naruto reached the place but noticed there was no one present. It looked like an old training ground, a large area for sparring, weights, training posts, and other training equipment. It was located underground and had rough walls of stone. Even though it looked old, it was pretty evident that someone still used this training ground. You need to be more aware of your surroundings if I am to teach you, young shinobi. An old voice rasped out from behind him. Danzo had been watching him ever since Naruto arrived, hiding in the shadows and minimizing his presence. He was surprised when Hiruzen confronted him earlier today. He was informed that this young ninja in front of him has shown potential to use the wood style to an even greater extent than his other student. While he would not doubt the Hokage's words, for he had no reason to lie, he was still skeptical. Hiruzen allowed him to get away with many things, such as letting him take the liberty to use Senju Hashirama's personal scrolls for his techniques when he wanted to train his other student in wood style. So now, he has to repay the favor by teaching this young genin in front of him. It wasn't really a bad thing. He was all for strengthening the shinobi of Konoha, as long as they don't become too powerful for him to control. After all, when he becomes the Hokage, he cannot allow anyone to be his equal, or worse, his better. Naruto spun around and relaxed upon seeing him, he gave a customary bow. Honored Elder Danzo San. Danzo tapped his cane on the ground. I am to teach you to hone your abilities in wood release and your instincts. Since I've been made aware, Danzo kept his piercing gaze on him, for the next four years, we will train here, daily. And I do recommend you take these years seriously. I will not waste my time with someone who is not motivated to learn. Naruto was shocked, but he thought it was for the best. However, he was still somewhat wary of the one-eyed old man. When he first met Fugaku, Naruto was warned to stay away from him. Fugaku didn't give out many details, but he didn't hold the old councilman in high regard. That much was certain. I'm thankful. I almost killed myself when I awakened my bloodline limit. I do not wish this gift of mine to go to waste. His tone was respectful and even. You must be familiar with my other student. Danzo performed a subtle hand gesture, and someone jumped in front of them, kneeling, stand up, Kino. Danzo Sama. The new arrival wore an old style Hite 8, reminiscent of Senju Tobarama's and Anbu gear, but he had no mask. Tenzo? Tenzo, Kino looked irritated for a moment but then returned to his emotionless mask. Kino here will be your third team member when you undertake the Chunin exams, later this year in the village of Kumogakure. Naruto looked in shock at him. You are to show the might of Konoha to the whole world. Konoha belongs to the top of the five great nations, it is time that they realize it. Unfortunately, you are not permitted to use the wood release yet. While Kino here has a higher mastery of the element as he has been training for longer than you, you do not. If you depend on an unmastered ability, it will bring you more harm than good. Naruto nodded, accepting the conditions and logic. He didn't think he was going to use this ability anytime soon, given the last time he used it he almost died. You may go now. Be here by the same time from tomorrow. It was evening by the time Naruto got home. Tenzo had left earlier with his teacher, the older boy not sparing him a second glance. Truth to be told, he was excited about this new training. He and Izumi are equals, so this should give him an edge. But then again, her Sharingan was another factor that would even the field. She was plenty good even without it. He could not imagine how strong she will get once she masters her eyes. But that was the reason why they were rivals. They had little to no gap between their skills, but they kept pushing each other to improve. He doubted that there was a genin who would be able to defeat any of them. He still hasn't talked to her after the death of their teammates. Even earlier today, in the morning, they made eye contact for the briefest of times. He could see that something in her has changed a bit. Somehow, her eyes which used to be warm appeared to be colder now. He remembered how she acted when their teammates were killed, and it was clear that their death affected her more than it did to him. He'll have to check on her later. He noticed something by his door, or rather someone. Natsumi? What happened? She was standing outside his door, wearing new clothes. Old man Hokage is so cool. He even said that I can stay next door in the same building as you, and, I want, even have to pay for it until I become a badass ninja. Meanwhile, Naruto looked at her with growing horror, oh old man. And put his hand on her mouth, he looked around. No. 
Don't call him, old man. He is the Hokage of our village. The most respected and strongest person in the whole village. If someone catches you calling him old. But he said he doesn't mind at all. I swear. She said quickly, not wanting to cause any trouble. But one thing stuck in her mind. Say say, is what you said really true? That old man is the strongest, and everyone respects him? Of course. He is the longest reigning Hokage of our village. Retaking his title after Yandaimi killed the Kayubi, but lost his life in the battle. Whoa, she had stars in her eyes as she looked at him. Can I become a Hokage too? Can I? Well, he said and cupped his chin. Maybe you should ask Hokage sama the next time you meet him. He's the most appropriate person to talk to about this after all. Natsumi nodded sagely. What's April Aprapre? Well, they would need to work on her language, it seems. Hyuga Hinata was the sole heiress to the noble Hyuga clan. A clan which was pronounced for its unique bloodline limit, the Byakugan. The Byakugan eye was feared throughout the nations for the great visual prowess that it grants the wielders, including a near 360 degree field of vision, ability to see through objects, and telescopic vision. The strength varies from user to user. The Hyuga clan had two branches the main branch and side branch. Hinata was born in the main branch to Hyuga Hiyashi and Hyuga Hitomi. Her mother died when she was an infant, thus leaving Hiyashi to raise her alone. Hiyashi, racked with grief over the loss of his wife, determined to be the best father to her daughter. He started training her daughter, along with his nephew, in the art of gentle fist, and he was pleased to notice that both of them were very talented. Neji more so than Hinata, but he was still immensely proud of them both. But of course, he was not supposed to show any emotions, so he never really complimented them too much. Thus, she was not as timid as some people would make her out to be. Her first cousin, Hyuga Neji, was born to Hiyashi's younger twin Hazashi, and thus, marked as a branch member when he was three years old. But he still loved his younger cousin dearly. He was told by his father that an older brother's duty is to protect his younger sister, and he would follow the advice to his heart. Today was Hinata's fourth birthday and the Hyuga clan was having a celebration for their heiress. Many influential people and families were called, except the Uchiha. Mainly because of the growing tensions between the Uchiha and the village, and their own rivalry. The Hokage briefly attended the feast as well, but had to leave in a hurry due to having an important meeting with a Kumo envoy. The Hyuga clan grounds were anything but plain. If someone were to look at it, it wouldn't be too far off for them to assume that they have somehow returned back in time. Old styled buildings with fish ponds and small gardens. It was indeed a sight to see. A five year old Neji was standing with his father, holding his hand. He watched from a distance as Hanada was presented with various gifts and congratulations. Neji smiled upon seeing his sister's face, practically glowing with happiness and a small amount of nervousness. He looked at his hands and made a fist, promising himself. I'll protect that smile as long as I have these hands. Soon, it was night and the celebration was over. The guests had all returned to their homes, and everyone in the Hyuga Manor was asleep. Everyone except Neji that is. He couldn't sleep as his stomach felt bloated. Probably from all the sweets that he ate today. But what could he do? He loved sweets. He thought he heard some noise from outside but waved it off as someone from the clan. Clearly, no one would be foolish enough to infiltrate one of the four noble clans of Konoha. He heard something again and grew alert. Standing up silently, he made his way to the noise. Neji went out of the manor, but he couldn't see anyone. He was just about to activate his Byakugan when something, or rather someone, dropped on top of him with such force, knocking the five-year-old out instantly. The Kumo Shinobi let out a sigh of relief. He was almost caught. If the kid had managed to see him, he would have undoubtedly made things difficult. He adjusted the wriggling bag under his arm and made his way out of the clan grounds, being sure to be as quiet as possible. So, Kumo offers a peace treaty? It sounds too good to be true, considering your Rakage's well known dislike for Konoha. The Kumo envoy squirmed under the Hokage's gaze. Truthfully, his mission was just to buy some time for his partner to kidnap the Hyuga heiress and then bullshit his way out of the meeting. He was under the impression that the Hokage was old and would be easy to fool. He didn't think he was going to be facing Serutobi Hirazan and Shimura Danzo. Danzo was not an easy man to fool by any means. He was cold, calculating, and obsessively loyal to Konoha. Or at least, his view of what Konoha should be like. After their loss in the last war against Namikaze Minato, 
They had suffered greatly. They could not be sure, but the man was even more ruthless than he usually appeared to be. Almost as if taking out his anger on something else. He fought like a man possessed. The current rakage, I, was soundly beaten to his knees. And then Monado humiliated him by sparing his life. If only out of sick amusement. The rakage had fled with his tail between his legs. But he promised to bring vengeance upon him. Unfortunately, Monado was dead now, with no family members left that he knows of. So, what better way to get his revenge and acquire a powerful asset for his village at the same time? He capitalized on the peace-loving third Hokage to jump at the chance of a peace treaty, and he was correct to do so. Unfortunately, he, too, forgot to take into account the man's shadow, the shinobi of darkness, Shimura Danzo. Whatever your rakage is plotting, we need no part in it. Konoha will stand at the top of all the five nations, and then Kumo and Iwa will be nothing more than side characters. Danzo said in a smug voice, not letting his lone eye wander from the man in front of him. Even if I do want peace and do not share the exact same views as my old friend, Danzo scoffed at that, making him smile, I'll have to admit that the timing for this proposition is a little too suspicious, and your terms are very vague. The Kumo envoy gritted his teeth and made a show of getting upset. He was sure he had bought enough time by now. He bowed. I'll take my leave then, Hokage-san, Shimura-san. I wish you good health. After the envoy left hurriedly, Hiruzen looked at his rival and nodded. That fool, Rakage, is plotting something nefarious. It would be best to exercise caution. Hound. A gray-haired masked man appeared in front of them, kneeling follow him, and make sure he doesn't wander around too much. Yes, Hokage-sama. After the Anbu left, Danzo looked Hiruzen in the eye and said, that boy, Naruto, is something else. His affinity for wood release is so potent, I dare say he may become an even greater asset than our Shodem-sama. Kino doesn't even come close. He was somewhat rough around the edges, but I've helped him develop his senses for the last three months. Hiruzen masked his shock quite well. Truthfully, he had assigned Natsumi to live next door to Naruto for multiple reasons. First was that the boy clearly held no ill feelings towards the girl. He might change his views once he learns of her status, he would be most disappointed if it comes to that. So, the girl had someone to turn to if she needed anything. Hiruzen would be lying if he said she didn't grow on him. It was always refreshing to talk to her, and recently, the girl had expressed her desire to become Hokage. He had chuckled when she said that. Of course, her reasons were childish, but she had spirit. Maybe she could actually do it. Who knows? The second reason was to keep an eye on Naruto, using the same Anbu that guarded Natsumi. He wasn't questioning the boy's loyalty, but he was afraid that his ideals might change after spending so much time around Danzo. That would be no good. He took a gamble when he had asked Danzo to train the boy. It was for the best, he had reasoned. Danzo had already taught one student in wood release, and Hiruzen had let him get away with studying his old teacher's scrolls, and if it helps the next generation to grow stronger. He was ready to take risks. Surely you jest. Hashirama-sama was in a league of his own. If the boy has even greater potential than him, well, I'm inquisitive about his lineage. It was a pity we could not find it out the last time we tried when he was found. Maybe we should try again? Danzo thought for a while. I will have a look into it, he stood up, tapping his cane, and, I'm not your, old friend. Danzo left, and Hiruzen smiled to himself. Some things never change. Naruto looked around frantically as he was submerged in quicksand. He could not get out of it, no matter how hard he tried. He started thrashing, but it only made things worse. So, he calmed down. Concentrating on his dense chakra, he called on it. Chakra flowed through his coils like a water pipe that would burst and he released it all at once. Kai, he fell on his behind, back in the clearing that he was training in, and blinked. Good, that was quicker than the last time, but you need to be faster and use less chakra. You would be dead ten times over if I wanted to kill you. Or if by chance you survived me, you will attract every shinobi in the near vicinity. He had asked his mentor to help him against the Sharingan, and Shisui saw no reason to decline. He had already taught the both of them Shunshin. He even got to mess with Izumi this way, when she will undoubtedly notice Naruto's resistance to her eye. It will be fun. He rubbed his hands. Why are? Why are you giggling like that? Naruto looked at him strangely. His laugh was somewhat disturbing. Oh, nothing, he said distractedly, 
just thinking about how to mess with Izumi and Sasuke. That boy is very fun to tease. He clings to his sister like a monkey and never has anything nice to say to me, so I'm sorry if I don't consider him as fun. Well, he'll come around. He's just jealous of you hoarding his dear sister to yourself, all the time. He poked him in the ribs. Don't do that. If you, he stopped abruptly, do you hear that sound? Shisui's face grew serious, and he nodded. Both of them jumped into the trees and erased their presence. The Kumo Shinobi ran as fast as he could, with a struggling bag under his arms. He supposed he should have knocked out the insufferable brat, but he was in such a hurry that he did not bother with it. He stopped in a clearing and looked around, and then opened the sack. Okay, you brat. Go to sleep now ha. Huh? As soon as he opened it, Hanada jumped out with an angry expression, her Baikugan active and swiftly delivered a gentle fist strike to the shinobi's groin. The shinobi dropped to his knees, and his vision grew hazy, cradling his crushed ornaments. He saw red and got up shakily. Why you stupid bitch? He was about to slap a now slightly scared Hanada, her fury forgotten in front of her angered foe, and raised his hand. It was stopped when a kanai was pierced through his hand. Naruto dropped to the ground and kicked his feet from under him, hitting the still incredibly disoriented shinobi with enough strength to knock him out. He looked around to comfort the young girl when he saw her looking at him with a strange expression. She had stars in her eyes as she looked at her savior, his lean moonlit face, wild golden locks, and violet eyes. Of course, she has heard the stories where a prince saves the princess, and she has finally found her destined one. It had to be. She was about to thank her savior and ask for his name when they heard a rustle in the leaves. Another Kumo shinobi walked out of the bushes. He had been running for a while now, avoiding the village center area. This was the place that they agreed to meet upon, but he could see that something clearly went wrong. His partner was lying on the ground, unconscious, still cradling his groin. And two brats were standing atop of him, one of them their targets. This was bad. Maybe if he retreats now and proclaims that the man was acting on his own, he would still be fine. He started walking backwards, but he found something blocking his way. The hound-masked Anbu was standing in his way. Even with that mask on, he could still make out his smug expression. Going somewhere? Kumo Shinobi-san, he waved his hand in mock greeting. The Kumo envoy knew his chances were dim. He gritted his teeth and ran towards the only exit left. He didn't make it far before Shisui dropped in front of him. We didn't even have the pleasure to make your acquaintance. You won't go without saying goodbye, will you? Shisui grinned after he said that. The shinobi looked around and noticed he was surrounded and accepted his defeat. He dropped on his knees and raised his hands. I surrender. At this point, it was the only way he would survive. Well, even if he makes it back home in one piece, the rakage will kill him for sure. Hayuga Hiyashi was angry. No, that would be wrong. Hayuga were not supposed to show any emotions. But somehow, one could see the absolute visage of cold fury etched on his face. Even if he never showed any affection towards his daughter, Hiyashi truly loved her, to the point he'd kill anyone if it meant keeping his daughter safe. Hanada's attempted kidnapping and the attack on his nephew was weighing heavily on his inner turmoil. Hiyashi wanted blood. His brother Hazashi was not feeling any better. But sometimes, people don't get what they want. There was one thing that he was especially proud of his daughter for, however. The kidnapper was never going to reproduce again. Hiyashi allowed a smile on his face, of course, when no one was looking and made it sure to pat his daughter's head. Neji was not any better and was sulking because of his inability to protect his cousin. But after telling him that he never had any chance against a skilled Jonin in straight battle, he calmed down somewhat. At least his sister was safe. They were in front of the Hokage. Naruto was specially called by Hiyashi's request, who was told about him from his looks alone by a still slightly dazed Hanada. Hiyashi was not sure why his daughter used the word, prince, but he would let it slide. I, Hayuga Hiyashi, am in your debt. He bowed. Even if my daughter managed to distract him for a while, he would have undoubtedly overpowered her. If you ever need anything, know that the Hayuga are standing behind you. Naruto scratched the back of his head and smiled embarrassedly. Hiruzen was looking with an amused smile. It was not every day one would see the Hyuga clan head like this. Please, stand up. A man of your stature should not bow, Hiyashi Sama. I did what anyone would have done in my shoes. His tone was respectful. 
Regardless, you have my gratitude. Naruto nodded respectfully. A shinobi dropped in front of them, addressing Serutobi. Hokage-sama, our T&I experts have made them accept their crimes. The official statements are here. He gestured to the folder in his hand. Excellent. Hiruzen let out. Konoha will have a huge political advantage against Kumo now. They cannot attack us without any provocations on our side, but we already have the reasons to do so. However, I'll pressurize the Rakage to sign a peace treaty on our terms, holding this statement above him. Hiyashi's mood noticeably soured upon not getting any retribution. It seems infertility was the only retribution he was going to get. Two days later, in the village of Kumogakure, a muscled dark-skinned man was aggressively lifting his weights as he watched his two shinobi squirm before him. So, he let out in a menacing voice, not only you failed, but now Konoha has an advantage over us. Damn it. He punched his desk out of his office through the window. I'll show them in the Chunin exams, Kumo won't lose in its home. Naru, why did everyone leave? I, don't know. It's been four months since Natsumi moved to the apartment next to him, but slowly, all the residents, except him, were leaving the place to live elsewhere. For some reason that he could not fathom, people tend to avoid her. Most of the adults just stared at her from afar, various emotions on their faces, ranging from disgust to fear. Naruto was not an idiot. Of course, he realized that there was something different about her. Even the Hokage seemed to give special attention to her, but what was it? They were going to the nearby park, partly because he was done training with Danzo for today and partly because Natsumi was bothering him to take her. He supposed this was what the Hokage had in mind when he gave her the adjacent apartment. But he didn't mind. She was pleasant to be around, and her cheerfulness affected him as well. And surprisingly, she never asked him for any help, other than when she just wanted to talk or go out somewhere. They got to the park and found it was somewhat filled. There were a lot of kids playing ninja or tag. He never played any games with others when he was their age, but it did seem fun. Why don't you go and play while I sit here? Naruto went to the swings and sat on one. Maybe, they will let you play today? No, they won, she said meekly. They have already visited this park twice in the last few months, and he noticed that the kids never allowed her to play. He never had much experience in making friends since he was pretty much a loner. Well, he still is. But that's not the point. She sat on the swing beside him, and both of them just watched the kids play. And Naruto had a strong sense of deja vu. Granny telling him to go and make friends with kids his age. Him coming to the park and just watching others as he sat alone on the swing, practicing his flute. At that time, he did not think of it much. But he now realized how pitiful it actually was. He looked at her sad face and stood up. W.H. Where are you going? Nowhere. He went behind her and pulled the chains of her swing, giving it a push. Natsumi blinked when she realized what was happening, and slowly a smile bloomed on her face. She laughed merrily as she swung higher and higher. Hi higher hig no no. Not so high. Naruto's mischievous little smile was the only response to her words. Danzo fiddled with the papers in his hand anxiously. These were the blood reports that he had asked one of his root Anbu to bring. Naruto's reports. Of course, he had his doubts, but he was under the impression that, maybe, his parents were some of the stronger ninja, probably lost in the Third War. But this. Incredible. How could this have stayed hidden for so long? He's practically royalty. He looked at the papers one by one. Reports matched with, Namikaze Minato Uzumaki Kashina. And, Senju Tobarama. How? And Hiruzen had no idea about this. They managed to hide Kashina's first pregnancy, even from his root. This didn't make any sense to him at all. The only reason that this would be possible was if someone was actively trying to hide Naruto's identity. But who? Don't you know? That too much curiosity gets the cat killed, hum. Danzo? A slithering voice said. He noticed a sudden movement from the corner of his eye, and his anbu was down on the ground the next second. There was no doubt who it was. Orochimaru. His voice was calm as he spoke. Why have you come here? I did not order you to bring me my replacements yet. Don't make me decide that you have outlived your usefulness, or I will end you. The dark room was filled with mocking laughter as the visage of a man came into view. He had a tall and thin body with shoulder-length black hair. His skin was sickly pale, and his eyes were shaped like those of a snake. Your sense of humor has not aged well with time, I see, to believe that you can order me to do something. 
his facial expression changed into an amused smile. Regardless, I cannot allow you to tamper with my plans now, can I? I came as soon as I could when my informant told me that you were snooping around. Seventeen's heritage cannot be brought out in the open right now. It would bring too much attention. Why do you even care? Why do you care what happens to the boy? Danzo ignored the jab and focused on the more important part. He didn't need to ask who Seventeen was. They were talking about the same person. I've got plans for him. Plans that are none of your business. I don't want him to get killed before that. His voice got serious. Remember this. The only reason you could get your hands on this information is because of my own amusement. I allowed it. Now, you will be left with this truth in your stomach, with no one to babble to. Because if you do. A malicious smile came over his face. I'll decide that you have outlived your usefulness and end you. He was having too much fun teasing Danzo. Danzo gritted his teeth. He was at a disadvantage here. The biggest problem is that he needs Orochimaru for the continuous supply of his most powerful weapon, his arm made of Hashirama cells. Unfortunately, it decays with time, and the only people who could make one are Senju Tsunade and Orochimaru. He'd have an easier time taking the first Hokage's necklace from Tsunade than to force her to build him an arm made of her grandfather's cells. Something was still bothering him, though. How does Hiraza not know of this? And how is he related to Toborama sensei Surely, you would sat my curiosity. Because, of course, I will not be babbling, as you've put it. Orochimaru chuckled amusedly. My dear foolish sensei, he saw the child get buried. And let's just say, because of the enhancements that I performed on him, Seventeen underwent physical changes. He shook his head. So, he now looks nothing like the boy that was buried back then. And Minato was the only one who could decipher and utilize the Hiraishin. A technique so dangerous, that Senju Tobarama made sure that only his descendant may make use of it. You may draw your own conclusions. Either Tobarama hid his family from the whole world, or well, he just had a bastard son or daughter which he himself did not know of. He knew his sensei very well. Hiruzen saw the dead child with his eyes that night, and he himself left the village when the Third War was in its final stages. Of course, a Hokage has to put his nation above two no-name orphans. So, all it took was some indirect tampering of his records, and his sensei was none the wiser. He chuckled amusedly, remembering how it all started. What is the meaning of life? Orochimaru has always asked himself the same question, and he ended with the same conclusion every time. Life has no meaning at all. It is a fleeting dream. One that you may wake up from any time. Human life is fragile. One may lose it at the swing of a sword. But what if it wasn't? What if one could live forever, finding out all the secrets of this world, master all that there is to learn? What then? Life has a meaning all of a sudden. All your progress. All your work, it won't go down the drain when you die. Because you won't die at all. He has seen plenty of death in his life. Once, he was but a little boy. Terrified in this wretched world of violence and deceit. His parents were murdered in front of his eyes. But then he found friends in his teammates and his sensei and he felt content for a while. Even happy, he might say. Jiraiya was a buffoon. Always goofing around and hitting on any girl he sees. He might have been an idiot, but life was never boring with him around. Tsunade was like a sister to him, but she scared him when they were kids. Well, she still did somewhat, considering her monstrous strength that can crush mountains. Orochimaru was not a fan of getting punched by Tsunade. That honor should go to his friend Jiraiya who miraculously comes back alive after every punch. But then he makes a perverted comment, and the cycle would repeat. When his parents were killed, it seemed like the roof on his head was gone, and he was standing in the rain, all alone. But then Serutobi sensei came and shielded him from it all. Like a parent would. However, this was but the fantasies of an immature boy. Reality came crashing down on him when the three of them fought in the Second Great War. No, no, no no. You can't die. The voice was a female, with noticeable distress in her tone, I won't let you go like this. Tsunade used every ounce of medical knowledge that she had as she scrambled to treat her dying lover. It was a pitiful sight, one that made him reconsider the transient nature of life, and he realized something. He never wanted to feel what Tsunade felt back then. He never wanted to feel the pain of loss. But what could he do about it? Strong as they might have been, the three of them could die at any time. All it would take was a slashed throat or a pierced heart. He thought about it for a very long time, 
and he finally found something resembling a solution. He won't feel the pain of loss if he never had anyone to lose. He wouldn't be affected by the limitations of humans if he was immortal. He could take all the knowledge of the world, something that would take several lifetimes, and he could do it in one. Yes, that sounded perfect. With his genius mindset on it, he started to work on it. Different scenarios came to his mind as he progressed further in his research. He slowly started to distance himself from his team as he spent more and more time in his lab whenever he was not on the battlefield. His interest changed into his obsession as he frantically tried to find a solution, and then he finally came to a conclusion. His current body was not strong enough. He had no unique genes to speak of, no bloodline limits. His body was ordinary and weak. He underwent various enhancements, and while he was nowhere as ordinary when he was at the start, he could not do one major thing. One thing that would bring him even closer to his dreams. The only ninja arts that were known to give life. The wood release of the first Hokage. That was the answer to his problem. If he had the wood release, he could control the flow of life itself. With the first Hokage's sage mode and wood release in his grasp, he could theoretically take energy from nature and add it to his own. It was the perfect solution, but it wasn't an easy one. He acquired some of Hashirama cells and started to work on artificially replicating them. At first, his subjects were the shinobi or civilians that he managed to abduct from other countries during the war. All of them died, and he made no progress. This was around the time that he met Urahara Kayasuka, the head of the medic department of Konoha. He was a tall, lean man with pale blonde hair. Their interest in extending human lives brought them together, forming a mutually beneficial relationship. Kayasuka was no Tsunade, but he wasn't an amateur either. Soon, Orochimaru began experimenting on children. Most of them were orphans, kids who won't be missed by anyone, but he had the same problem here. All of them kept dying. If only he could find a child who had strong vitality, enough to not break when undergoing the intense bloodline transfer process. That was when Kayasuka came forth with an idea. One that would solve his problem. If you need a strong child, I have some information that might help your cause. Orochimaru looked at him curiously and raised a brow. Do tell. What is this information? Uzumaki Kashina will be giving birth this month. I do not know who the father is, but her Uzumaki genes should give this child enough strength to undergo your process. This information is on a need-to-know basis, and only I and two other nurses are aware of it at this point in the hospital. She has been under house arrest for some months now, so only her closest friends should be aware of this. Finally, this could be the thing he was looking for all this time. Yes, this could work. But he needed to play it safe. He needed a plan which would help him get the child without any unrequired attention. And he knows just what to use. An excited smile crept on his face, which looked quite disturbing. He started chuckling. Kayasuka san, I think that we are finally going to make some progress. This is excellent news. Three days later, Orochimaru gave him a vial containing some substance. When Kayasuka asked what it was, the only reply he got was, This is a special poison that I want you to give her when she comes for her checkups. It will solely affect the child, which will be born very weak due to this. Kashina should be fine due to her special condition, and the child's genetics should keep him alive for a few hours. However, to everyone, it will seem as if the child is dead. But in reality, it should be in a state of stasis. What if the child dies from this? Well then, that would be a shame, won't it? If the subject dies from this poison, then they cannot survive my process either. Kashina would have burst from happiness if she could. Sure, she was angry when she found out she was pregnant. It wasn't planned at all. And Minato was being a sissy again. But that was nothing new, she supposed. Minato might be the most confident ninja on the battlefield, but he was quite an idiot when it came to dealing with other, non-shinobi things. She was scared that 20 was a young age to be a parent. But she came to accept the idea over the past few months. She couldn't wait to be a mother now. Minato fainted when she told him that he was going to be a father. She had a fun time teasing him about it. She grinned. She was going to smother her child with so much love that she might even spoil him. Of course, it was going to be a son. She was sure of her intuition. Her eyes watered with happiness as she daydreamed about her future family, but she sucked them in. Uzumaki Kashina was a strong woman, she doesn't cry. They have been thinking about a name and finally settled on one. She always giggled whenever she thought about his name. Menma their child was either going to love them for it, if he inherits her love for ramen, or hate them outright, 
but she knew her baby. He was going to be just like her. She caressed her stomach lovingly. Mom cannot wait to finally meet you, Menma. That was when it happened. Namikaze Minato was a happy man. It has been quite a few months since his girlfriend told him that she was carrying their child. Sure, he might have overreacted a little. Maybe a lot. But that wasn't his fault at all. He never imagined he would be becoming a father at the age of 20. The idea scared him. What if he's not a good father? What if the war stretches out for another decade, and he fails to come back on time to see his child and girlfriend? What if his child hates him for never being there? What if? Sensei, you're doing it again, a brown-haired girl said. You never tell us what it is about. It was a brash voice this time. Why would Sensei have to tell you anything, dumbass? Kakashi-kun, don't be rude to your teammate, Minato chastised lightly. Kakashi just looked away. He was assigned to be the Jonin sensei of a Genin team this year. He was not really against the idea, but it was a new experience for him. His students were already growing on him. Hitaki Kakashi, son of the White Fang of Konoha, Uchiha Obito. And, Nohara Rin. Three nine-year-old kids. How about some dango, my treat? He asked them. All right. Sensei is paying. Have some shame, you idiot. Why you? Suddenly Minato's eyes widened, and he disappeared in a yellow flash. My free dango, Obito spoke sullenly. Don't worry, Obito-kun. I'm sure Minato-sensei had something important to do. Kashina. Minato. Hurry, it should be any time now. Minato nodded shakily and teleported Kashina and himself to a hideout, quite far from the village. They had selected this place for Kashina because the process of childbirth for a Jinchuriki was different. He would have to actively suppress the seal binding the Kayubi, or the results would be disastrous. It was a remote location in a cave. He gently lowered Kashina on a table of stone. I'll be back in a moment. Wait for me. He disappeared in a flash and returned with a disoriented woman, one of the two nurses assigned to her. Wa what? Where am I? In one of my hideouts. Please, we need your help. The nurse looked at the scene and nodded, her previous confusion forgotten as she got to work. Minato went over to his girlfriend and kissed her forehead before putting both his hands over the seal on her abdomen. She cried out loud as it began to hurt and gripped the table tightly, cursing incoherently. Minato resisted the urge to comfort her and focused on the seal. After an hour of shouting and threats to his life, Kashina finally gave birth to a boy. He was a small thing, and Minato and Kashina were already in love with their child. He had Kashina's beautiful red hair and her violet eyes, but his face was an even balance between both his parents. He had three whisker marks on both cheeks, probably due to her being the Jinchuriki of Kayubi. Menma, she spoke weakly, bring him to me. The nurse lowered the baby next to her and gave the new parents some space. Kashina brought him closer to her as she caressed his face, and tears welled up in her eyes. Ever since the destruction of her homeland, she had always wanted a family. Minato's presence helped her a lot, and now this child. Minato crouched next to her and looked with a smile on his face. He brought his fingers to Menma's face and touched his whiskers. The child responded by turning his head slightly towards him. He looked so delicate. Minato looked away, wiping his eyes with his sleeves. Minato, don't be such a wimp, in front of Menma. I'm, he broke out in a sob still covering his eyes with his sleeves, I'm a father. He had no words to describe the absolute joy he was feeling. This was his son. He didn't care if Kashina called him a sissy now. I'll need to check on the boy. It shouldn't take more than a few hours, the nurse spoke, feeling like she was interrupting something, but we need to go to the Konoha hospital. I can't run the tests here. Minato nodded quickly. He must have heard it wrong. There was no way this could be true. No way at all. Your son did not survive, Namikaze san. In the next moment, Minato shoved the man forcefully towards the wall, gripping his neck tightly. Don't, his voice was eerily calm, with me, Kayasuka. His voice was sharp and carried a great threat. Kayasuka felt like he was staring into the Shinigami's mouth as he looked into those cold blue eyes. He was sure there was a wet spot on his pants. He was almost tempted to ditch the plan, but he will not fail now not when they were so close to their goal. Nami, he broke in a cough, and Minato dropped him on the floor. Namikaze-san, he spoke while still massaging his throat, I understand your anguish. However, please accept the fact that your child is dead. 
We could do nothing. He was born very weak. There was no way he would have survived longer than he did. That was a lie, of course, but they didn't need to know that. Hiruzen and Makoto were present as well. Jiraiya would have been here if he wasn't out on the battlefield. Only a few people knew this, but Hiruzen was grooming Minato to be the next Hokage when he inevitably retires. They had become good friends over the last year, and Minato wanted Hiruzen to be present to meet Menma. But that seemed impossible now. Meanwhile, Makoto was helping an unmoving Kashina as she sat on the bench, her eyes unfocused. Kashina's eyes that were once filled with so much life were now filled with an unending sadness as she mourned the loss of her son Menma. Minato punched the wall and leaned his forehead against it. If there was some way that he could give up his life in exchange for his sons, he would do it in a heartbeat. Angry tears escaped his eyes. Hiruzen looked at the unmoving child on the bed. His hair red like Kashina, with unique whisker marks on his cheeks. He placed a hand on Minato's shoulder and shook his head. I will not tell you to calm down, or that time will heal all wounds, he took a deep breath, because it will not. You will just have to learn to live with it, my friend. Minato didn't say anything or look up. He knew it wasn't his fault that his son died. He knew it. But as he watched Kashina in a state like that, the only thing he could wonder was. Was he a failure as a father? Orochimaru watched from afar as they buried the supposed dead child. There were not many people present. Only Kashina, Minato, Hiruzen, his wife and Makoto. He mused if he should be feeling some guilt for doing this since this was the first time he will be taking a child away from its parents. All of the other kids he took were orphans, so no one would be there to miss them. But he decided it doesn't matter what he felt in the end. The answer for immortality was not much far beyond now. He waited for hours as everyone went back to their homes. Everyone but Minato and Kashina. They kept looking for a while. Minato with his arm over Kashina's shoulder. After an hour, they two walked out, supporting each other. Orochimaru retrieved the child and gave him the antidote, which put him out of his death-like state. Within a few days, the child was already at the top of his health. This was the seventeenth child that he would be performing his experiment on, and all but one of them died. Number four was alive, but his wood affinity was but a small glimpse of what seventeen's potential was. Orochimaru experimented with the child's DNA, infused him with the cells of first Hokage, but he was puzzled to see that it did not add anything new to his DNA. It felt almost like strengthening the already existing properties rather than add new ones. He came to a startling realization. This child already had the wood release, but this was only possible if he was part Senju. Further examination proved that he was Tobarama's descendant, his great-grandson to be precise. The only thing that his experiments achieved to do is strengthen his dormant Senju blood, which was diluted with Minato not being a pure-blooded Senju. His red hair, which was an Uzumaki trait, was replaced when his hair started to change color. It was subtle at first, but with time, his hair lost its red color and looked more and more like Minato's blonde hair. His whisker marks, which were due to being him subjected to the Kyubi's chakra, started fading when his Senju blood purified it, further adding it to his chakra reserves. Orochimaru was most pleased. Finally, now all he had to do was to wait and let the child get stronger on his own. Meanwhile, he will be developing his other jutsu, which will allow him to change bodies. All was set. By now, Orochimaru had already accepted that he was going to be an immortal. He will live longer than anyone alive right now, and he will be a god amongst men. There would be nothing that would be out of his reach. It was just too bad that he forgot just why he started on this journey of his. Over time, Orochimaru's mind became deranged as he began to see himself as more of a god than a human. So, naturally, he felt betrayed when his own sensei rejected him for the position of the Hokage in favor of Minato. While he was holed up inside his laboratory, Namikaze Minato fought in the war like a man possessed, channeling his anger into killing his enemies. His legends were told all around the world. He became the only man to ever have a flea on sight order to his name. I of Kumogakure was a confident man. Some might say he was overconfident, but he believed he had every right to be overconfident with his combo of speed and power. I was prideful. So, naturally, he had to show the Namikaze just who the real boss was. After getting thoroughly beaten by a stone faced Minato, he had to accept, grudgingly, of course, that Minato was the boss. He was on his knees by the time Minato was done with him, his pride demolished. Ho! W? How are you, so strong? 
I asked weakly, still not standing. Minato threw one of his kanai at him, and he thought that was it for him. He closed his eyes and waited for death to take him. But all he felt was a slight twinge of pain on his right cheek. He looked up to notice Minato looking at him disinterestedly. You fight like an animal, I. Run. Run away, and don't show me your face again on the battlefield. His voice was dull, but his eyes had an unearthly glow in them. Or I won't be so merciful the next time. I didn't need to be told twice. He ran away but swore vengeance on Namikaze. Orochimaru started being less and less discreet with his experiments. He kept trying to artificially give them bloodlines since more goons were always helpful, but none were successful. In time, Hiruzen realized that his pupil has gone down a dark path, and there was no turning him back now. The lonely child that he took care of, the innocent child who watched in terror as his parents got murdered in front of him, was no more. There was a snake in his place now. When Orochimaru realized that his old sensei would be storming down into his laboratory any day now, and he would have to flee, he gave Kayasuka some instructions. I will not take the child with me. I will use the village to do my work. They will surely notice his endless potential and I will take over his body when the time comes, coming even closer to eternal life. He smirked. All you have to do is to keep any unnecessary attention off of him. You know what to do. For six years, he stayed in hiding. Only then did he start making his move, attracting attention from a particular organization. Hiruzen was having a good day. He had finished all of his work, and now, he was free to do whatever he wanted. Hiruzen looked around with a severe expression and dismissed his anbu. He carefully opened his drawer and took out a book. He looked at it with a strange expression before a perverted smile came over its place. No matter how much of a pervert his student was, or precisely because he was a pervert, his books were always fascinating to read. The quality of the material was off the charts. Indeed, it was a book for real men. He giggled a bit. Suddenly his office door was opened, and he hid his book under the table in a flash. He was surprised to see that it was his old friend and rival, Danzo. Danzo. What brings you here? Danzo looked at the weird position his rival was in. Cheeks still slightly red, his nose had a bit of blood, and his right hand was in a strange position under the table, like he was hiding something. Danzo would have subtly teased him if not for his current mood. Orochimaru had left a while ago, issuing further blackmail threats if he told anyone about Naruto's heritage. Of course, he tried to kill the snake before he disappeared. But all he hit was a mud clone, and the room rocked with mocking laughter. I looked into the boy's reports. It doesn't seem like his parents were anyone of worth. Probably some of the more powerful shinobi that were lost in the Third War. Silence reigned for a moment. Hiruzen stared at Danzo with something akin to suspicion. I would not advise further tests. His lineage matters little, after all. All the shinobi of Konoha are her tools and weapons. It doesn't matter where they come from. Very well. It was only a matter of curiosity anyway. He filed it away for later and ignored the latter part of his statement. He knew by now that they will always have a difference in opinion. But he also knew that Danzo wasn't wholly wrong. They were just the two opposite sides of a coin. They looked into each other's eyes before Danzo turned around walked to the door. He put his hand on the door, but before he could open it, Hiruzen spoke out. I hope that you have trained him well. The rakage will try his absolute to make them fail. You don't have to worry about it. Even without using his bloodline, he is a capable shinobi. Danzo left, and Hiruzen was left to his devices. Nay san, look. Sasuke pointed his finger, it's your idiot friend. Izumi looked in the direction that her brother was pointing to and came across a strange sight if she were to be honest. Naruto, playing with a child? Izumi was walking back to her home, with Sasuke riding piggyback. They just came back from hunting a wild boar and Sasuke had sprained his ankle. Izumi suspected that it was just an excuse to not walk on their way back home, but she didn't mind. She made her way towards him and saw him stiffen as soon as he noticed her approaching. He stopped swinging Natsumi, and she jumped off of the swing as soon as she could, feeling dizzy. She stopped in front of him. Onyx-colored eyes stared into violet ones. Naruto. Izumi, it has been long. Not long enough. Sasuke pulled his eyelids and stuck out his tongue at him. Sadly, he was ignored. It has been a while, she nodded, I've been training. I hope you do not fall behind too much. It would be boring if my rival stops being a challenge. 
Her eyes flashed red for a second, and Naruto's own eyes widened. Amazing. She mastered it. There were three Tomo in her eyes, compared to two that he last saw. His expression changed from shock to an excited smirk. Don't worry about me. You will be surprised with what I can do now. We will see. She mirrored his smirk. So, kidnapping little girls now, are we? Naruto deadpanned. This is my new neighbor, Natsumi. Izumi looked mildly shocked that a girl of around Sasuke's age would live alone. Nay san. Let's go. Sasuke whined. Izumi turned around and started to walk away. She didn't look back when she spoke. It was good to see you. But Sasuke did turn back, still sitting on her back, when he stuck out his tongue again. No, it wasn't. Natsumi, who was silent this whole time, saw the duo leave. Her eyes filled with longing and slight jealousy. Naruto didn't know why, but felt a twinge of pain when he saw her like this. He sighed. Hop on. He was crouching in front of her, looking away as he scratched his cheek. Her eyes widened. You wanted to do this, right? She didn't wait any longer and slowly put her arms around his neck. Almost as if all of this would be some cruel joke. Naruto stood up, carrying her on his back, his arms supporting her legs under her knees. The sky had a reddish hue as the sun set. He walked out of the park, listening to the song of insects and the barely audible chatter of children. He noticed when she hid her face in the back of his neck, he certainly didn't imagine it when he felt drops rolling down his neck. Try not to get your snot on my clothes, shut up. Her smile contradicted her words. Naruto would be lying if he said he wasn't feeling a little nervous. It was finally the day that they leave for the Chunin exams to the village of Kumogakure. He leaned against the village's main gate, with no one else in sight, clad in his usual attire. A white jacket and an orange undershirt with black pants. The only new thing in his attire was a tonto strapped on his back in a sheath. The morning dew trickled against his skin, and the skies were still dark. He might have been a little early, now that he thought about it. Okay. Maybe he was too early. The only other people he could see were the gate guards, and they, too, were asleep. He contemplated waking the two of them up but then decided against it. He didn't think that they would be too pleased if he woke them up. He closed his eyes as he leaned his back against the gate and prepared to wait for a few hours. Izumi fiddled with her things as she stored them neatly in her backpack. She had been training for the past few months with her father, who took it upon himself to help his prodigious daughter master her Sharingan. A frown came over her face when her thoughts wandered to her father. Lately, he has been much more distant and stern. Her mother told her that it was nothing, that her father was always like this. But she didn't believe that her mother was telling the truth about everything being okay. She could practically feel the tension within the clan. The Uchiha had completely isolated themselves from the village in the past few years. Or rather, they were forced to relocate. The ever-growing feeling of unrest and the tense atmosphere made her uneasy. Her father had been giving more of his attention to Sasuke lately. He was obviously happy because of this development. That boy was so eager to please his father, to get some sort of appreciative gesture from him. Nay San. She looked up from her bag to see Sasuke looking at her excitedly. Will you see me practice shuriken today? Azumi's face softened, and a small smile came over her face. She gestured her brother to come near. Sasuke smiled widely, making his way over to his sister. His sister was finally. Ah. Sasuke covered his forehead with his hands, right where she poked him, and pouted. Izumi smiled apologetically. Forgive me, Sasuke. Maybe when I come back. Sasuke didn't stop pouting and crossed his hands, looking away from her. Izumi sighed. Hum. She made a show of thinking by putting her finger on her chin. I've heard that tomatoes from the Land of Lightning are very delicious. Who knows, maybe I will bring some back with me. Sasuke was elated in a second, already thinking about all the delicious tomatoes that he would get to eat. He nodded and smiled at her. Izumi noticed her mother and father making their way to her. She stood up and bowed. Father, mother, I will be leaving now. Makoto smiled at her, and Fugaku had a frown on his face, although it was not harsh. You will be a chunin by the time you come back, I'm sure of it. After all, you are my daughter. Take care, Izumi-chan. She nodded and made her way out of the house. Her father and mother were sometimes so different that it makes her wonder how did they get married in the first place. She made her way through the Uchiha compound, greeting people with a nod as she went. On her way to the gates, she met someone she was not expecting. 
Senpei. Yo. Shisui waved his hand, a grin on his face. I came to see off my two underlings. Let's go then. She looked up to see the sun rising. Knowing him, he's already waiting for me. In a dimly lit room, two figures could be made out. One was kneeling on the ground, while the other stood in front. A tap echoed across the room. Kino, do not forget the objective. Failure is not an option. Kino lifted his head. Yes, Danzo sama, Naruto. Naruto opened his eyes to see Izumi and Shisui standing in front of him. Izumi was wearing her high collar blue Uchiha shirt and black shorts. You took long enough. I've been standing here for hours. Where is the rest of our team? She completely ignored his statement. Shisui waved his hand in greeting and made his way over to him, leaning his back against the gate beside Naruto. I know who our third team member is, but I have no idea about our squad leader. Naruto tilted his head to the side, just in time for someone to appear before them. A boy older than them, having brown hair and wearing a hapori style head protector. He wore a navy blue shirt and had a sword strapped to his back. The newcomer bowed in greeting. I'm Kino, a temporary member of Team 2. I hope we get along. Uchiha Izumi, Izumi nodded politely. Shisui pushed himself off the gate and started to walk away. I would have wished you luck, but I don't think you will need it. He smiled at them. Let's meet when the two of you are Chunin. With that, he was gone in a shunshun. The three of them stood in awkward silence, still waiting for their fourth member. They stood for minutes, then hours. The streets of Konoha were filled with people now. Street vendors and shop owners could be seen haggling with their customers. The sun was now directly above them. Did Hokage sama forget about us? He said he was going to send one of his janin. Naruto pushed himself off the gate and made his way to Izumi. Just as he said that, they noticed a white haired, masked young man reading a book and walking by them. When they kept staring at him, he stopped walking but didn't look up from his book. What are you waiting for? Aren't you guys getting late? Naruto looked at the man in shock. That's Kakashi of the Sharingan. No one moved as they kept staring at the man, who acted like he didn't just make them wait for three hours. Well, he ran his hand through his spiky hair, his other hand still holding the book. If you guys aren't going to move, perhaps I can go and do something else. I never liked babysitting anyway. All three of them stiffened at the comment and slowly made their way to the man. Kakashi I smiled. See, it wasn't too hard now, was it? The only response he got was three glares, each of varying intensities. He acts like we are the ones who were late. The road to Kumo was a long one, but since all of them were shinobi and had experience in traveling, they did not need too many breaks. They traveled in silence, with no one really talking. Kakashi didn't look too enthused by what he called babysitting, but it was difficult to make out his expressions due to his face mask. They covered the distance of fire country quickly, hopping on trees. We are entering the land of lightning. Do not do anything that would get you in trouble, Kakashi told them in a dull voice. A chorus of, yes was heard. They made the rest of their way on land. The land of lightning was very different when compared to land of fire. Whereas the fire country had a variety of trees and a warm climate, the lightning, on the other hand, had tall mountain ranges. They arrived in the village of Kumo the night before the registration for the first part of the exams. The gate guards stared at them with a small amount of hostility, but they were let in after Kakashi showed their papers. It was not a secret that Kumo and Konoha were in a strained relationship. The recent peace treaty between the two villages did not carry much weight when the only one benefiting from it was Konoha. Have a good stay. And don't snoop around too much, the guard said pointedly. We will take care of that, won't we now? Kakashi gave the three of them a subtle glance. As long as you get it, this isn't your Konoha. You are in the village of Kumogakure. The four of them booked two rooms in an inn. Kakashi hoarded one room for himself and let the three of them stay in a single room, saying how, brats do not need a separate room for themselves. Kakashi and Kino went their separate ways and Naruto convinced Izumi to look around the village with him for a bit. It was their first time in one of the five main villages that was not Konoha, so he was a little excited to look around. They walked side by side on the streets, taking in everything. Even the housing buildings were different from what they had in Konoha. In Konoha, the houses were built on level ground. While in Kumo, they were built on the tall mountains that could be found everywhere, with clouds often obscuring the view. It was taking the term, hidden in the clouds literally. 
There are much more shinobi on the streets as compared to the civilians, Naruto said in a quiet voice. What would you expect? Kumo never followed the peace treaty after the wars to stop militarizing. It gives them a bad reputation, but the rakage doesn't seem to care. You seem to know a lot. My father makes sure that I know about these things. There was a comfortable silence between them as they walked on the streets of Kumo. Most of the Kumo shinobi gave them a stink eye or outright avoided them. It was to be expected, he mused. Looks like there is some kind of festival today. Naruto looked around. There was a line of shops, each of them lit with fancy lights and lanterns. The silver moonlight was distorted by the presence of clouds, clashing with the warm yellow of lanterns. Izumi stopped all of a sudden, looking pointedly inside a shop. Naruto followed her gaze and noticed a necklace. He saw that it was a simple necklace, having three metal rings held together by pieces of thread. First prize for any young man who swims across the ice cold river. Is there anyone brave enough? First prize. Who would be so foolish? Izumi muttered and turned on her heels. Let's go back. The registration should be early in the morning. She started to walk in the direction of their inn. When she noticed she was walking alone, she looked over her shoulder and raised an eyebrow. Naruto looked away from her eyes and scratched his cheek. You may go. I, I will look around for a bit more. He gave her a nervous smile. Izumi shrugged but didn't question more. Fine, but come back before midnight. You can count on it. He gave her a thumbs up and a grin, getting a small smile in return. There was a tense silence in the Rakage's office. I, the fourth Rakage, was sitting on his chair, his arms folded as he looked in front of him. He was a muscular, dark skinned, tall man with light blonde hair. Adorning his massive frame was an open white howry, which didn't do much in covering his chest. His voice was gruff and stern as he spoke. Konoha will send her best genin squad, no doubt about that. The wretched leaf dared to humiliate us in our last mission, so it is crucial for us to win now. I will not accept any failures, he slammed his hand on his table, cracking it. There were five people present in the room, excluding I. Darui. A white-haired teen stepped in front. You, Samui, and C will be part of one team. I expect you to pass the first two stages with minimal resistance. Understood. Rakage Sama. I shifted his gaze to a blonde-haired girl and grunted. Yugito, the girl stepped forward. You will be in a team with two other genin. Your job is to carry them throughout the second exam. And, his voice got dangerously low, it would be preferable if you get rid of the Konoha Genin before the final stage. Yugito's face became blank, her eyes cold. Samui sent her fellow blonde a sympathetic look. She knew Yugito refrained from killing, as long as she could help it. She nodded and spoke in a monotonous voice. Understood, Rekage Sama. The last member was looking at the scene with his hands crossed, leaning on the wall. He suddenly leapt up in front of the Rekage. Yo, bro. Why so low? Just let him go with the flow, yeah. Shut up, B. I smashed his table in half. We will show the world that Kumo is not filled with cowards. Whatever bro, just don't piss and moan when it comes back to bite yo, in the zone, oh yeah. Iron Claw. He was sent crashing through the wall the next moment. Naruto opened the door to their shared room and silently made his way inside. It was a few minutes till midnight, so he was clear on that front. He was not surprised to see Izumi sleeping on one of the beds, her mouth half open. He smiled a bit. Why are you wet? Naruto jumped, but he was proud to admit that he did not shriek when he saw something terrifying. Tenzo's face was lit in the darkness with a candle as he stared at him. Naruto put his right hand over his heart as he took deep breaths. He was still afraid of ghosts. What? He tilted his head, his big brown eyes shining. Never seen a handsome guy before. Naruto deadpanned at him, pinching the wick of the candle and extinguishing it. I don't swing that way. He went to the washroom, quickly changing his clothes, and then laid down on his bed. It is kind of obvious that you don't, with how much you and is. Let me sleep, Tenzo. It's Kino. Kino e. Why can you not understand? Your Danzo sama would be very disappointed with your excessively emotional behavior if he found out. Tenzo went quiet on hearing this, and he moved in his bed. Ever since Danzo took him, it was ingrained into his mind that a good shinobi never shows any emotions. It was somewhat true, but he was never able to follow it fully. Let's do our best tomorrow. Tenzo made a sound of confirmation but didn't speak again. 
The three of them got up early the following day, meeting up with their leader, who was fortunately on time today. Kakashi just gave them a dull thumbs up and a, do your best, before going on his merry way. The registrations would be starting in a few hours, but they wanted to get it done with. However, they ran into a problem. Haven't we crossed this path before? Naruto spoke. We might have been walking into circles for the last ten minutes, Izumi replied uncaringly. But this is what the address pointed to. We should be there by now, Tenzo said. All of them stopped walking and concentrated on their surroundings. The area was definitely the same. There was no doubt about it. It can't be possible, unless, Sharingan. Izumi activated her Sharingan, and the surroundings started to disintegrate in her vision, changing into something different. So, a Genjutsu. Follow me, both of you. Naruto and Tenzo shared a look as she started to walk towards a wall. Surprisingly, she didn't hit her forehead, as Naruto suspected, she just walked through it. A Genjutsu. But the exam hasn't even started yet, Naruto said as both the boys followed her into the wall. The other side of the wall was a room, with plenty of Chunin exam participants already present. As soon as they entered, they were subjected to the combined attention of everyone present. It wasn't necessarily a nice feeling, considering the hostility oozing from their very being, especially the team from Iwa. Standing in the opposite corner with her team, Yugito crossed her arms and analyzed the newcomers, the sign on their Hite 8. Konoha, but they are just brats, are they mocking us? A scowl appeared on her face as she met the gaze of the raven-haired girl. She was probably around ten years old, the youngest on her team. But she walked with the confidence of a grown woman. She held her gaze for a while before looking away, clicking her tongue. Great, I'll have to murder children now, TCH. Izumi kept looking in her direction with her brow raised before shrugging and turning to her teammates. I don't think that blonde girl likes me at all. What gave it away? The not so subtle killing intent that she's directing at us? Naruto remarked. I miss the times when you didn't know what sarcasm was. I was naive, but I have to thank you for that. After all, I picked it up from you. Oh my, I feel so honored, she spoke with grace. See? Can you two stop your lover's quarrel? It is attracting attention, Tenzo interrupted. I do not like him, her at all. They spoke simultaneously, a slight blush on their faces. Could have fooled me, Tenzo said dryly. You're a very foolish person. It's not very hard to fool you, Naruto snuck the last comment. Suddenly, there was a loud sound, and a stage appeared out of smoke. It had obnoxious flickering lights and giant speakers. A large man jumped on the stage, and there was a collective sound of groaning and face palming from the Kumo teams. The man flipped a mic in his hand and started to rap terribly. He was a muscular, dark skinned man with blonde hair, wearing oval shaped glasses. Fool, ya fool. It is me, Lord Killer B. Your proctor for rounds one to three, we, oui. he made a sign with his hand, raising it up. There was a silence as everyone stopped to process his words. Is this guy for real? Izumi deadpanned. I can do Betty, Naruto started. Izumi pulled his ear, prompting him to stop. I have no doubt you can. However, I will fry you with my slowest fire jutsu if you even try it. Her tone was monotonous as she stared at him with dull eyes. Okay. Okay. Let my ear go now. Naruto stared at her strangely as he massaged his throbbing ear. Sheesh, you used to be so sweet. What happened to you? Izumi looked at him with a questioning stare. Do you really not know? Naruto understood that look and promptly shut up. Killer B started to speak again, making gestures with his hands as he went. Let's start round one, without any trap. But before that, hear my rap. Iron Claw. The audience gaped as they saw the large rapper sent crashing through a wall by the rakage himself. B, you fool. Get to the point. I shouted. A muffled voice was sound as B made his way out of the debris. Sorry, bro got carried away, yo, shut up, B. I turned towards the potential Chunin candidates. My idiot brother aside, congrats on making your way here. Those who were the lowest of the trash were weeded out by the Genjutsu. But the real exam begins now. There was a loud cheer as the Reikage announced. Kumo is known for its strength and power, which is the greatest out of the five nations. He started smugly. The first round will test your strength of will. One of your team members will be sent to another team as a prisoner. They will be given a password, and their limbs will be bound. The two people left will interrogate the prisoner and obtain the password. 
Your team should have both the passwords with you for you to pass this round. Use any means necessary, as long as the effects aren't permanent, he spoke harshly. There was a tense silence as the candidates digested this information. It was going to be a tough first round for sure. They were taken to a large room consisting of a significant amount of Kumo Shinobi. All of them had a black box in their hands as they stood in a line. The box has three slips. The two of them are similar, while the third one is different. Whosoever picks the odd slip has to be the prisoner. Get on with it. I shouted. He was a fool for believing that his brother could proctor the exams. It was probably for the best to banish him from the stage altogether, HMPH. I saw the Konoha Genin and rose a brow. What is that old monkey playing at? The three of them are just brats. This is an insult. He gritted his teeth. Soon, each team picked their slips. Naruto, Izumi, and Tenzo looked at theirs. Is it all right for her to be the prisoner? She is the youngest of us aft. Naruto covered Tenzo's mouth with his hands as he looked at Izumi, who was staring at Tenzo with a subtly hostile gaze. She looked at Naruto and nodded confidently. Let's get this over with. You can count on us. He gave her a thumbs up, still not letting go of Tenzo. He watched as Izumi made her way to get her password from Akumo Janin and then let go of Tenzo, who looked at him with betrayal. What was that for? She's even younger than you. What if they do something? She's more than capable of handling any genin. Have some faith, you don't have to worry about her. He didn't look convinced but nodded reluctantly. Izumi took her password and allowed them to take her to a room, where she was bounded to a wooden chair. She was left alone as she looked around the room. It was small, with white walls and no windows. There was a steel door that looked reasonably old and a small table in front of her. The ceiling was bland, just like the walls. Overall, it looked like a proper interrogation chamber. She looked up when she heard the door click open. Two people came into view as she studied them. Two boys, probably around their late teens. One of them had curly brown hair and was quite tall. The other had straight black hair and was slightly on the shorter side. Their Hite 8 had the sign of Kusa. The two of them noticed the bound girl, looking at them with an apathetic gaze before they shared a look and burst into laughter. I it's a little girl. The brown-haired teen spoke between guffaws. It took them a while to calm down, but they couldn't see the almost invisible nerve throbbing on her forehead. She didn't like to be underestimated. This will be almost too easy, eh? The black-haired teen spoke after calming down. Yeah. Even if she is quite young, I can see that she will be a beauty when she grows up. Izumi closed her eyes, they took it as a sign that she was scared. True. Although, he leaned closer, a sickly smile on his face, I wouldn't mind taking a peek, what do you say? Both of them shared a grin before they looked at the girl as she started speaking. You, she slowly opened her eyes, and the world stopped for the two genin. Disgust me. Red eyes stared into their very soul projecting horrifying visuals deep into their psyche. Wah wait. Stop. We weren't gonna do anything. Their horrible screams echoed across the corridors. Oi, Tenzo. My name is Kino. So Tenzo, Tenzo, Kino contemplated on murder, but Danzo-sama would not like that. Do you know any other interrogation techniques? I don't think my tickle attack is working in our favor. They have been trying to get their prisoner to give up her password. Akunoichi from a Megacure probably in her late teens. She had tears in her eyes from laughing so much. Naruto wasn't familiar with any interrogation tactics, so all he could do was tickle her into submission. But that wasn't working very well. Ha! Huh. Is that all you got, you brats? Grow some balls and start the real torture already. She tempted them, but inwardly she was very relieved. She got some inexperienced kids, who probably didn't even make their first kill yet. She grinned. It looks like Konoha weren't as big as they once were. I have one, but it is very dangerous, he spoke lowly, it can have serious consequences if not executed properly. Naruto gulped. Whatever it was, Tenzo made it sound like a horrifying technique. He didn't want to be a part of it. Well, it seems like this is our only hope, he nodded somberly. Do what you have to. With that, he gave a shoulder pat to Tenzo and moved out of the room. The Kunoichi was scared now. She was only tempting them because she was sure that they wouldn't go past tickling. But now. Wah wait. What are you doing? She looked around frantically. Don't tell me, you're after my beautiful body. There was a silence as Tenzo stared at her with half-lidded eyes. 
He put his hand inside of his hip pouch. You overestimate yourself, his voice was grave. Suddenly, the lights in the room went off, and she panicked. There was a sound of thunder. Tenzo pulled out something from his pouch. It was a torch. He lit it up under his face and looked at her with big, unblinking brown eyes. Tell me what I want to know. Her screams were drowned in the thunder. What did you do to her? The girl was sprawled on the chair, unconscious and frothing from her mouth. He was curious about the kind of technique that could do this. Who knew Tenzo had such a diverse arsenal of techniques? The less you know, the better. I think I believe you. The time limit was finally over, and all the team members were united. The pool of candidates was shrunk to less than a quarter of its previous size. Tenzo noticed Izumi making her way towards them and sighed in relief. She made it. He shook his head. I was afraid she was going to give up since she's the Yunao. What was that for? Tenzo massaged his right foot, which was stomped on by Naruto. I told you not to speak about her like that if you don't want to be the subject of her ire, he whispered, she's very stubborn with stuff like that. You know an awful lot about her, he spoke with squinted eyes, his foot forgotten for now. Are you sure you two are only friends, not ouch? What now? I, slipped. Izumi acted like she didn't just stomp on his other foot. Tenzo looked at her strangely. You don't stomp on someone's foot when you slip, he mumbled bitterly but was ignored by the two. There was a loud sound and a cloud of smoke. A familiar stage came into view from within the smoke, and an outline of a person could be made. There was a collective sound of groaning and face palming all around the room this time. Killer B the Great is back, had to eat some snack, yeah. He started making gestures with his hands. Congrats on passing the round first, but now get serious, or you'll be left in the dust. Izumi ignored the drama and looked at Naruto. She had noticed something earlier but didn't get the chance to ask him. He had something strapped on his back. When did you learn to use a tanto? Naruto touched the sheath as he spoke. I have been training with Shisui Senpei and one of the elders. Shisui uses a tanto as well, so I asked him if I could get some help with it. He grinned. He helped me in making my own techniques with it. Shisui, I can understand. But an elder, she raised a brow and trailed off expectantly. Ah, he scratched the back of his head, Shimura Danzo, he's helping me with my specialty. Izumi looked at him intensely for a moment before turning her head in front. Whatever you do, do not trust that man. She shook her head. If my father finds out that you are meeting with him, he won't be too happy. Naruto spoke nervously, you won't tell him, right? It was supposed to be a secret, but I thought you should know. I don't like him much either. You thought well. She didn't answer his question. They were interrupted when the rakage made his entrance again. Iron Claw. We, B, you fool. I banished you from the exams. Who let you in? I came for my own curiosity, but I was allowed in by the security. B picked himself up from the rubble of the wall that he just crashed into. I grunted and looked at the audience. Good work in the first round, but the exams have just begun. Do not celebrate just yet. There was a loud cheer from the Kumo teams as they hyped their rakage up. I grunted in approval. For the next round, you will have to climb to the top of the Hill of Chill, the tallest mountain in Kumo, having deadly snowstorms all around the year. It is very likely that some of you may die, so we will have you sign these waivers, according to which your villages cannot blame us when any of you die. He showed a bundle of papers in his hands. The rest of the rules will be shared just before the exam starts. Get on with it. Naruto, Tenzo, and Izumi looked at each other and nodded determinedly. Let's do this. The hill was not as steep as some may have imagined it to be. It was, however, just as dangerous as they feared. Perhaps even more. The remaining teams stood at the base, each member signing their consent forms. The rules were already announced for the second round. All the teams will be given a flag of the color red or blue. The teams that manage to climb to the hill's summit carrying both the flags within the one-day time limit will be allowed to move to the final rounds. Since they did not have any warm clothes, the three of them chose to wear their traveling cloaks and packed their bento lunchboxes. I just hope we don't end up freezing to death, Naruto mumbled to no one. Oh no, Izumi replied blandly, do you require my cloak as well? Come on, I was just saying, Izumi raised her brow, and an amused smile crept to her face. And you thought I was being serious? Naruto deadpanned. She was trying so hard to get under his skin. And the thing he was most irritated about was that it was working. 
Let's focus on the literally freezing hill, that we have to somehow climb under a day's time. Your petty arguments can wait, Tenzo interrupted them. Who made you the captain? Since I'm clearly the most mature and responsible member of the team, I elected myself. Whatever, Izumi said, it doesn't matter as long as we pass this one. I guess, Naruto grumbled. A blonde haired girl was watching the two of them bicker with cold, blue eyes. She sincerely doubted the three of them were going to come out of this alive, but she had little pity for them. She was more worried about her friend Yugito, who would be the one to kill them. Man, a lazy voice sounded, this might be dull, but leave the Konoha team to Yugito. There's no way she's going to lose to three kids. Cool. She massaged her shoulder as she spoke in a monotonous voice. Darui's right, their third teammate, a blonde haired boy, said, just focus on getting the other flag. This one should be easy for us since we've already used this place for training. Darui leaned against a tree and watched with half lidded eyes but did not speak again. They snapped to attention on hearing the siren and the announcement and went to their assigned gate. Round 2 starts now. Scared ones can still bow. Once the round begins, you can't chicken fools. Suffice to say, no one chickened out. Tenzo looked at his teammates and said, I'll take point. Both of them nodded, not seeing any fault in letting him. Let's go. Natsumi strolled down the street with a skip in her step, taking in the sights of the bustling marketplace. It wasn't often that she left her apartment alone, but considering that Naruto wasn't in the village anymore, it was the only thing she could do if she had to buy something. It has been a few days since he left, but she didn't know what for. She has only known him for a few months, and all he did was train, almost as if he was preparing for something. Oftentimes she would knock on his door, but found it to be empty. Natsumi puffed her cheeks. She didn't like how he didn't tell her about it before he left. She found a note on his door saying he would be out of the village for a month or so. It hurt her somewhat that her only friend would not tell her personally. Her life had taken a turn for the better in the past few months. No annoying bullies, no dumb orphanage ladies, she even got people who are friendly to her. She grinned toothily. It felt nice, she decided, to not be looked on as a pest or an annoyance. Old man Hokage was super cool in her books. He was strong, kind, and respected by everyone. He even told her that she could become Hokage if she works hard instead of outright denying her. She has been visiting the old man in his office since the day they met. It wasn't challenging, especially when the Hokage tower was so close to her apartment. He even treated her to ramen a couple of times. She patted her tummy in fond remembrance. Ichiraku ramen was something of a second home to her now. Old man Tucci even gave her special discounts, partly because she eats an absurd amount of ramen. Tasty, tasty miso ramen. Her stomach made a noise, she looked disappointedly at her tummy. Aw oh man, now I'm hungry. She abruptly turned around, eyes intensely scanning the corner of the street. She could have sworn she felt that someone was following her. However, when she didn't notice anything amiss, she shrugged and resumed her walk chalking it up to her imagination. Two people sighed in relief. My lady, this feels awfully like stalking, a childish voice said with noticeable hesitance, this is unbecoming of a lady of your stature. Not at all, another voice said pleasantly, this is just a careful observation. Or are you questioning my judgment? The voice was colder this time. And no, not at all, the first voice spluttered, my apologies. Hum. Natsumi felt the coins in her toad-faced wallet, Gama-chan, something she found lying on her table a month ago, not suspicious at all. She had enough money to last this month, and then some. The stipend kept her from starving. She quickened her pace and rushed to the grocery store, a small shop near her apartment, ignoring the people that were now giving her a wide berth and eyeing her cautiously. Natsumi opened the door and peeked in. Not finding the owner of the shop, she made her way inside. Humming, she skimmed over the vegetables and fruits. She would eat ramen three times a day if it were up to her, but after a rather unfortunate scolding from Naruto, she had to agree reluctantly to eat her vegetables. She was going to become the next Hokage, after all, as soon as the old man retires, and a Hokage shouldn't just eat ramen. There was a rustle and the sound of opening a door. She looked back just in time to almost get a broom shoved into her face, she fell on her backside. You little thief. A rough voice shouted, I knew I should have never let you in. Shoo, shoo. Her heart hammered in her chest as she saw the man walking up to her, holding his broom like a sword, probably to chase her away. 
she stood up hurriedly and scrambled to the door to get as far as possible. However, the door slammed open before she could make it, showing the silhouettes of two people. She couldn't make out their faces as she had to cover her eyes from the sun's glare, but the two were probably around her age from what she could make of their height. The man went pale on seeing the two, dropping his broom with a rattle. Two pairs of cold white eyes pierced him with an apathetic gaze. Natsumi watched in surprise as the man who was about to chase her out bowed as low as he could. Such a stark contrast from how he was acting just a moment ago. Who are these guys? The two walked in, and she saw them clearly. A girl with dark blue hair, around her age, and an older boy with black hair strode confidently towards the man, their whole aura screaming, nobles. The boy walked behind the girl, his hands folded in his sleeves. They stopped right in front of the still bowing man. She stared at his frame for a while before finally speaking. Such a shameless man, she shook her head disappointedly, do you perhaps feel more powerful now? More manly? Picking on a little girl? The man clenched his hands. Oh no, she covered her cheeks in mock terror, I, too, am a helpless little girl. Whatever could happen to me in this vile man's presence? You would protect me from this brute, Neji Nissan, won't you? Or, perhaps I should run away now, crying, to my father. She sighed in mock disappointment. He certainly would not be happy. It would be a shame if something were to happen to this little shop as you slept peacefully in the night, won't it? The man was sweating profusely by now, his knees shaking as he squinted his eyes shut, keeping his head down. Hyu Hyuga Sama, he let out shakily, please, this shop is all I have. My wife and kids will starve if something were to happen. He touched his forehead to the ground, almost sobbing. I beg your forgiveness. Hanada arched an eyebrow and tilted her head. My forgiveness. Why me? I'm not the weak little girl that you hit with a broom. The man looked at Natsumi, who had stood up a while ago and was watching this whole scenario in awe. He looked reluctant but still bowed, his teeth clenched as he said, I'm sorry. Natsumi's eyes widened in surprise. Hanada sama, this is enough. Neji spoke uneasily, he has clearly learned his lesson. Hanada turned around and locked eyes with him pale eyes staring unflinchingly into pale whites. Neji did not look away as he met her stubborn gaze. After what felt like an eternity, Hanada looked away finally, but reluctantly, as she conceded to her older brother. What a mess. She clicked her tongue. Fine, she turned on her heels and made her way to the door, Neji walking right behind her. Natsumi finally broke out of her trance, and something clicked in her mind. She stomped to the duo, with steel that she didn't know she had locking eyes with the strange girl. The shopkeeper and Neji gawked as she unexpectedly grabbed a fistful of Hanada's kimono right from her collar and got into her face. You jerk. I'm not a weak little girl. She headbutted her, and Hanada's head snapped back. Neji watched, horrified, too shocked to stop what was happening, his jaw hanging low. The shopkeeper jumped behind the counter, making himself as small as possible. Hanada slowly brought her head back to its place, she apathetically touched her forehead, feeling a little wet spot. Natsumi was too angered to notice what she just did on impulse. Hanada rubbed her bloody finger and a wicked smirk slowly formed on her face. So, you have a little spine after all. I think. Her smirk changed into a slight grin. I think I now know why Naruto-sama bothers with you at all. Natsumi faltered, letting go of her collar, and went horrified on noticing the blood on the girl's forehead. Oh no. Oh no! Oh no! The man cried pathetically in the background. You've doomed us all, you brat. I, I didn't mean to, Hanada sama, are you? She stopped him with a hand. I'm fine, dear brother. Our daily spars hurt more than this superficial wound. She turned towards a pale Natsumi, a serene smile on her face now. It looked pretty disturbing with her still bleeding forehead. I think we will get along well, Natsumi chan. The complete turnaround in her entire demeanor surprised her, but she noticed one small detail. She squinted her eyes suspiciously. Wait, how do you know my name? We've never met before. I don't even know you. Hanada and Neji stiffened slightly, almost unnoticeably. Natsumi narrowed her eyes further, looking intensely at the Hyuga heiress who was now avoiding her gaze. You've been stalking me, haven't? It was simply a careful observation, not stalking. The girl said heatedly, slightly embarrassed now. I am Hyuga Hanada, the heiress of the Hyuga clan. And this, she pointed to the boy, making him nod, is my brother, Hyuga Neji. 
I merely wanted to see why Naruto-sama bothered with a commoner. Naruto-sama. Of course, she said it like it was something beyond obvious, lifting up her nose, a strong and kind person like him deserves all the respect. Well, Naru, Hanada twitched. As kind, and he's always training, so I think he is strong as well. Do you see now? Her tone was serious, if a tad bit excited. I think, Natsumi cupped her chin as she spoke, she nodded sagely. I do, but I like nicknames, so. Hanada pursed her lips and sighed. Fine. Let's go now. The man passed out a while ago. She looked at her brother. Neji Nisan? Neji made his way to the man, lifting him up with some struggle and making him sit on the chair, if in a little compromising position. Wait I'm gonna go with you, but I still haven't bought my vegetables. It's not, not like I don't wanna, but, yeah, no. Breathe. Hanada placed her hands on the rambling girl's shoulders. Breathe, Natsumi. She took a deep breath and nodded, making Hanada smile. Let's go get your vegetables first, then. Three figures made their way, walking with their boots leaving deep imprints in the dirty white snow. The cold wind howled, hitting their faces, ruffling their cloaks. The sun was nowhere in sight, and it was getting tougher to keep walking against the slope. We should take a break. Wait until the strong winds pass. No, I can still go on. We're almost halfway there. Tenzo. A male voice said exasperatingly, you've been crawling for the last 15 minutes. We need to stop. Tenzo was so tired he didn't even correct his name. Izumi stopped suddenly, just by a tall tree. We'll camp here for an hour. Naruto? She gave him a look. Yeah, I know. He blurred through hand signs with a surprising speed, slamming his hands down on the snow. Earth style. Multiple mud walls. Four walls rose up to 15 feet from the ground entrapping and shielding them from the snowy winds. Naruto looked pointedly at Tenzo, who was now collapsed against the tree, panting. He nodded and brought his hands together, forming small sticks of wood from his arms. The snowstorm should give us enough cover. Izumi, light up the wood. I thought I was supposed to be the leader? You're in no shape to lead, great leader. Tenzo grumbled something but did not speak again. Izumi arranged the wood and lit it up with a small fire jutsu. The three of them leaned against the tree, enjoying the warmth of the fire. They stayed in comfortable silence, listening to the crackling of the campfire. It was a pleasant break from the fast-paced days of the exam. Do you ever think about your dreams? Izumi spoke softly, still looking at the fire. Naruto looked at her, surprised. Your reason for living, your ultimate goal. Something that, once accomplished, you could die without any regrets. There was a silence. Do you have anything like that, Naruto? Naruto didn't say anything for a while. He just kept his gaze on the campfire, and Izumi thought he had ignored her. He finally looked up. Do you? She blinked when she realized that he asked her the same question. It was almost as if he was avoiding answering her question. I wish to change the system of Shinobi. To free ourselves from the curse that is war. I doubt I will succeed, she looked away, her teeth clenched, but I don't want my brother to grow up in a war-torn world sent out at an early age to fight like us for his life, used as a pawn in the games of the leaders. They were drowned in silence once again, only the fires crackling and Tenzo snoring making some noise. Naruto looked at his first friend, the one he would do anything for. He has never seen her look so hopeless before. It brought a painful feeling to his chest. He stood up suddenly, alarming Izumi and making Tenzo fall, who was leaning on his shoulder as he snoozed. You won't fail. He spoke calmly, with absolute confidence. He turned to face her with a gentle smile. Because you won't be alone. Even if, somehow, the world turns against you, I'll always be your friend. Her eyes widened, and she looked away to hide the surprised look on her face, though it wasn't possible to mask the tint of pink moving over the bridge of her nose. There was a sound of muffled snickering, which turned to full-blown laughter as Tenzo physically struggled to stay quiet. It was just too much for him. However, he sensed an aura of doom and had to stop. Almost mechanically, he looked back and paled. Now, he was proud to admit that there weren't many things that scared him. He trained with a scary man himself, after all. So he liked to believe that he was somewhat desensitized to fear. But this. Blood-red eyes glared at him with intent to kill. Three Tomo spinning sinisterly. Die. He would vehemently deny when accused of shrieking in the future, whenever this moment would be brought up. 
Three figures watched the walls of stone from a distance. The storm had passed a few minutes ago. Are they stupid? This will only make them stand out. Are we even tailing the correct targets? Yugito looked annoyingly at her two younger teammates. She had been tasked with carrying them to the next round, and they couldn't be more frustrating. Quiet down. She snapped at them, making them comply immediately. They are my targets, and this is my mission. You two only have to guard our flag, nothing more. She looked over to the walls. Yugito had been tailing them with her team, in the snowstorm ever since she found them. At first, she was reluctant to do it but then hardened herself. The Konoha Genin would have been dead by now if not for this storm, making her delay her plans. It is fortunate that we found them here. Should be easy to destroy the walls and let them suffocate within the snow, she spoke emotionlessly. Her two teammates, a black-haired boy, and a brown-haired girl, both in their early teens, turned a little green at the mention. F fine, we'll wait for you. Yugito nodded, and she started running, circling the walls until she was at the opposite end of her team. She firmly set her feet apart in the snowy ground, her gaze cold, and started running through hand seals. Fire style. Mouse hairball. She spat something from her mouth, which transformed into blue flaming balls of hair that looked like mice. They continued to split before making their way to the walls, slamming against them with a large explosion, forming a violent cloud of snow. She shielded her face from the impact with her arm as her blonde hair billowed behind her. Good, that should take care of them. She allowed a sad frown on her face as she clapped her hands to pray for the recently dead. She was truly sad for them and wished them a peaceful afterlife, away from the miserable world of the shinobi. A world where you had to follow your orders down to the T, even if you absolutely despised said orders. A world she wished to reject with every day she woke up. However, something in the cloud of snow got her attention as she made her way to the site. There were no bodies or blood now that she looked at it. Well, and there was a big hole in the snow, shit. The three little shits played her for a fool. Somehow, they knew that they were being followed. This wasn't good. Where could they go now? A scream of terror alerted her to their position. It was the familiar voice of her teammates. She cursed again and ran as fast as she could. Her mood soured when she realized the only way she was ever going to catch up to them was by using that. The three of them made their way against the snow their speed doubled after the much-needed break. It was fortunate that the only team we ran into had the flag we needed, Tenzo said. Yeah. I may not like Danzo, but his training certainly paid off. He had to give it to the crippled man. Danzo knew what he was doing when he said that he was going to teach him. His sensory skills were enormously better than when he first began training. He could make out that they were being followed sometime before they stopped to rest. The only reason they stopped at all was because of the snowstorm. He was pretty sure that the chances of them getting attacked were minuscule in that weather. It was clever of you to use the mole technique to escape, Izumi complimented. She was undoubtedly surprised by all the new jutsu that he managed to learn in the past few months. Yeah. Shisui Senpei knows a lot of jutsu, even if he cannot use a large number of them, he taught me some of them. However, cannot was the wrong term here. Shisui simply didn't attempt them because of their high cost on his chakra levels, as he was not well versed in earth and water styles. Naruto sighed in annoyance. We're being followed, again. Should we stay and fight, or flee? How many of them? Naruto knelt down on the ground, pressing his index finger against the snowy ground as he closed his eyes to concentrate. Just one. It should be better to fight, then, Tenzo supplied helpfully. It is either some idiot who thinks that we're easy meat or. Someone powerful enough to fight us all at once, Izumi concluded grimly. They stopped walking just in time to notice something truly bizarre. Is that steam? Something is heating the snow too fast for it to stay in its liquid form, he narrowed his eyes, making out a quickly moving figure in front of them. Or rather, someone. Tenzo's eyes widened as he shouted, duck. The three of them dropped down just in time to avoid a red blur that moved with unreal speed, which would have hacked their heads off if they were even a second slower. Naruto got up as he felt his heart beat faster and saw a sight that made him feel uneasy. What? Is that? His shock was mirrored by Izumi and Tenzo, albeit for different reasons. Tenzo tensed his whole body in trepidation and felt his mouth get dry. He spoke grimly, a jinchuriki, a human sacrifice. The ominous words hung in the tense air as the red figure eyed them intensely. Three kids sat on a bench in the park, 
away from the other children. The afternoon sun bathed the tree leaves in its warm light. They could hear the other kids shout as they played ninja amongst themselves, a brash sounding boy with markings down his cheeks being the loudest. You shouldn't, they been so rude to the man, she let out hesitantly before quickly adding, not to say I'm not grateful or anything, ya, yeah, no. Hanada giggled gently. It still surprised her when she compared this girl to the one who bullied that shopkeeper. It was almost as if she had a switch that flipped her personality every time it was triggered. Natsumi licked her popsicle, her bag of groceries lying forgotten beside her on the bench. It is all right. I do not mind at all. She shook her head. My father says that I have a short temper, and I cannot help it when something angers me. Her Byakugan activated unconsciously, making Natsumi shift uneasily in her spot. But enough about that. Tell me more about Naruto-sama. There it was again. Her, kind and gentle, persona, albeit a bit more excited now that she was talking about the object of her interests. Natsumi was getting annoyed by this girl's weird fixation on her friend. I dunno a lot. I've only been friends with him for a few months. And then too, he was mostly out training so I don't know much. She shook her head helplessly. Such a shame, Hanada let out, clicking her tongue. I thought that maybe you would know something. But I was disappointed. She shook her head in mock sadness. Neji, who was silently eating his own popsicle, shifted uncomfortably. He knew his cousin could be very manipulative, even guilt tripping the clan head on some occasions. He didn't know if it was something he should be proud of or worried about. Natsumi scrunched her nose, squinting her eyes and tilting her head as she thought hard. Hanada tried to be discreet while looking at her from her peripheral vision. Suddenly, she snapped her fingers, almost alarming Neji so much that he dropped his popsicle. He cast a disapproving frown at her, which the now excited girl ignored. I know. She jumped from her place onto the ground. He likes ramen. That was how I met him. He likes ramen. Hanada mulled over it for a while before an excited smile formed on her face. Excellent. She took Natsumi's hands in hers, ignoring her personal space completely, and shook them. This has been a very informative day for me. You have my thanks. She laughed nervously, feeling somewhat embarrassed now. It's nothing. You were the one who helped me earlier. You're kinda cool for a bully. Hanada's smile became slightly forced, and her eyebrow twitched. She has no idea she just insulted me, does she? The three of them stopped, hearing the sound of footsteps as someone came into their field of view. An older man, in his middle age, with eyes similar to the two children and long dark hair reaching to his waist. Hanada sama, Neji sama, Hiyashi sama wishes your presence in the manor, the man spoke respectfully. Neji abruptly threw his popsicle behind him. It would tarnish his budding reputation as the perfect Hayuga. He has never seen Hiyashi sama or his father eating a popsicle. The man swept his gaze across the third member, and his eyes darkened slightly, his jaw tense. This. Is there a problem, my dear Ko? There was a subtle threat in her tone that was not lost on the now named Ko. Her Byagukan certainly didn't look very gentle. And no. Great. She chirped. Let us not make father wait any longer. I will see you later, new friend. She emphasized the last word, still staring at Ko. It was a statement that she would be taking offense on her behalf. It also served as a warning. Natsumi watched the trio leave, blinking owlishly. Reality finally set in. She made another friend. Her mood escalated as a joyous smile appeared on her face. She blatantly ignored that her new friend was something of a bully. At least, she was nice to her. And the only times she bullied someone was when they did something terrible, so she couldn't be too bad. Right. She made her way back to her apartment as the sun set in a brilliant glow of red and orange, illuminating the tree leaves with its retreating light. She had a big smile on her face and a light skip in her step as she walked, swaying her bag of groceries and ignoring the stairs yet again, but it didn't discourage her anymore. She made a new friend. The three of them eyed the red figure warily, looking for any sudden movements. Naruto felt a primal fear in its presence, but he shoved the feeling down. Getting scared won't help them survive. A Jinchuriki. Tenzo looked from the corner of his eye and silently debated on whether to tell him or not. If they had to survive, then lack of information certainly wouldn't help, he concluded. It is what the name says. A human sacrifice, he explained grimly. A child who was sacrificed at its birth to contain a tailed beast within itself. They are the greatest weapons of a hidden village, but are usually despised by the people for what they contain. 
Naruto felt a sick feeling in his stomach as he kept listening. His mind was piecing together a twisted picture, but he kept denying it. Then. His lips were dry all of a sudden. Then the Kyubi. Tenzo gave a solemn nod. The only reason why he knew about this was because he was basically raised within the root. No other genin should have this kind of knowledge. Naruto felt an intense urge to punch the Yandaimi, somehow. Kumo has two of the nine-tailed beasts in its possession. The Hachibi is contained within the crazy proctor. So this is most probably the Nibi container. They could hear the hissing sound of snow being vaporized as the malevolent chakra of the figure clashed against it. It was yet to move, silently watching the three of them with a predatory gaze. Izumi recollected herself. She had heard the term in passing in her clan grounds but didn't put much thought into it. How do we defeat it? It won't be easy, Tenzo murmured as he studied the figure, but I have a plan. Two sets of ears listened attentively as he spoke. Yugido struggled to think coherently. Her thoughts jumbled. Transforming into her unstable cloak form had been a gamble, but she had no alternatives. Because even if the rakage had sounded it like it was optional, she knew it wouldn't be good for her well-being if she failed. Kumo respected strength, after all and losing to three brats younger than you was not a show of strength. She could make out three blobs in front of her, but everything was hazy, almost as if she were drunk. The silent whispers of lust and power didn't exactly help her condition. It took all she had to not lose control to this overflowing power. Let go. You know you want to, the voice purred inside of her head. I will kill the three of them for you. I'm your only friend here, after all. Would you not agree? Shut up. I have friends who care for me. There was a burst of mocking laughter that echoed inside her head, making her grab her forehead painfully. You are so delusional, kitty cat. Fine, be that way. Yugito finally relaxed, now that the voice was gone. She had not made much progress with her tailed beast, unlike Killer Bee. It always brought a sense of shame with it. A jinchuriki that can't even control its tailed beast? It made her feel useless. She sensed something flying towards her with incredible speed and raised her transformed hand to block it. Shuriken were useless against her in this form. She opened her mouth, taking a gulp of air, and shot small but dense balls of chakra at one of them, the girl, who dodged them with incredible flexibility, adding to her frustration. The chakra balls connected with a tree, destroying it with a single hit. She turned around and hacked at the boy, who tried to sneak up on her. Yugito watched in satisfaction as she felt the hit connect, her claws digging deep into his outstretched hand. The boy screamed, and she felt euphoria in her crazed state, listening to his scream that was so pleasant to her ears. Naruto. A distressed cry rang into her ears. She let the boy go and twisted her frame to dodge a swipe of Kanai, even if she didn't need to. A reflex action. As she bent, she met angry red eyes, which glared at her with rage unbefitting of a child. The three of them disconnected, making some distance between themselves. Yugito saw the girl looking over to the blonde-haired boy, who gripped his forearm, probably throbbing with intense pain. The chakra of a jinchuriki was not a pleasant thing. You must understand. She finally had enough control to speak. She spoke in a deranged voice, heavy and grim. This is not what I wish for, but it is something that I must do. I'm only a pawn, following orders. Her voice turned bitter and sad as she spoke. Her opponents didn't react to her words, but she didn't bother. Yugito tensed her legs and jumped towards them with unreal speed, swinging her clawed hands down in an arc. However, she was shocked when she felt no resistance. The image in front of her blurred and vanished, a genjutsu. She gave an incredible burst of chakra, probably alerting all the nearby teams, but she didn't care. She looked around wildly, not noticing her targets. Yugito's eyes widened, and she dropped flat on the ground snow hissing from the contact. A pair of giant shuriken flying over her head. But she still couldn't see those brats. The shuriken were not enough to stop her. What were those kids planning? She found out when a giant ball of fire was thrown towards her. But before she could dodge, she noticed the walls surrounding her, almost closing on her from the three sides. A small amount of panic crept to her senses. How did the boy get behind her? She didn't see those shuriken. He must have transformed himself. She clicked her tongue and jumped towards the only opening right into the ball of fire. Yugito felt an intense heat, but it was nothing her chakra cloak couldn't handle. She was getting really annoyed now. However, she was surprised when she found out she couldn't move anymore. 
it was as if her body refused the orders from her brain. She looked up to see blood-red eyes and felt her stomach twist painfully. Something crept up to her neck, circling it. She noticed the team's third member from the corner of her eyes, his hand in a weird praying position. Shit. I totally forgot about him. She cursed her foolishness and tried to break free to no avail. Her strength started to leave her body, and her chakra cloak disappeared. Yugito finally succumbed to sweet darkness, and for once, she didn't hear the mocking voice in her head. Tenzo panted lightly as he let his jutsu drop, the blonde girl dropping on the ground like a sack of potatoes, unconscious. He wasn't very proficient with stopping Jinchuriki as of yet, but it had worked. They had to trap the Jinchuriki in a genjutsu, but it had worked. That doesn't mean they got out unscathed. That wasn't very smart of you, Izumi chided lightly. He shouldn't have gotten so close to the Jinchuriki. But then, it was their first encounter with a Jinchuriki, so she couldn't blame him. It wasn't, Naruto accepted quietly, still gripping his bleeding hand. His arm felt like it was on fire. This was surely going to leave a scar. Naruto tore a piece from his cloak and was going to wind it around his wound when he felt a small hand grab his arm. He looked up to meet the deadpan eyes of his teammate and friend. Do you wish for the wound to get infected? Your cloak is filthy. He hadn't thought of that. So what? He wasn't a medic. How is he supposed to know this stuff? Even non-medics know not to use dirty cloth for dressing wounds. He looked away, not acknowledging that she could perfectly guess his thoughts. He could somehow feel her smugness. Here. Naruto looked up and saw Izumi with a white handkerchief in her hands. His eyes widened as he slowly inched her hand towards it. Until he found himself drenched in water. You forgot to wash it. Tenzo's teasing tone was not lost on him. He dropped on his knees and hands, shaking apparently due to the cold water. Tenzo grew wary, and Izumi eyed him with some concern, right before the both of them found two balls of snow thrown right at their faces. Naruto grinned. His wounds can wait. Congrats on passing, you made it past round two I'd look at the rest of the teams, if I were you. There was a collective groan from the three teams that made it to the summit. They were in a large stadium at the top of the hill. One team from each of the three main villages that participated was present. Iwa, Kumo, and Konoha. The third round is a three-way, teams against teams the winning team will be held in high esteem yeah. There was a silence as the nine genin watched Killer B getting politely escorted out of the stage. A blonde-haired girl in the Kumo team warily eyed the trio from Konoha. If they made it here, where was Yugito? Did she fail? Yugito was almost on the level of a seasoned Jonin. That must mean the brats are tougher than they looked. She looked at her teammates and saw the same expression. This is not cool, it would be a tense finals for sure. Cold. That was the first thing she felt as she slowly crawled back to her consciousness. It was too damn cold. She hated cold. What was she doing here? How did she even end up in a place like this? When she should be in her apartment, snuggling in her warm bed. She got her answer as her mind restarted. Apparently, being buried in the snow was not good for one's body and mind. She clenched her eyes shut as she remembered how she ended up here. She had been defeated. Badly. That, too, by opponents younger than herself. Shame filled her. How was she going to prove her worth now? Rakage Sama was surely going to reprimand, humiliate, and degrade her. She had failed both her missions. Tears welled up in her eyes, but she sucked them in. This was not the time to wallow in self pity. She had. She opened her eyes when she became aware of someone's presence near her. But she was too stiff to move, let alone escape. She didn't want to use that chakra so soon. She panicked even more when she realized who it was. Yugito. The burly man looked at her with an unreadable expression as his white howry ruffled with the cold wind. Yugito's breathing quickened. You failed, he stated bluntly, further adding to her panic. She struggled to speak, but her voice felt like it was stuck in her throat. In the end, she squeaked out an apology, but it was too quiet. I grunted. What's done is done, never mind it. You'll get your punishment after the exams, he spoke, stern but not unkind. Get up for now. She was going to be punished, just as she thought. Yugito tried to clench her fists in the snow, but her hands were completely numb. I said. Get up. The rakage snapped. She struggled to get up, slipping a few times, before finally standing up on shaky legs. All the while, I watched her with his hands crossed, 
a scowl on his face. She stood up with only a slight slouch, looking at her leader for orders. When he just motioned with his head for her to move, she started walking down the hill, hugging her sides. She was not worried for her teammates. The two of them were further down the mountain. They probably panicked when they couldn't find her, but it was weird for the rakage himself to come for her. All the more reason for her to be worried. She stopped and blinked in surprise when she felt a sudden warmth encompassing her and looked up. I was pointedly looking away from her, his white howry suspiciously missing. The brawny man didn't even shiver when he started to walk sedately in front of her. Yugito watched her leader go, and her lips twitched into a small smile. Sometimes she forgot that behind the tough exterior was a man who genuinely cares for his people. It was the reason why she was so afraid to disappoint him, rather than her fear of any punishment. Do I have to repeat myself? He asked when she didn't move. She tugged on the white cloth draped around her before catching up with her leader. The rakage would never openly admit his concern, however. He would never tell anyone that it broke his heart when he saw one of his most confident and fierce kunoichi reduced to a shivering mess. After all, he was supposed to be the pillar to lean on for his people, not the other way around. So, one week, huh? Naruto hummed in response as he tugged at the bandages on his left hand. The pain was reduced to a dull throb after he had the medics check on his arm. It could have been worse, he mused, if his hand was exposed to the corrosive chakra for any longer. His hand would be fine with time, with the only thing left being an ugly scar. Once Killer B was escorted out of the stage, another Kumo Proctor took his place, explaining the rules for the third round. They were given a week's time to rest between the second and third rounds. During this period, many foreign dignitaries, daimyos, village leaders, and other influential people would be arriving in the village of Kumogakure. I don't know about you too, but my body yearns for the hot water springs of Kumo, Tenzo spoke out loud as he rolled his shoulder, making Naruto roll his eyes. Izumi didn't bat an eye as she sat by the window, gazing outside. It's just hot springs. What? Do you think Danzo Sama lets me out of the root base for soaking in a hot water bath? Tenzo shook his head before flashing a mischievous grin. No and I ought to take advantage of the fact that he's not here. Well then, don't let us stop you, Naruto replied blandly. What? You're coming as well. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. What are you, psychic? I told you I don't want to. Tenzo stared at the back of his head as he contemplated on something. He fished into his pocket and took out his wallet biting his lip as he counted the money, before sighing miserably. I'll pay. Now you're talking. Naruto stood up excitedly, without a pause, making Tenzo look at him unbelievably. Let's go. Kakashi, who was silently reading his book in the corner till now, stood up too. Wait, where are you going? Tenzo inquired suspiciously. Why, to the hot springs, of course, he replied easily. Awfully nice of you to pay for all of us. Tenzo bristled. I didn't mean to pay for you. All you did was read that stupid book of yours. He looked at the young adult bewilderedly. How are you even tired? Kakashi snapped his book shut before giving Tenzo an innocent smile. Well, I did my own work here. You're not supposed to know about it, Jen and Chan, he said pleasantly, patting Tenzo's head, who looked entirely unimpressed. His shoulders sagged a bit. The 14-year-old shrugged lightly before looking at the last member of their team, who was yet to move you might come as well. When all he got in reply was a dull stare, he added, they have separate baths for men and women. I should know. Their first day in Kumo, that was all he did, scouting hot springs around the village. It was a pity he managed to infiltrate the women's section, unintentionally, he had claimed desperately. It wasn't enough, however, to stop the beatdown that had commenced. Azumi's lips twitched into a small smile before she dropped down and made her way out of the room. That was nice of you, Tenzo. I'll be sure to repay the favor someday, she spoke before she was out. Well, you can start now by calling me by my real name, he grumbled but was not surprised when she ignored him. At least, it was not something insulting, he would let it slide, for now. It could have been much worse. That insufferable pervert is back again. Looks like he hadn't had enough. Much, much worse. In the world of Shinobi, knowledge is considered a great power. In order for the village higher ups to make a decision, it is often recommended to hear the much needed spymaster's views, both on internal and external matters. 
A spymaster's job was to be aware of all the significant and seemingly insignificant news and bits from all around the world and then report them back to his employers. However, it was not possible for a single man to be present everywhere at once. Hence, the need for a spy network. A good spymaster has a spy network usually spread across a country, while a great spymaster has a worldwide network of spies. Jiraiya was a spymaster, and he considered himself damn good at what he did. On top of being an incredible spy, he was one of the legendary Sanin, the only one still serving his village, unfortunately. His heroic tales were sung worldwide, from the Fire Nation to the Water Country, grudgingly in case of the latter. Admired by the women and children as the ultimate figure, the epitome of manliness and heroism, author of the world famous, best selling, passionate romance novels, that was who Jiraiya was. That was how he liked to introduce himself, anyway. Kya. Look out. It's a pervert. HMHM ha ha, he giggled, not paying any heed to the commotion he was causing as he kept scribbling furiously into his notebook. Nice. Nice. This is top quality research material. A big bosom, shapely rear. He would have continued his peepie research, if not for a rough, calloused hand clamping down on his shoulder. You have a lot of nerve, old man. Jiraiya turned back to see a mob of middle-aged and young men, each of them having stern expressions. However, he spied a few faces of admiration as well, making him smirk. We'll show you what happens when you peep on our women. They were prepared to exact righteous justice on the old pervert. However, he stopped them with the show of his palm. Jiraiya reached into his pocket, taking out an oh-so-familiar book. The men gasped. That is, it can't be. The legendary. Icha Icha Paradise. Many of them kneeled in front of him, except the man who had clamped on his shoulder earlier. He was looking in shock at the people behind him. You disgraceful perverts. The lot of you. I'm Disa. Jiraiya interrupted the man's tirade of righteousness with a gasp. Don't tell me. Could it be? W what? That you, my friend, he adorned a sympathetic face here, now patting the man's shoulder with mock consolation. Play for the home team. I totally understand. Even if I don't, my you ally confused comrade. Everyone is entitled to their preferences. The man's face turned red with fury and embarrassment. What was this old fool insinuating? He had been married to his lovely, gorgeous wife for 15 years now. They even had two beautiful children, for God's sake. There's no way he was. Found you, you pervert. Unfortunately for the man, the white-haired lunatic and the other men had completely disappeared during his inner monologue, leaving no trace behind. Leaving him ripe for being the recipient of the righteous fury of the now-clothed women. Wait. It was that other guy. His cries fell on deaf ears, unfortunately. Get him. Always the best at escaping dangerous situations, Jiraiya smirked arrogantly, allowing to compliment himself, totally not because no one else does it. His research done for the day, he moved on to the more, or less, depending on who you ask, important matters. Now to take care of that thing. He fished into his pockets before taking out a piece of paper. Written on it were the coordinates of several potentially important places. More specifically, the places where he might encounter his old friend, Orochimaru. He had been tracking his friend's movements for years now. Every time it felt like he was close, Orochimaru somehow gave him the slip almost as if he was aware of his efforts to track him. Bah! Like that was any secret. Of course, Orochimaru knew that he was dead set on finding him. It would have been surprising if he didn't even attempt to, considering his life and reputation as a wandering shinobi, sage. On top of following Orochimaru's trails, he had been keeping a lookout for a shady mercenary group that has been recently formed. The members wore distinctive clothing, as mentioned by witnesses. It was not a well-known organization from what he has gathered, but there was a rumor about there being at least three S-ranked rogue shinobi among their ranks. Now, a gathering of so many S-class shinobi, rogue shinobi at that, was not a laughing matter. It seemed downright impossible in practice. The higher a shinobi's rank, the worse their egos and quirks, and it was a disaster just waiting to happen when so many egoistic people gather together. How were they supposed to work together without infighting? The answer that made him uneasy, only a little, because he was Jiraiya the gallant, he who fears no evil, was that there was an even stronger person at the center of this, orchestrating the whole debacle from their place at the top of the chain. Now, that was a scary thought. Hum. So, this is the last place left to investigate. 
he murmured, skimming over all the other locations and felt some anticipation build up within him. Either he would find his friend over there, or all of his efforts were for naught. He didn't know which was a better outcome, to be honest. Finding out about the horrors that his ex-teammate was committing, or being clueless and still believing that he would return back to being the Orochimaru of the past, the one he considered his best friend. He sighed wearily. How he wished there was a pretty gal to accompany him on his ventures. Tsunade had denied his advances, quite violently, he might add, when he had asked her to come with him. He couldn't understand what was wrong with that. So what if his gaze had somehow wandered off to look at those irresistibly big and juicy? Okay, so maybe he could understand her. That doesn't mean he had to like it. To Kusaguker, I go then. Jiraiya pocketed the list before standing up from the top of the roof where he was sitting. His long white hair billowed with a particularly strong wind, and his sandals made the familiar sound of pattering against the floor. The toad sage had no idea exactly what was waiting for him, but he sure as hell wasn't going to stop until he finally confronts his once best friend. What do you say, old friend? Shimura Danzo looked at the documents laid in front of him, his gaze scrutinizing. It was not uncommon for the two of them to sit and discuss the potential recruits for Anbu units. Hiruzen greatly valued his bits of advice and relied on his cunning and manipulative mind for what it was worth, even if they didn't actually see eye to eye on some fronts. Hiruzen. The crippled man fixed his gaze on two particular files. He spoke in an old and weary voice, I propose that the two of them will be a perfect fit for Anbu. The Hokage raised a grizzled eyebrow, surprised. Well, this is certainly new, he paused and leaned back in his chair, looking back and making a quick hand gesture. And Anbu was kneeling beside him in the next moment, presenting the Hokage with his cigar. I was under the impression that one of them has been a longtime member of your route. It is quite unlike you to transfer one of your trusted members to my private Anbu. What are you plotting now? Danzo was quiet for a while as he gathered his response. It was true. One of them has been a member of the root organization for some years now. And loath as he was to admit it, someone he grew rather fond of in the last few years. But. He lacks darkness in his heart. Danzo shook his head slightly. For a unit that works entirely in the shadows, Kino is someone who shines brightly. I was unable to make him kill his emotions, because I feared it might dull his edge, unlike the others. He relies on his emotions, not to the extent where he would be an ill fit for Anbu, but he would not thrive in the root. Danzo looked in his longtime rival's eyes, his gaze carefully neutral. The two old men had a brief battle of wills with their eyes. Hiruzen trying to figure out the hidden intentions behind the words of his old friend and Danzo carefully keeping an apathetic face, not giving away anything. The thick, tense silence was ultimately broken when the Hokage sighed, reaching for the cigar in the hands of his subordinate. Danzo allowed an almost unnoticeable smirk of victory on his face, something that Hiruzen took a note of, judging by the knowing smile on his face. Fine, I'll have the paperwork ready. But, he paused and took a deep puff, letting it go and filling the entire office with smoke and the scent of tobacco, it will be fitting if you talk to the boy about his transfer. I will handle the other candidate. Danzo tipped his head in his direction. Hiruzen spoke up again. Although, I am afraid that the girl is a good few years short of the recommended age for Anbu. But I believe it would certainly please the Uchiha clan to have one of their own among Anbu ranks. Danzo nodded but kept his thoughts to himself. The girl was too good to be left alone, and he would rather have her in his route, but that was next to impossible with how the current situation was shaping. He hasn't exactly been the friendliest personality when it came to the Uchiha and he was sure that Fugaku, with the entire Uchiha clan, didn't hold him in the highest regard. Well, that was putting it mildly. What about the other boy, Naruto? He allowed a little curiosity to seep into his tone. It was not surprising for him to be interested in his students' progress. Hiruzen smiled amusingly, chuckling, as he said, I'm afraid he has already expressed his desire to be in a different unit, and I see no reason to refuse. Donzo's interest was piqued now. Is that so? Hiruzen refused to say any more, and he reluctantly dropped the subject. It wasn't like it would be a big secret since the Hokage made it quite evident that the boy would not be in Anbu. I must leave for Kumogakir by tomorrow. Danzo eyed the third Hokage, aware of what he was insinuating. He gripped on his cane, somewhat more firmly than necessary, and stood up while leaning most of his weight on it. Turning around, he walked calmly with a dignity that only a seasoned and experienced warrior can muster, and stopped by the door of the Hokage's office. 
There is no need be troubled about the village, he spoke evenly, not looking back. Even if he was not the Hokage, there was no way he would not give his all to protect the village that he loved so dearly. The roots will not let the old tree fall, no matter how strong the stormy winds get. The week had passed fairly uneventful, the three of them going over formations and sightseeing around Kumo. Tenzo had not been very pleased with how the other day went. His presence caused a big commotion among the women, only setting down when mediated by an amused Kakashi and a particularly lazy Kumo Genin. But in the end, he finally got to experience the famed hot springs of Kumogakure, so he was happy for that, at least. They couldn't train any further during the week, primarily because of the lack of privacy. Doing so would render their element of surprise a moot point if the other teams managed to stumble upon them, intentionally or unintentionally. However, being the elite shinobi and war veteran that he was, Kakashi did impart them with some golden words of wisdom when he was asked for his advice. Um, he hummed distractedly, face buried in his book, try not to get killed, hum? It would be a bother, he paused as he turned a page, giggling, before adding quietly, for me, anyway. Unfortunately, it was not a piece of very groundbreaking advice by any means, leaving three mildly annoyed Genin. Well, not like he cared, or so he wanted them to think. The day of the third round crawled near, ever so slowly, and soon they were packing their bags, sorting their belongings. Izumi neatly folded her spare outfits, nodding in satisfaction each time, and arranged them in a bag, which would, in turn, be sealed into a scroll. You ready? Naruto spoke from his place, sitting by the window as he checked on his tonto. Izumi nodded in affirmation. Tenzo, who was sitting upside down on the ceiling as he meditated, released the chakra flow and jumped on the floor with a flip. Let's go then. The older boy stretched out his right hand, palm facing down, as he looked expectantly at the both of them. There was a moment of awkward silence as the three of them stared at each other. Naruto reluctantly placed his hand on top of his, making Tenzo visibly pleased, and looked pleadingly at Izumi. She sighed. The vast stadium echoed with excited cheers and shouting as the three leaders made their way to the top. The heavily muscled rakage was the first, eliciting a thunderous roar from the civilians and shinobi alike. The citizens of Kumo loved the youthful and decisive leader. I waved his hand in greeting, his white howry fluttering with the wind, showing off his muscled chest. He took off his cage hat, something he was not used to, and then spoke in a bellowing voice that completely suited someone of his build. Today, we gather here in large numbers, shinobi or not, he paused, pleased with the silence that now encompassed the whole stadium. It was something he was used to, what with being a charismatic and headstrong leader. He continued in the same firm voice. The final nine contestants of the prestigious Chunin exams of this year, each of them carrying the pride of their countries on their back, will now engage in a fierce contest of strength, both mental and physical. The last round will be a battle royal in which the three teams will be pitted against each other. He swept his gaze across the nine finalists. Yugito might have failed, but he had nothing but absolute confidence in Team Samui, consisting of Samui, Darui, and C. All of them covered each other's flaws almost perfectly, working like a well-oiled machine. He should know after all one of them was taught by his predecessor who was even stronger than I himself. The rakage's gaze landed on the Kumo team, his permanent scowl etched on his face, and he nodded mysteriously at Darui, making the genin stand in attention. Darui returned the nod, albeit nervously. Let's show the daimyo and leaders of Konoha and Iwa how we do it in Kumo. He raised his hand, and the audience roared at his declaration. Chants praising the rakage and Kumo could be heard, making him smirk somewhat arrogantly. I sat down on his seat, right between the two leaders, putting his hat back on. The Hokage chuckled good-naturedly as he sat in his chair. You certainly have a flair for the dramatics, Rakage Dono. It's not dramatics, it's arrogance, you old monkey, the shortest in height out of the three leaders, Onoki the Sandame Suchikage, flippantly said as he shook his head. Hiruzen raised an amused brow at the attempt to rile him up. The irony of the statement was not lost on him. Onoki was, after all, even older than himself. We'll see who is arrogant when your granddaughter's team loses against my genin. I said hotly, always the short-tempered. Ha! In your dreams. The old Hokage sighed and shook his head as the two leaders bickered back and forth. The Suchikage was as unpleasant as ever. But coupling that with a quick-tempered rakage? Now, 
That was a recipe for disaster. At least it won't be a boring day. The three teams stood in groups, forming a triangle. There was an air of suppressed hostility in the arena as each team eyed the others. Naruto scouted their opponents. First was the team from Kumo, probably the favorites of the crowd, consisting of three teenagers. The blonde haired girl had a tonto strapped to her back, while one of the boys had a giant cleaver attached to his back, making them at least decent in close combat. The third member was a blonde haired boy, no special weapons that he could notice. When he turned to examine the team from Iwa, he found himself staring into pink pupils. What are you staring at, Konoha scum? Well, that wasn't a very friendly attitude now. Izumi noticed the commotion and whispered in his ears. They were around the same height, so she didn't have to stand on her toes, that is the Suchi Kage's granddaughter. Tread care. There isn't anything to look at, washboard, Tenzo spoke, grinning. Fully, Izumi completed flatly. Well, the damage was done now. Kuritsuchi fumed as her face turned red from anger and embarrassment. She was still growing, damn it. I'll kill you. She pounced at him, but found herself restricted by what appeared to be a giant octopus tentacle. She screamed and flailed her arms to no avail. Her teammates looked in fear. Wait till I give the go, before you go gung ho, fools. There was an uncomfortable silence as Killer B grinned expectantly. Kuritsuchi stopped her thrashing, confused behind the words of the self proclaimed rapper. Finally, when it was getting increasingly uncomfortable, someone coughed. Do not start fighting before the exam starts, is what he said, Samui spoke monotonously. Up with the leaders, I pinched the bridge of his nose as he closed his eyes, restricting the urge to palm his face and kick out his brother. It won't be good for Kumo's reputation, he convinced himself repeatedly. Hirazan, however, felt relief wash over him. At least, he was not the only one stuck with eccentric people around him. Guy would surely get along well with him. Kuritsuchi was dropped on the ground, but she still was far from happy. The rules were announced. The team that gets all three members knocked out or immobilized will lose. The proctor, Killer B, will stop any unnecessary deaths. The team with at least a single member standing at the last will win the round. B lifted his hand up in the air, looking at the Genin teams, but it was hard to say with his goggles. Izumi eyed the opposite teams and noticed them looking at each other. The leaders of both teams, Samui and Kuritsuchi, held each other's gaze before nodding. Azumi's eyes widened when she realized what was going to happen. She turned to warn her teammates but saw them almost twitching to form hand signs. Go. B brought down his hand, leaving the arena in a flicker. Instantly, Samui was onto them, her tonto drawn, threatening to cut anything in its way. Swish. The three of them scattered, moving into three directions. C. Darui. Samui spoke coolly, subtly motioning towards Naruto with her head as she moved to chase Tenzo. Let's go, Darui. Whatever. Naruto backflipped as he dodged the heavy swings of the giant cleaver, feeling the wind as the blade almost scored a glancing shot. One hit, and he would be done for. Darui followed him as he retreated, his cleaver drawn in a wide arc. Up in the stands, Kakashi watched the match with an unnatural interest the familiar book suspiciously missing from his hands, focusing more on the blonde-haired kid that he had been observing for the last few years. Of course, the kid didn't know about that. It would be an insult to a shinobi of his caliber to be found out by a brat. The first time he had seen the kid, all those years ago, the familiar tuft of blonde hair had caught his eye, but that didn't prove anything by itself. He had been curious and subtly asked around, collecting information on the boy, but found nothing special, even from the Hokage. But there was something about the kid, something incredibly familiar, yet still vastly different. Something that brought out the long buried memories inside the masked Jonin. He saw as down on the arena, Naruto dodged the overhead strikes of the cleaver sword, seamlessly flowing, until he was forced to parry one of the strikes with his tonto or be sliced in half. The blonde Kumo Jenin jumped at the opportunity, sneaking an attack from behind. Kakashi noticed something at that moment, causing him to smile. Clever little brat. Darui increased his speed suddenly, pushing Naruto further on the defensive as he drew his tonto, forcing him to parry his strike, twisting. C. Now. C gave a cry as he snuck behind the younger Genin, his hands forming the ram seal as a bright light radiated from his body, apparently blinding the Konoha Genin as he turned back upon noticing him. Lightning illusion flash. 
Darui had already covered his eyes, so he didn't notice it when the Naruto in front of him poofed in smoke. But he did feel something wet hit his face, prompting him to flinch. When he opened his eyes, it was to see his partner kneeling on the ground, raggedly breathing as he cradled his bloody midsection. The wound won't kill him, Naruto spoke casually, as long as he gets some medical attention, anyway. Darui looked conflicted for a while before he spoke lazily, no motivation in his tone. Man. The dark-skinned teenager sheathed his blade, making Naruto think that he was giving up. Will you just give up if I ask nicely? I'd rather not do this. No, Naruto looked at him flatly, making him sigh dejectedly. Whatever. Sorry, this is dull. I'm not very good at this yet, but. Naruto decided not to wait for the technique, flying through hand signs simultaneously with his opponent. Lightning style. Black Panther. A deadly black panther was formed out of black lightning, settling its predatory gaze upon Naruto. It growled dangerously and opened its maw. His eyes widened as he saw the black panther dashing towards him and hurriedly slammed his hands on the ground. He almost relaxed when the mud wall emerged from the ground, forming a barrier between the technique and himself. What was that black lightning? Is that the same technique used by the previous rakage? However, his chain of thoughts was abandoned when the same blonde genin, see, if what he heard was right, that he swore he had just mortally wounded, now clutching his wounded abdomen and a greenish glow on his hands, somehow got dangerously close to him. A medic nin, then. Of course, just my luck, he thought miserably, a frown on his face. White flashed in front of him this time, with no opportunity to make a clone, and he instinctively covered his eyes. Crap. Izumi saw the two Iwa Genin making their way towards her, their stride confident. Too confident for her tastes. One of them was built like a giant as he towered over her. His hands were enormous. Larger than any she'd ever seen. The other one was comparatively small. Likely the faster one among them. One of them had strength, while the other one had speed. Izumi smirked, almost unnoticeable and a little arrogantly, her eyes flashing red for a moment, as she unconsciously channeled her inner Uchiha. She had both strength and speed. The large man leapt towards her in a mad dash, making her raise an amused eyebrow at the foolish action. So, only bronze. She sidestepped easily, then ducking low under the horizontal swipe by the other genin, she caught his hand, using his own momentum to throw him over her shoulder, using chakra to amplify her muscle strength. And no brains. Is that all you have? The giant growled, nodding to his partner as they eyed her with increasing hostility. You'll be sorry to have provoked us, Konoha scum. Doubtful. The mammoth of a genin maintained distance, this time making hand signs as he did. Earth style. Earth spear, the Uchiha heiress retreated in the air, eyeing the Iwa genin curiously, expertly avoiding the hail of kanai and earth spears directed at her as she swirled midair. Landing in a crouch, she noticed the two Iwa shinobi on her opposite sides, their trap complete. You're mine. The giant dashed towards her like an angry bull, causing the ground to tremble as he did. On the opposite end, the other Iwa Genin sat in a crouch as he grinned victoriously, his jutsu ready, and slammed his hands on the ground, closing her exit. Earth style. Mud wall, hardening his fists akin to a stone, the brute pulled back his arm for a punch, intending to crush her between the wall and his fists. Izumi faced the wall disinterestedly, before turning towards the imminent threat. She watched him with a dull gaze, her eyes flashing red yet again, and he blinked, noticing it for the first time. The girl in front of him seemingly vanished in the wind, and he found himself tearing through the mud wall with his heavy fist, cursing in surprise as he did so. Wait. Stop. Only to crash headfirst with a colossal force into his now surprised and incredibly alarmed teammate, knocking him out cold instantaneously. While what happened? He asked to no one, sprawled on the ground. He was feeling his head pound horribly and his mind swimming in a thousand thoughts. I did. He couldn't ponder on the speaker's identity for much longer, knocked unconscious the next moment. Izumi pocketed the kanai that she just used and looked for her teammates, not giving the two of them a second glance. They weren't going to wake up soon, anyway. Die. 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 Tenzo yelped as he came dangerously close to losing his head, barely avoiding the enraged Iwa Kunoichi. Twirling his tonto and a kanai in his hands, he blocked an overhead swipe, now looking into dull blue eyes. I am not one to decline female attention, 
He spoke as he leaned backward, dodging an earth spear that would have skewered his chest. But only when they're not trying to kill me. I'll kill you. See? Samui clicked her tongue, getting frustrated with their lack of progress. She could see her teammates fighting the blonde boy on another side of the arena. There was not a shred of doubt in her mind about them. Darui was the strongest genin she had ever met, taught by the legendary Sandame Rakage himself back when he was still alive. Which was really cool if someone asked her. She jumped backward when she saw her temporary ally forming hand signs, the leaf genin doing the same. Earth style. Earth dragon jutsu. A massive structure made of stone and shaped like a dragon flew towards Tenzo, who hurriedly completed his own technique. Wind style. Wind bullets the wind bullets clashed with the stone monstrosity, shattering it in tiny pieces, some of them flying towards him with high velocity, nicking him. The Konoha Genin hissed as he touched his face, feeling the distinct warmth and wetness of blood, his blood. She took advantage of his distraction, kicking low, swiping his feet beneath him as he fell on his back with a yelp. Kuritsuchi jumped on him, her face set in an expression of glee, and sat on his chest with a kanai spinning dangerously in her right hand. Finally, no, wait, Tenzo spoke desperately, his voice pitched a little higher than usual. I was just kidding, you're. Thunk, bigger, he let out fearfully, twisting his neck to avoid her vicious stabs. Thunk, then the booby blonde chick. I swear, he finished, holding his breath. Kuritsuchi stopped her kanai an inch from his forehead and uttered in an eerily calm voice. What? Yes, it's true. All of it he yelled somewhat desperately. He could have died just now. Red crawled up to her nose. No one has ever complimented her looks before, most of them being afraid of her grandfather. Sometimes, she was even mistaken for a boy, to her ire. So what if she didn't have a gigantic chest or that she preferred short hair? She was very much a girl, always has been and always will be. W well in that case, Tenzo suddenly tensed looking behind her, and pressed the Iwakunoichi close to his chest, rolling out of the way. Only for a very deadly blade to be stabbed in the ground, which would have gone right through the two of them. Let me go. Kuritsuchi, back to her senses now, yelled as the both of them got up. You you pervert. But I saved you. I don't need Konoha trash to save me. It was your fault anyway, she spoke rudely, you distracted me with your treacherous words. Tenzo did not speak again as he was forced to evade another overhead strike. He eyed the blonde Kunoichi seriously. He could not afford to die here. Fine, he said as he unsheathed his tanto, carrying it with his right hand and spinning a kanai in his left. I won't hold back if that's what you want. And then he charged. Onoki was an old man, there was no doubt about that. Being older than even the Sandame Hokage, he had seen his fair share of war and death came out of it alive to tell the tale and only got stronger. He was often seen as grumpy and insensitive by other people. People who did not know him well. The man had lost a son in the war and, since then, only grew more and more overprotective over his loved ones. Namely his beloved, sweet, innocent granddaughter. Particle style. Atomic let me go, you ape. Suchikage. This is my village. I spoke in a gruff voice as he restricted the old Suchikage. Are you threatening war with Kumo? I'll threaten anyone as long as I keep that despicable pervert away from my granddaughter. Hokage. Control your genin. Rakage barked. Onoki is not my genin. So, maybe he was a little bit miffed about the old monkey remark, but it was worth it. Onoki saw red. Konoha will get a fourth war if that's what you lot want. Onoki spat, still restricted by the rakage. Not like he couldn't have gotten free. All it would take was a touch to make the large man light as a feather. Hirazan, knowing well about the grumpy man and seeing that it may escalate to a fight, tried to placate him. Surely, young Kino had no wicked intentions, he said calmly. After all, a near-death experience only brings out the true nature of a person. He hesitated and slowed down in the end, realizing he had messed up. The rakage stared disbelievingly at him. Wasn't the Hokage the preacher of peace? Then why in the god's name was he trying to start a war now? Hirazan was about to say something to calm the oncoming storm when the tiny man wriggled out of the rakage's grasp. Particle style. Atomic dis, crack, arg, my back, my back. Crap. Naruto shielded his eyes from the bright light and gritted his teeth. Can't see anything. 
He cried out pain when he felt something sharp slice across his back and was forced to the ground, courtesy of a fierce kick to his head. His back burned as soon as it made contact with the ground, making him arch his back upwards, hissing in pain. Relax. Calm down, he told himself, taking deep breaths. He could not see them, but he could still make things difficult for them. A mischievous little grin painfully crept to his face as he thought of an idea, shakily getting up with some struggle. Give up. Man. You're good. Really good. But you can't beat us, he heard someone from his left. And this is kinda dull. Now, I won't know that if I give up, Naruto said, still keeping his eyes shut. But let's see you counter this. He took something out from his pouch, making Darui tense before he threw it down. Smoke. A smoke bomb. Does he really think he can hide? Multi shadow clone jutsu. More than a dozen Naruto jumped out of the smoke, all of them running in random directions. Darui and C shared a worried glance, their jaws hanging limply. Just how much chakra did this guy have? C straightened, his wound now healed enough to fight, and closed his eyes to concentrate. I can't sense the real one among them, he said and shook his head after a moment. Their chakra is indistinguishable. Darui snuck a glance at his leader, sitting among the other cage, silently pleading with his gaze. Boss. Can I give up? I glared. Darui scratched his hair, feeling entirely unmotivated to chase after the metaphorical chickens. The boss said I can't give up. But I just want to go home and nap, see. C ignored his mutterings, focusing on the clones who were running amic like headless chickens. Kiss my ass, Kumogakure, ramen, ramen, ramen. You're all so useless. I'm so, so sad. C ignored the clones, who were apparently suffering from a multiple personality disorder, and focused on something else. Like how to find the real Naruto. Though his twitching eyebrow betrayed him, he noticed something, making him smirk victoriously. I got you now. Darui. That one in the middle. It's the only one with blood on his jacket. His partner checked, and sure enough, there was only one among them with blood on his clothes, on the back, right where he sliced him with his cleaver sword. Darui gave him a two-finger salute, pleased that his work was now cut tremendously. He silently made his way to the blonde Genin, who was running right towards him, his eyes still shut. The older boy kicked the blonde Genin in his chest. Hard making him fall down, seemingly unconscious, with a surprised sound as all the other clones popped in white smoke. Darui sighed. Finally, he could join Samui now and then win this thing. Let's go, C. C relaxed at last, heaving a heavy sigh of relief. He could use some more healing now that he noticed. The boy gave him a pretty nasty wound. He turned around, only to notice a fist dangerously close to his face, before being socked with a humongous force in his face, making it cave in momentarily as he went flying from the power behind it. The crowd booed, and many among the audience cringed at the raw brutality of the strike. C flipped several times midair and hit the ground, skidding to a stop. He did not wake up again. Naruto, who was suspiciously missing his jacket now, shook his right arm, clenching and unclenching his fist. He might have used a lot of force in that punch. Not that he regretted it. The guy deserved it for blinding him with that cheap technique. Darui stared dully at the scene. The Naruto that he had kicked poofed in smoke as well, leaving behind a torn and bloody white jacket. Well, it was not white anymore. You don't suppose I can just give up? Naruto blinked. He was going to give up, just like that? Well, will you? Darui looked at his leader yet again, who was glaring even harder than before. His scowl certainly seemed more fierce than usual. He frowned. Sighing, he brought out his trusty cleaver sword yet again. Nah, the boss won't let me. Tenzo rolled on his heel as he avoided a stab to his chest, sliding the blunt side of his blade against his opponent's blade. He slashed at her unguarded waist with the kunai, making the blonde Kunoichi cry out in surprise and pain. He had to immediately twist his neck to dodge a flying kick to his face, courtesy of Kuratsuchi. Feeling the wind rush by his lips as the leg slid by dangerously close, he grabbed at it. Kuritsuchi blinked in surprise before she felt her world rotate and found herself propelling towards Samui, who was still clutching her wounded waist as warm blood poured out of it. Seizing an opportunity, the Iwakunoichi pulled back her fist midair, punching Samui right in the cheek hard enough for her to lose her footing. Tenzo capitalized on the moment, slashing his blade in a wide arc towards her, 
which the unsettled Kunoichi desperately moved back to avoid but took a shallow cut to her bicep. She retreated further away from the two. This is. Not cool. The blue-eyed Kunoichi panted with exertion. She was in bad shape right now. Her opponents weren't dizzy due to injuries like she was. You can always give up. Tenzo supplied helpfully, to which the Kunoichi shook her head. Well, not like he expected her to, but one could always try. Stop ignoring me. Kuritsuchi cried out as she jumped in the air, forming hand seals mid-air. I am being forced to use that on measly Genin. What a shame, she thought to herself bitterly. She was quite proud of her abilities as a Kunoichi, and could defeat some of the stronger Chunin and weaker Janin, while still being a Genin at the age of 14, as a matter of fact. So, for her to be forced to use her special technique against a couple of Genin, no matter how strong they might be, left a sour taste in her mouth. Her pride certainly took a hit. Lava style, quicklime congealing jutsu. Tenzo, who was about to subjugate Samui, backflipped from the large quantity of quicklime expelled by the fiery Kunoichi, narrowing his eyes at the new development. So, she was holding back as well, after all. But it still won't be enough to. His train of thoughts abruptly halted when he found his feet jammed in the quicklime. Forcing himself to move was useless as well. He sighed miserably. If only he could use his special technique, this fight would have been over long ago. But you don't always get what you want. Samui, on the other hand, was stuck all the way from her waist down as she was sprawled on the ground, the Kunoichi being already unconscious from the strain. Kuritsuchi smiled smugly. Of course, she had no doubt she was going to win. How else was she going to be the next Suchikage? Her old grandfather was already getting up there. In her musings, she forgot that Tenzo was still conscious and turned her back on him, waving towards the crowd and her grandfather who was all too pleased with her performance. It was kind of obvious, with how the man had not shut up bragging about his precious granddaughter ever since she unveiled her secret technique. And then, at the tender age of four, my little Kuritsuchi killed her first bear, a giant one at that, ha! Huh? Surely, the two of you were humbled by her performance today, and would want to promote her to a janin straightaway. I know I am very much tempted to, but I think she still needs a little more express. Hirazan coughed politely breaking the older man's ramblings to a halt as he pointed to the arena without speaking anything. The rakage was stone-faced as one more Kumo shinobi was disqualified. But he did grip on his chair somewhat harder, cracking it under strain. The smile on the hokage's face, filled with incredible amusement, was the only warning Onoki got as he slowly turned toward the arena and... What? What? The duo of granddaughter and grandfather shouted simultaneously. There was a knife on her throat, close enough to draw a trickle of blood that rolled down her neck into her shirt. I win, a male voice whispered, chuckling in her ear and raising goosebumps along her whole body as she felt the cold steel of her opponent's hite eight touch the back of her neck. How exactly did that fool manage to break out? She dared not to move her neck, peering at the face, that infuriating face, of her opponent from the corner of her eye. She swore that she had him trapped. Then how? Kuritsuchi nodded her head minutely anyway, accepting her defeat. At least, she lost to an honorable and strong Wario. Tenzo, where are your pants? A monotonous voice questioned. Oh, Izumi. He nodded to her, utterly nonchalant. How long have you been here? Wait. Pants? Kuritsuchi scooted away from the boy, now aware of the suspicious lack of reaction from the crowd. Tenzo had slipped out of his pants and footwear in order to escape her technique. Not long. Meanwhile, the strain of the fighting and her own embarrassment over watching a half naked boy was too much for Kuritsuchi, prompting her to faint. And with the latest defeat of Kuritsuchi, Iwa was now out of the round. Leaving only Kumo and Konoha. Elsewhere on the arena, Naruto, who was now down to his orange shirt and mesh armor, small cuts and blood marks littered all over his clothes, danced against the song of battle alongside Darui. He could feel his blood pumping with each strike he blocked his adrenaline skyrocketing with each moment the wind caressed his face, his blonde hair blowing wildly with each movement. He didn't even realize it when his lips automatically curled into an excited grin. Having fun? Darui questioned as they locked their respective weapons, his giant cleaver blade about to bisect the younger and shorter Genin upside down in Naruto's tanto blocking the overhead strike. Their blades vibrated with the strain, making noise as the metal ground against metal. 
I guess. I am, he struggled to speak against the strain. The grin on his face vanished as he disengaged, now aware of the cuts lingering on both his arms. He tore the ruined bandages on his left hand, exposing the vicious scar on it. Darui looked at it with interest before speaking. You're lucky to have that arm still intact. Once Yugito managed to sever a man's arm when she was in her chakra mode. Naruto's curiosity peaked. He raised an interested brow at his opponent. She's a Jinchuriki, right? He continued upon receiving a nod. Mind telling me about them? I'm not exactly familiar with it. Darui chose to remain silent, not giving any indication that he heard his question. Upon noticing this, Naruto tried another approach. Tell me one thing. He gulped, a little nervousness seeping into his tone, could. Could a tailed beast forcefully possess its container? Darui shrugged carelessly. It depends. Realizing that he was not going to find anything other than vague answers from him, Naruto sighed. Man. Darui stretched his arm, then formed a hand sign, almost lazily. This has been fun and all. You're pretty cool for a kid, even though you punch the lights out of sea. He muttered quietly, finally completing the hand signs. But this ends now. Gale style. Laser circus. Perhaps for the first time today, Naruto felt a small amount of uncertainty creep into him as he saw the older Genin form a halo of white light around his hands, shooting several high speed beams from it. Wait. He still had that technique he made with Shisui. Swiftly, he pulled his Tonto behind him as he crouched. As the beams got closer to him, Naruto smiled a little, excited to show off his new move. He vanished in a blur of orange, exceptionally fast, surprising Darui and forcing him to change the beam's direction to his new position. His Tonto, now coated in a layer of rippling water, was swung at the same time he disappeared yet again this time appearing right behind Darui in a blur of orange. Darui only had enough time to drop his jutsu and shield himself with his cleaver blade. The arc of water sliced through the air with incredible speed, swishing, crashing against the giant blade, which groaned horribly under the pressure. But Darui had underestimated the sheer raw strength behind the technique, or he would have never attempted to block it. For he was sent flying towards the wall of the arena, where he crashed and made an indent, before falling down in a crouch, leaning heavily against his sword. His head was bowed down as he attempted to regulate his erratic breathing, almost collapsing on the floor. Give up, a distant voice said from behind him, he could not make out who was it anymore. The voices sounded funny. When he tried to move, he felt the cold steel rest against his neck, almost daring him to shift a muscle. He sought his leader with his gaze, pleading again. Hadn't he showed off enough? Was that not enough to please the clients? Boss. Give up. The rakage stared right into his eyes stoically, but his hands clearly shook with agitation. He held his gaze for a moment before finally slumping in his chair, his eyes closed. Darui, obviously relieved, finally allowed himself to utter the three magical words. I give up. Impressive technique. I can see how you based it upon Shisui's own. Thanks. Naruto grinned slightly. I call it the ultimate slashing blade dance of the water god technique. Cool, right? Izumi contemplated on retracting her praise upon hearing the horrible name. But upon seeing his excited face, her own lips curled upward slightly. Right. She lied shamelessly. Meanwhile, a half-naked Tenzo made his way towards the duo, flashing a smile and a wave as he neared them. Why are you missing your pants? I had to sacrifice them to defeat my opponent. How does that work? He asked with genuine confusion. Tenzo was creative with his techniques, if nothing else. Izumi stared at them flatly before walking away, she did not need to be a part of this conversation. The rakage held a stoic face, but his chair cracked under the strain of his grip, making the two leaders look at him warily. Rakage Dono, calm down, Hiruzen attempted to soothe him, your shinobi, even though they lost, fought brilliantly and deserved to be promoted. Being in the final round was a testament to their ability itself. Ai's face didn't lose its stoic look, but he did ease his grip on the poor chair. He contemplated the Hokage's words. It's true. He thought as he noticed the unconscious forms of his genin, his eyes losing their cold edge as he did so. HMPH. It was just luck this time, Hokage. My genin would have demolished yours any other day, I said in his usual blunt manner. Still. I'll have them double no triple their training intensity. Still. To beat Darui. And at such a young age. Truly is a formidable feat, 
he thought as he eyed the blonde Jenin with something akin to respect. Meanwhile, Onoki was plotting to get away with murdering a foreign Jenin without triggering the next great war. Your Jenin are shameless and unprofessional, old monkey, he said with a scoff. My granddaughter was clearly the winner. It is a disgrace that such a disrespectful shinobi was allowed to win. Hiruzen debated on his response, but in the end, just chuckled amusedly. His village had already won. Allowing the grumpy man a sense of pseudo victory didn't sound too bad. Whatever you say, fence sitter. HMPH. Akumo Janin appeared before them, kneeling down on his knee. I looked at him for a moment before he gestured for him to speak. The nobles and daimyo were very impressed with the performance. They are demanding a three way match between the remaining participants. The three leaders met each other's gaze, silently contemplating. The Hokage nodded, prompting the Suchikage to scoff and make a dismissive gesture. Fine. Let's see if they have any more left to show, I spoke gruffly. I severely doubt it, in any case. The Janin muttered an affirmative before he disappeared in a flicker. Hokage sama. Hiruzen nodded, already aware of Kakashi's presence by his side. What do you need, copycat ninja? Onoki interjected rudely. I watched the youngster curiously, already aware of his reputation. Hitaki Kakashi of the Sharingan. Also known as Copy Ninja Kakashi, only remaining student of that man, I thought, his face carefully neutral. I apologize, Kakashi gave him an easy smile. I only answer to my leader. Onoki scoffed. What is it, Kakashi? Kakashi observed the three genin down on the arena with his lone eye scrutinizing the blonde-haired Jenin with great interest. He did not speak for a while, but Hiruzen didn't interrupt him. He noticed the Reikage and Suchikage listening intently, and smiled at them. Sorry, it's nothing important, he said, still smiling. Perhaps, it would be best discussed in private. The Hokage raised a brow before making a dismissive gesture. Kakashi was gone the next second. Jiraiya clutched his bloody shoulder, gritting his teeth so hard he could taste blood as he shot out from the rubble, riding on a giant toad. The toad sage could feel his blood boiling as rage flashed in his eyes, clenching his fist until they went sickly pale. The snarl on his face could be compared to a wild animal, what with the raw ferocity behind it. With his now cracked Hite 8, once white hair now drenched in red blood, he was no common pervert. He was one of the legendary Sanin, the toad sage of Mount Mayoboku, the man who trained the fourth Hokage. He was Jiraiya the gallant. And he was furious. Gamakan san, off to Konoha. I might be ungraceful. But I will try always the best at escaping dangerous situations, he thought with a painful, bloody smirk that masked his rage. Complimenting himself because he really was the best. The gigantic magenta colored toad leapt through the forests of the land of fire, making the ground rumble and covering large distances rapidly. Sat atop of it, Jiraiya of the Sanin was in deep thought as he struggled to control his overwhelming emotions. There was not a shred of the easygoing expression that he was known for on his face as he decided on his next course of action. And on the top of it, he wasn't exactly in the top condition. TCH. Another giant leap rattled the Toad Sage as he lost his balance, a thing which had not happened since a few decades, and dropped on his hands and knees on top of the Toad's head. He winced, grabbing his shoulder that ached horribly. Damn it. This is pathetic, he thought to himself, hating his own weakened condition. Should he go back to Konoha? Serutobi sensei was not in the village from what he had heard. Most probably due to Konoha participating in the Chunin exams in Kumo. The Hokage had chosen to witness the finals with his own eyes. This might be the perfect opportunity for him to snoop around the village and give a friendly visit to some people. Now that he thought of it, the matter concerned another person as well. Someone who has been away from Konoha for a while now. He will be in a lot of pain in the future if they manage to learn it from somewhere else. And he had been meaning to visit them anyway. On the other hand, he could actually use some help with his mangled arm. Ken San. He let out in a slightly weaker than usual voice, thankfully not enough to make his summoned ally suspicious. We need to make a detour. The toad stopped itself immediately, sliding in the clearing of the forest from the sudden change in momentum. Where to, Jiraiya san? Jiraiya stood upon the head of the toad, narrowing and shielding his eyes from the sun's ruthless glare with his hand as he looked around in the distance with an unusual, for him that is, calculating gaze. To the north. Very well. The toad positioned itself, 
facing in the mentioned direction, and tensed its legs. But I might be a little clumsy. And then it leapt. A few hours earlier, Jiraiya grimaced, wiping the grime off his face as he traveled along the underground tunnels. He had no idea that his search would lead him through such a filthy place. The stench of rotten flesh and animal droppings was unbearable, prompting him to pinch his nose shut and curse Orochimaru in his head. Couldn't he have chosen a somewhat decent place for a hideout? This barbaric place was not very appealing, visually, or in any way. At all. If it was up to him, he would have lounged in a brothel or something similar for a hideout. Bah. This was no time to get sidetracked in complaining about his ex-teammate's preferences. He had actual work to do this time. Jiraiya ducked under a deformed rock, gingerly placing his hand on the slimy wall for support as his feet splashed on the disgustingly wet ground, something he tried to ignore, unsuccessfully. Making his way to the other side, he checked around the cave. Tap, 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 tiny water droplets dripped from the stalactite formations as the toad sage ventured forward. He reached upward and touched the structure with his index finger, finding the surface to be incredibly smooth. The body oils from a human would generally stop the structure from growing, but it was not a difficult task for him to form a skin of chakra over his finger. He rubbed his finger against his thumb and cautiously sniffed it. Once. Twice. He cringed. Ack. This place must be ancient, he wondered out loud as his voice echoed off the walls. He took out his notebook, not the one he uses for his research, of course, and scribbled the curious details. Looking at his notebook for a moment, he then snapped it shut and shoved it back into his clothes. With that, he ventured further, deep within the network of caves, in a dimly lit room that vaguely resembled a laboratory. A man stood beside a table, not unlike the ones that could be used in a hospital for performing surgeries. He took out a vial and studied it, the sick, yellow content within it glistening in the white light of the soul lamp. Holding it between his pale middle finger and thumb with the ease of someone who could be called a professional, he stirred it. He was about to prepare an injection when he sensed a distortion behind him and smiled, the person who caused it making no efforts to hide their presence. Oh my! The man let out in a smooth, slippery voice filled with mock surprise. To what do I owe the pleasure? The masked man finished teleporting atop of a giant crate, sitting as he rested his cheek on his fist and fixed his gaze on the pale-skinned man who was working on what seemed to be a deformed corpse of something that might have resembled a human once upon a time. Hum, he let out in a deep, intimidating voice. The man looked at the abomination with apparent interest, but it was difficult to make out with his mask. Do you take me for a fool, snake? Of course not, the scientist said, chuckling amusedly. That would be rather foolish of me, now, won't it? There was a moment of silence only disturbed by the clatter of surgical instruments as the scientist kept fidgeting with them. The new arrival hummed, a deep sound vibrating from his throat. I know, that you deliberately let the information slip, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. I've been meaning to visit you, you see. But I had more, pressing matters to attend to. The smile on the scientist's face stretched from ear to ear, a sick sight, if one were to see, but the man couldn't see it, as he was still facing away from the new arrival. A smooth but unpleasant chuckle emerged from the pale-skinned man's throat. Whatever do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about. Why would a man like you be interested in a common scientist, such as me? He spoke in a tone filled with mockery, still not facing the man. The temperature in the room dropped suddenly as the man felt something unpleasant crawling on his skin, all the way from his toes to his mouth as he unconsciously shivered, feeling a cold chill tear through him. This is merely a warning. The masked man said slowly, watching silently in satisfaction with the effect he had on the scientist. Do not test my patience any further, snake. The pale-skinned man gently dropped his instruments on the table and finally turned around to face his guest. He regained his composure in a fraction of a second as he bowed mockingly, the smile back on his face. Of course. Forgive me, I get carried away sometimes. He straightened up and finally had a good look at his guest. The spiky, long, waist-length black hair, his features hidden by the yellow and black mask and a dark blue robe. He stared into the lone orifice with an uncanny interest, smiling even further when he caught a glint of red. Introductions are in order, it seems. I'm Orochimaru, one of the Sanin, as you might have known already, he said with a slight dip of his head. And what might be the name of my guest? You're certainly an Uchiha. Or someone who merely stole the Sharingan off a corpse. The masked man stared at his visage, not giving any reaction to the jab. Tell me, 
he said, leaning forward and interlocking his hands. What is so special about that boy? Your genius must not be trivial if you manage to actually transfer the legendary wood release, artificially or not. There is something indeed different about the boy. Orochimaru frowned for a moment, feeling a little irritated that he was not going to get his answers on the man's identity, but then he decided to test the waters a little more. A foolish gamble considering the man was clearly stronger than him. Only for now, he reminded himself. Hum. What's in it for me? Why should I tell you anything, when I don't even know who I'm dealing with? Do you wish to join my organization? The man stated without hesitation. Sat my curiosity, and I'll let you join. Oh my. Orochimaru's smile widened even further, almost impossibly. You know an awful lot, don't you? Ho? Oh? Get to the point. The man said sharply, and in an instant, the smile vanished from Orochimaru's face. He held any further snide remarks. This was not someone he could play around with, at least not right now. Very well. I will tell you, Orochimaru said as he walked away from the table and washed his hands with a disinfectant. The boy, was the seventeenth subject I had used for my bloodline transfer project and the second one to stay alive through it. However, he was the only one to inherit the bloodline to such a degree that dare I say would one day become something greater than Senju Hashirama's wood release itself. He walked towards the masked man and leaned on the wall, crossing his arms as he continued. The man raised an interested brow beneath his mask. Oh, and why is that so? A grin crept to Orochimaru's face, one that would have been considered mischievous on any other person. Would you believe me if I say, that my ex-teammate Tsunade is not the last remaining Senju? The masked man shifted slightly in interest. Ho! Oh, a bold claim you have there. I hope this is not one of your games, Snake, for your sake. Orochimaru raised his hands placatingly, the smile still on his face. Oh, I assure you. I give my word that I speak the truth. The masked man silently mulled over the information. He could certainly see how it was possible. Having the Senju blood flow through one's veins was reason enough for the child to be unique but there was still something bothering him. Something that didn't make any sense. Konoha. The village that prides itself over its teamwork, he said, bitterness seeping into his tone. Something that made Orochimaru raise a brow. There surely was a story here. One would think that the village would throw itself on the feet of the last. Senju given how they idolize their showdown. How truly bizarre, the man trailed off expectantly. Orochimaru realized what was being asked of him, and he smiled innocently. My, you are awfully nosy. I've already told you what you asked of me, completed my end of the deal. Have you? I ask you to sat my curiosity. Yet, I'm still curious, he leaned forward, resting his hand on his thigh and leaning on it. So, tell me. Why does no one know of it? The Sanin didn't allow the irritation at being played at his own game to show on his face. He still had his pride, after all. But he did note that the man in front of him was dangerously clever perhaps someone who was well versed in the art of manipulation. But surely not better than him. You have me in something of a bind here, he let out while still maintaining a reluctant tone. Fine. I will tell you. Or rather, I'll just show you. Since you clearly don't believe my words. The masked man watched interestedly as he went up to a cabinet before he began to sort through different files and folders. The sound of paper brushing against paper filled the gloomy silence in the darkroom. Smiling in satisfaction when he found the thing he was looking for, Orochimaru made his way back to him, presenting him a folder with an anticipating smile. See for yourself. His tone was filled with amusement as the man looked at the folder in his hands. The man cautiously took the file in his grasp and skimmed through it. After a moment, suddenly, he stilled as if shocked before he started to shake. Orochimaru tensed. Did he somehow offend the other man? Whatever he was expecting to happen. What actually happened next was so unpredictable that he was shocked to silence. The masked man threw his head back and laughed. It wasn't a quiet chuckle but a burst of full-blown laughter filled with mirth and a twinge of insanity. He laughed and laughed, and Orochimaru waited patiently, now somewhat equal parts amused and disturbed about the masked man's behavior. I see, that you've found something amusing. The man's laughter died down to small chuckles as he controlled himself. He looked at the paper again before he shook his head in apparent amusement. Yandaimi Hokage, he said in his now normal, deep voice, the man responsible for a lot of things, both directly and indirectly, I detest that man with all my being, he said, almost growling out his last words. 
To find out that the boy is his child is a pleasant surprise. I'm almost impressed with the work you've gone through. Pleasant, surely if the man hated the Yandaimi just as much as he implied, finding out that he had another progeny running around was something that would entice irritation or even hatred. Then why? Oh. I see that you've understood, the man said, mirth still present in his voice. It should be quite, interesting to have him join the organization, something that stands against everything that Minato stood for. Indeed. Not to mention, his unique abilities would be beneficial for them. Jiraiya tried his best to control his boiling temper as he spied on the two men, hiding behind the wall and using his Maizaigakure no Jutsu. Violence in closed quarters would make things messy, he told himself. Information is more critical than retribution, he convinced himself repeatedly. But he couldn't stop himself from gritting his teeth and clenching his shaking fists hard enough to hear a crack. Only his decades of experience in spying allowed him to even his breathing and control his emotions. Still, he did not know how long he could hold for without barging in there and introducing his friend to a perfectly round Rasengan. Friend. He almost scoffed at the word but stopped himself. The bastard was no friend of him if what he heard right now had even a single grain of truth. He knew the pain of losing a son, and Minato lost his when he wasn't even fully ready to be a father. He knew the haunted look in those eyes back when he had encountered his pupil. It hurt even worse when he now found out that the person that he considered a friend, even a brother, was the one behind it. He pressed himself against the wall almost as if trying to blend into it and took a silent, long breath. A bead of sweat rolled down his brow. Even if he used his trump card here, he knew Orochimaru enough to realize that this was his lair. Here, he was at a clear disadvantage, and he would lose this one golden chance to collect more information. And the unknown man, from what he could decipher, the man was the one leading the band of S-class criminals, so he must be strong enough to at least be S-rank, probably on the higher end. Other than that, he had no information on the man. He was running without any intel here. I hope that it is enough to, sat your curiosity. He heard the infuriating voice of the person that he perhaps hated the most right now. Hum, it surely exceeds any of my expectations. Surely, no one, even Minato, ever knew about his Senju origins. A chuckle. Sly and disgusting. Indeed, it did surprise me. But I hope that it satisfies your curiosity. After all, I do understand how it feels to be curious. I have always been the curious one. Isn't that right? Jiraiya. Aw oh shit. There was a loud explosion, and debris and smoke filled the room as Jiraiya tore right through the wall, a blue Rasengan dangerously swirling in his palm. He noticed two people in the room with him in a split second. Orochimaru and a man with a yellow mask. He twisted midair and aimed his attack on the one that was closest to his location. Rasengan. Ho? So, we have a little spy here, the man remarked casually, phasing through the deadly attack as if it was nothing. Jiraiya stopped himself from crashing as he dissipated his jutsu and turned around, not letting the enemy have his back. He was outnumbered but far from hopeless. Most of all, he had no idea how the masked man dodged his attack. I swear I had him, it's almost as if my attack passed right through him, the toad sage thought to himself, a heavy frown on his face as he studied his opponents. A space-time jutsu? It's good to see you, is what I'd like to say. But I can clearly see the malicious intent in your eyes, Orochimaru commented with that infuriating smile on his face. He vaguely remembered the same smile on his face back when they were still genin. The masked man silently watched the confrontation between the two friends turned enemies, teleporting to the higher ground, something that Jiraiya noticed from his peripheral vision. I'm hurt, Orochimaru said with mock sadness. And here I thought that you would be happy to see your best friend after all this time. Jiraiya gave him a tight smile, one that didn't quite reach his eyes. Of course, I'm happy. Can't you see how my hands are shaking with happiness? Why, I didn't know you made new friends. Won't you introduce us? Your petty matters do no concern me, the masked man said disdainfully, standing up. Orochimaru, dispose of the pest and wait for further contact. And. Welcome to the Akatsuki. Try not to die. There was nothing welcoming about the ominous parting words. The two used to be best friends stared into each other's eyes, seemingly ignoring the man who disappeared in a distortion. Jiraiya dropped his smile almost instantly, but Orochimaru's only widened. So, you're joining a gang. Orochimaru's lips thinned into a line. Is that what you're going to say? 
no long speeches about how I should come back to the village and answer for my horrible crimes. Ask forgiveness from our sensei? Shame, he shook his head as he said, and I thought that I knew you. You went far past the line of forgiveness when you did that to Minato. Oh, such hypocrisy. You berate me for what I did with your pupil and his child while you still thought I was redeemable when I used those 59 other children? Jiraiya didn't speak for a while, and it was clear that his answer had taken him by surprise. It wasn't a lie either. Prior to discovering what he did today, he actually was hoping to beat some sense into his friend. You're right. I'm a hypocrite, the toad sage admitted quietly. I foolishly believed that there was a tiny spark of good left within you. I was blind to the reality, and only when it hit me on a personal level, shook my world, did I stubbornly open my eyes. The words were said mostly to himself rather than the person opposite to him. Good? Evil? Such things are dependent on perspectives, Orochimaru said as he shook his head. I do not align myself to either of them. I merely have a goal and no useless morals to bind me. I will go to any lengths to get what I want. Jiraiya shook his head in frustration. Our philosophies differ too much. There's no reason to argue anymore since it clearly won't change anything. Finally, something did get through that thick skull of yours. I was afraid we were going to bicker like children. So, are you going to fight me now? Fight? I want to kill you, you bastard, he growled out. Even now, I have to stop myself from rushing and choking the life out of you. But you are a ing coward, he spat out his words. Orochimaru chuckled. So, you notice that I'm a clone. Jiraiya didn't say anything, merely scoffing as he turned around to walk away. Maybe when you gather enough courage to slither out of the hole that you're hiding in. Staying here any longer was a waste of time. He would just end up letting the snake worm his way into his head. There were more important matters than talking to the clone of a degenerate. Like finding the son of his pupil. He had only taken half a step when he realized that something was very wrong with the situation. But Jiraiya, he could feel the mocking smile in that bastard's voice. It's been so long since we had a reunion. You really thought that I was going to let you go empty handed? He looked over his shoulder. Wah, boom. There was a deafening sound as Jiraiya looked around, wide eyes filled with panic, noticing as the cave started to collapse within itself. The ground rumbled, and he lost balance barely avoiding a falling piece of rock that would have pierced through his skull. Damn it. Hari Jizo, his white hair became seemingly alive, growing to unnatural proportions, curling around and covering almost all of his body except his left arm, which took the brunt of the damage when an enormous rock crashed upon him. Arg. The white-haired man cried out in agony as he felt his shoulder getting crushed. He faintly heard the infuriating chuckle, feeling his temper boiling with every word that he heard. You know Jiraiya. Consider this as a piece of advice from an old friend. You are not much of a guy who hides in shadows, but rather in plain sight. That patronizing tone, after all these years, and he still looked down on him. Something within him snapped as he laid there, getting buried within the collapsed cave. The cave exploded with a blast as a gigantic, magenta-colored toad shot out of the destroyed cave, in an enormous cloud of smoke, with a bloody Jiraiya on its head. His cry was filled with raw, unadulterated hate as the air seemingly rippled with the intensity of his roar as he poured out his lungs. Orochimaru. At a distance from the site, a figure watched the scene. Silent and contemplating when he noticed something truly bizarre. He raised hands in front of him and what he saw confused him. Hum. What is this? My hands are shaking. It could not be fear, he convinced himself. He was the savior of the world. What is this supposed to mean? There wasn't anything left that could scare him. After all, his teacher was the boogeyman of the entire shinobi world. He shifted slightly as he noticed a new figure emerge from the ground by his side. Obito. You're scared of the toad sage, right? Right? Isn't that why you ran away? You were afraid that Snakey and Frogman would team up against you. Even if you somehow tricked the snake using your Sharingan like before, you cannot take on two of the three legendary Sanin by yourself. Na 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 not yet, not yet, the figure said, alternating between a sly and a childish persona. The being had a grotesque appearance. Half black, half white body that resembled a plant more than it did a human. The now named Obito looked at it for a while as he formed his response. You talk too much, Zetsu, he said darkly. I'm scared of no one. I fear nothing. I am no one, and I have nothing to lose. 
The whole concept of me being afraid of a couple of men pushing their fifties is ridiculous. Ridiculous but not impossible. Tell me. Why did you let the toad sage flee? He'll create mischief. The figure was now standing beside the masked man, a deranged smile on its black and white visage. Jiraiya of the Sanin does not interest me. He is of no use to our plans. His meddling can only cause us minor problems, at best. Zetsu smiled bemusedly at his partner's answer. He really was underestimating the toad sage. Jiraiya was someone who stood firm on his ideals, hence it wasn't possible to lure him with the promise of power or riches. Even the promise of beautiful women won't attract the perverted man enough to join their cause. Obito was not even twenty, and he was already stronger than Orochimaru, although barely. The Sharingan was his primary weapon, more prominently the Kamui and Genjutsu, but it was not an unbeatable technique. After all, Minato did manage to injure him. Even though he was barely fourteen at the time and Minato was, and still is, the fastest shinobi ever, and Obito had become even stronger since then, it was not an impossible thought that someone might be able to beat his Kamui again. And Orochimaru and Jiraiya were legends on their own. He was just too overconfident to admit it. On to other matters, tell me about the situation in Kirigakure. Whoa, kid. You can't go in there like that. Tenzo looked offended for a second before he realized what the chunin meant as recognition flickered in his eyes. Oh, don't worry, he said casually, waving his hand dismissively. I'm not showing anything that the public won't like. The chunin looked at him in concern and pity. Did you perhaps not hear the crowd booing you after your shameless stunt? The fire daimyo especially said to warn the pantless genin about etiquette. Just how delusional was he? That stopped him in his tracks. If this was indeed bothering the daimyo, then this was a severe issue. He spied his half torn pants in the arena, still stuck in Kuritsuchi's quick lime. So those were out. Danzo Sama's voice sounded in his head. The three of you will carry the reputation of our great village on your shoulders. Do not do anything that throws dirt on our name. Kino, do not forget the objective. Failure is not an option. He had no problems with fighting half naked. They don't actually have any decency in route so that the agents could be desensitized to stuff like this, but he was never taught if he could do it in front of nobles and daimyos. But, I don't have anything else to wear with me. All of my spare clothes are in our room, and I'm not going to wear anything that you give me. My uniform is an important part of me. He would rather fight naked than wearing something other than his root uniform. It felt like betraying the man who gave him purpose. The Chunin looked at him, entirely unamused. He would rather be anywhere else, but since Killer B got bored and fled the exams altogether, he had to do the work. Well then, you're, the bonus match will be a one versus one, instead of the three-way due to the third participant being, indisposed. Naruto looked at the stands where he could see his friend sitting, his brows furrowed in concern. He could see why they would disqualify him, but still, it didn't seem right. Clothing, or lack of, could be used as a weapon in the hands of a capable shinobi. But this was more of an extra match than anything, only for the entertainment of nobles. Watching a pantless genin duke it out in the arena was not exactly their idea of entertainment. Will he be all right? He asked Izumi, who was currently standing in front of him in the arena. She had no tears in her clothing, nor any blood on her body, she looked the same as she did at the start of the third round, amazingly. On the other hand, Naruto looked like a mess, what with his haphazardly bandaged back and sweaty, wild blonde hair. Fortunately, his trousers and orange shirt were not as tattered where he could be disqualified for nudity. Of course, she replied quietly, looking over to Tenzo in the stands, who waved at them. His promotion is entirely deserved and obvious. After all, he did beat the Suchikage's granddaughter. Right. Although, he said, grinning slightly, that means now you can't team up with him to beat me. Izumi arched an eyebrow. Oh. Such arrogance. She shook her head as if scolding a child. Perhaps, someone is still riding the adrenaline rush from their last fight. It's not arrogance when I have the perfect counter to your pink eye. A pathetic attempt to rile me up, I see, by making fun of my clan's prized bloodline limit. She didn't even twitch as she spoke in a tone that was much too similar to that of Uchiha Fugaku's for Naruto's taste. It seemed like mastering her Sharingan was not the only thing that her father helped her in. He dreaded to think what Sasuke might turn out to be like in the future if left in the Uchiha Patriarch's influence. The young boy was plenty annoying as it was. He shrugged in response. 
The Kumo Chunin raised his hand in the air and looked over to the two participants, receiving a nod from both of them. The final match begins now. He lowered his hand and flickered out of the arena. The two genin didn't move at first, having a silent conversation through their eyes. Naruto raised his right hand, which was mirrored by Izumi as they made a half ram sign. This won't go anything like back then. Their fingers intertwined in the familiar seal of unison, and Naruto met her eyes confidently. Izumi smiled a little. I would be most disappointed if it does. Her lips thinned into a line, and the two of them broke off, leaping backward to make some distance between them. Almost as if acting on an invisible signal, the two of them breezed through hand signs, the movement fast but not impossibly so. Stopping herself into the seal of ram, Izumi took in a long breath, filling up her lungs as she arched back her neck. This was one of the jutsu that her father helped her in. A jutsu that could even be said to be the signature of an Uchiha. And then she exhaled. Fire style, great fireball. On the other side of the arena, Naruto smiled as he watched the giant ball of fire approaching him. The sheer size of it was more than double than what he knew that she was capable of. That was a massive improvement. It rushed toward him, looking as if it would eat anything in its way. It will eat me if I don't do anything, but she wasn't the only one who had improved. He finished his hand signs later than what might have been ideal, something he blamed on the lack of a water body nearby. His ability to use wood style granted him a highly potent affinity of water and earth. His water affinity, in particular, was on an unnatural scale which allowed him to extract water out of the atmosphere, but he was still not skilled enough to do it without the long chain of hand seals. He finished building his chakra with the sign of bird, almost too late because the fireball had already covered half the distance, and then let it go. Water style. Water dragon jutsu. Izumi watched with slightly widened eyes as a blue dragon emerged from out of thin air and clashed against the giant ball of fire. His steam. The area was filled with a rush of hot steam as the two chakra constructs collided, and she lifted up a hand up to her face to guard herself against the uncomfortable pressure. Her field of view was blocked by the steam as she darted her eyes left to right, looking for her rival. Where could he be now? She blinked, activating her Sharingan for a split second, and saw multiple chakra signatures closing in on her. Although all of them were the same. The steam obscured her view, but she could faintly make out the blue outlines shadow clones, then. She was almost insulted that Naruto felt that this would work on her. Clang. In an instant, she had flipped out two kanai as she blocked two blades simultaneously, from her front and back. Their hands vibrated with the tension as her black eyes met the violet of her friends. There was something in those eyes that warned her. The confidence of a person whose plan was yet to unfold. Izumi glanced down in a split second, feeling something beneath the ground just in time to jump as the ground tore open and two hands darted out to drag her in. Good trap, she commented, but not N, she was cut off the next second by a vicious punch to her cheek. Even if she had noticed it earlier, she could not dodge while midair. A two-layered trap. The force behind the punch made her flip in the air before she was sent skidding to the ground, finally managing to stop in a crouch. She slowly reached up and traced the back of her fingers on her mouth, feeling the warm and wet feeling of blood, and smiled. I'm almost impressed. You were never this cunning. The steam cleared slowly, and the outline of a person was faintly visible before Naruto walked out of it, his clothes wet and sticking to his body. Your mistake was that you let your guard down, assuming that my trap was complete. He smiled as he stopped at a distance from her, neither too close nor too far. I've changed in a lot of ways since the last time we sparred. It has been months, after all. Izumi stood up, wiping the smile off her face as she adorned a hardened expression. So have I, she leaned forward and shot towards him, armed with a kanai. Naruto spun on his heel, dodging a stab to his face as he grabbed her forearm. She let the weapon drop from her grasp and attempted to swipe his legs beneath him, making him jump over it. The two of them backflipped and disengaged, you should use your Sharingan. It won't be fair if I did, she shook her head. I want to see who's stronger and you clearly are at a disadvantage because of your restrictions. It was preposterous to think that he could keep up with her if she used her bloodline limit while he could not use his own. No matter how much he had improved. Take a chance. He grinned confidently. You might be surprised. Well, he asked for it. She closed her eyes, and when she opened them this time, they were the familiar red and black of Sharingan. Naruto smiled and averted his eyes almost instantly 
now looking pointedly at her arms and legs. In an instant, he had to sidestep as a fist brushed past his cheek, almost touching it. The two of them were in a frenzy of attacks. She countered each one of his moves gracefully, almost too easily that it frustrated him to no end. But then he supposed it was what he had asked for. He received a punch to his nose for his troubles, something he did not see coming, and stumbled back, imbalanced. He was not given any time to recover when he received an elbow to his gut which made him fold upon himself, his eyes wide and mouth open in a silent scream as spit flew out of it. Arg! Another lightning fast combo and he was sent sprawling to the ground. His nose was throbbing with piercing pain, almost as if someone had hammered a nail on it. He gingerly raised his hand and touched it, still laying flat on the ground, and sucked a hissing breath through clenched teeth. He knew that she had always hit hard, but this was insane. He heard footsteps and forced his body to move, something which was getting extremely painful, and rolled on the ground to avoid a kanai which embedded itself on the ground where he was laying just now. His Naruto's eyes widened in terror, almost impossibly, as he scrambled to move away from the offending paper bomb. Boom. Although avoiding the brunt of it, he slowly uncurled and shakingly got up, stumbling back a few times. The smoke made him cough in his hand when he felt something wet as he checked his palm. Blood. Out of the smoke walked out Izumi, and he almost cringed away from the cold blood red eyes. The eyes made him feel like an insect in front of them. I only asked you to use your Sharingan, he said slowly, his voice somewhat high pitched due to his ruined nose, not to come at me as if I stole all your Pocky. He has never done that, on an important note, she frowned, deactivating her Sharingan. You are holding back on me. I dislike it. Ah. He twitched, rubbing the back of his head as he chuckled sheepishly. So, you saw through it. The dull, unimpressed stare was his only response. Of course, she did. The two of them knew each other like the back of their hands. Her black eyes bled into the red once more as she rushed at him, leaning towards the ground. If he was still going to hold back against her, she would force him. She hated being underestimated. Naruto smiled mischievously, almost as if he was going to do something that he knew was going to annoy her, as he leaned to his left. The stabbing kanai only stabbed air when he suddenly blurred into a trail of orange, something that made her widen her eyes. Her Sharingan could still track it, but that speed was too much. Her body couldn't keep up with him at such high speeds. She frowned, twisting and blocking a strike from her back. A fist inched closer to her, and she had no time to dodge or block the swinging strike and she felt her head snap sideways from the force behind it. Too fast. When the match had started, I and Onoki watched with feigned disinterest, leaning back in their seats and only creaking a single eye open. Now, the large man was at the edge of his seat, and the tiny man was floating in his chair. The rakage could feel his hot blood pumping for the rush of a good fight as he watched the battle between two Gen and Shinobi. But there was something that was still nicking at the back of his head. For some reason, I don't quite like the brat. There was just something about him that raised flags in his mind. A simple jutsu like Shunshin was nothing to bat an eye at. But that speed, finally, something that we can agree on, the old Suchikage said, floating up in his seat in interest. The two leaders shared a look and glanced at the Hokage, who looked to be in deep thought. There was a nagging feeling in the back of his mind that begged him to listen to it, but he was reluctant to do so. He was torn between following his intuition something that he had honed upon decades of experience, or believe in the facts. The resemblance was uncanny, other than the eyes and facial structure. He had never actually witnessed the boy in a life or death battle before this. Still, now that he was observing carefully, the overwhelming feeling that he was in the presence of two legendary shinobi in the making was too familiar for his tastes. He had witnessed the same feeling twice. Once was when he was teaching his prodigious student, Orochimaru, Odd over the genius of his student. He still blamed himself for the way that his student turned out to be. And another when he watched a young Namikaze breezing past all the challenges in front of him. The one person who is still the pride and joy of the village of Konoha, even after his death. Minato. Watching the battle with the gaze of someone befitting the title of the god of Shinobi, Sarutobi Hirazan wished he had his pipe with him right now to calm this incoming headache. Izumi furrowed her brows in frustration as she failed to connect yet another blow. The three Tomo in her Sharingan spun as she swung around, watching carefully when Naruto vanished in yet another blur. She could almost see the smug face of Shisui, something she wanted to punch with all her strength. 
it was not hard to imagine who helped Naruto in fighting against the Sharingan. A blow to the back of her head rattled her as she was sent tumbling. Do you want me to hold back? Your pink eye is not working, it seems. Try to get under her skin, make her lose her cool. It works the best on calm and composed types like her. I should know. The voice of his mentor rung into his ears, he really had to give it to Shisui. He blinked in confusion when he heard a quiet growl. That confusion turned to surprise and unease when he saw that Izumi was the one making the sound. Seems like his plan worked too well. He had never actually seen her this frustrated. He was so unfamiliar with this side of her that he forgot to move. You're annoying. She pounced on him with wild strikes, losing all sense of calm as she proceeded to come at him unpredictably fast, making him dodge desperately lest he gets stabbed. He barely flickered away on time to avoid an overhead kick, his eyes wide and his breathing a little heavy. His plan had worked too well, it seems, that it has backfired on him. Izumi shot off in the air, her hands in a flurry of signs. Fire style. Phoenix fire jutsu. He quickly slid out his blade and swung it thrice, concentrating the water-natured chakra on its length, watching as the comparatively smaller balls of fire descended upon him. Consecutive slashing strikes of the water god technique. Izumi visibly twitched upon hearing the name. Hiss. The water and fire constructs clashed against each other as the hot steam obscured their field of view yet again. Naruto crouched low as he anticipated his friend's next attack. The fact that even after he had increased his speed, Izumi was slowly catching up to him was quite concerning, but he could not deny one thing. She really was a genius. Izumi walked out of the steam, her stride now carefully composed and slow, just like her stoic expression. He blinked when she disappeared altogether. Only a split second, and he had already broken the genjutsu, he must have accidentally looked into her eyes. He had extensively practiced breaking Sharingan genjutsu, and it showed. However, a split second was all that she needed. He widened his eyes when he ended up on his back, feeling a weight on his midsection as he found himself looking into the dark, satisfied eyes of his rival. Her face was close enough that he could feel her warm breath on his face. Close enough for him to actually notice her face for once, her pale and unblemished skin and her small, pink lips that were now curled up into a smile. He could even smell the blood smeared on her face. Never had he ever found himself so mesmerized with something. Not even the kanai that was stopped dangerously close to his forehead could bother him. Beautiful, his quiet mutter was apparently not heard by her, judging by the lack of response. The word was spoken not in terms of finding one physically attractive, he was not quite at that age right now. But he did find himself comparing her to the description of an angel descended from the heavens. She tucked a strand of black hair behind her ear and leaned forward. His breath hitched as she reached down to his ear and whispered. I win. She assumed that he would be annoyed, but what actually happened confused her. Naruto smiled, making her blink in surprise as he chuckled quietly. What? This won't go anything like back then, he quoted himself at the start of the match. The thing that confused Izumi and made her frown was that the voice did not come from below her, but instead from behind her. And the cold touch of steel on the back of her neck was not something that was lost on her. So, he managed to sneak a clone past her but that seemed for not now as she observed him. His eyes were starting to droop low, and his breathing became slow. His opponents were significantly stronger when compared to the two chumps that she breezed past. It was surprising that he managed to hold on his own for so long. He was so tired that he didn't even look away when her eyes spun into a mixture of red and black. Did I, do well? Yes, she said gently, smiling, and her voice sounded like a lullaby to him. You did more than well rest now. He found himself losing consciousness as he drowned himself in those blood-red eyes that he found so mesmerizing. He couldn't even see it within himself to get upset at losing against her as he felt peaceful silence encompass his being, a smile on his face. Izumi didn't turn around when the clone dispelled itself with a pop. The cheering of the crowd as people went ballistic never managed to reach his ears. You may not like him, but you can't possibly deny his potential as a shinobi. The Hokage got up from his seat as he looked at the other leaders. The boy was undeniably outmatched but almost managed a draw. There was a serene smile on his wrinkled face. He was no doubt proud of his shinobi, all three of them. The future of Konoha was going to be in good hands, it would seem. The Rakage grunted. His face turned sour as he let out reluctantly, your genin are not half bad, Hokage. 
He was upset that Kumo was not the one to win, but he would not waste any time whining about it. His genin better prepare for one hell of training assignment. Onoki scoffed but did not say anything. His gaze, however, did not leave the blonde haired genin. He would rather go and die in a ditch before praising a shinobi from Konoha. But that didn't mean he would ignore the undeniable potential. Senju Tsunade was the granddaughter of the first Hokage, Senju Hashirama. But that was not all that she was. Her qualifications were countless. Famed throughout the entire world as the best medic in shinobi nations, she was also known as the most beautiful Kunoichi among the five nations, one of the legendary Sanin, student of the God of Shinobi, and the strongest of the three in raw strength. Add in her fiery temper, and no one in the shinobi world would try to mess with her without at least thinking twice. She was born and raised in Konoha and spoiled at a young age as the princess of the Senju clan. However, broken over the death of her beloved brother and her lover, Tsunade decided that she had enough of being a kunoichi and left her village with the permission of her teacher, who agreed reluctantly. There was not much the man would deny her, and he understood the pain of losing one's loved ones. Although he was disappointed in her, something that made her feel sick to her stomach, she kept enduring. And hence, taking her young apprentice Shizun with her, who was also the niece of her late lover, she set forth to venture the faraway lands and finally settled within the fire capital close to her ancestral grounds which were now unfortunately abandoned, where she spent her life in isolation. Oink oink, no, tun tun. Stop. The sound of someone running on the wooden surface reached her ears as she poured a sake in her cup. As always, Shizun was chasing after their pig, tun tun, who always did his best to annoy the dark-haired girl. Crash. She watched dispassionately as the duo ran amuck around her and somehow managed to crash on her table, spilling all her sake. The blonde-haired woman slowly turned towards the offending members that lived with her and casted a dull glare at them, prompting the two to freeze. She zune. Ak. Oink. That. Was my whole stock for this week. She shouted grabbing the two of them in a headlock as she proceeded to choke them. Shizun flailed her arms, and the poor pig squealed in terror. That was when the door opened, and she blinked, finding herself looking at the messed up form of her teammate and friend. Looking lively as always. Jiraiya shouted as he leaned against the doorframe. He grinned and then proceeded to laugh boisterously, only to cringe in pain as he did. Ah. Jiraiya. Worried about me. Bah. I've had worse. This is only a scratch. See? He boasted shamelessly, wringing his shoulder. Snap crack crack. Ack. No. No. Which probably wasn't the best of the ideas. You fool. Don't do that. Tsunade broke out of her stump but she did not approach his form. What happened? Jiraiya-sama. Shizun, now free of the headlock, ran past her teacher and rushed towards the injured form of the toad sage. Her hands glowed green as she ran a quick diagnosis on the white-haired man. Her eyes widened. Tsunade-sama, he needs your help. The brown-haired woman visibly hesitated as she saw the blood on her friend's body. She bit her lip. I, I can't. But, but Tsunade-sama, he will lose his arm if he doesn't get immediate help, the young woman protested out loud. Tsunade looked away in shame, averting her eyes. The sight of blood still made her uneasy, which was ironic considering her status as the most excellent medic. Jiraiya smiled sadly as he watched the pitiful form of the only woman that he truly ever loved. The sight was almost enough to break him out of his pain. I've been following Orochimaru, she snapped her head back at him, her eyes wide. He did this to you? Jiraiya. I told you to give up on him. She shook her head. You never did listen to me. I gave up. His voice was so quiet and miserable that Tsunade had to strain her ears to hear it. Her brown eyes widened, and she felt sorrow for her teammate. Jiraiya has always been adamant about bringing back the one whom he considered his best friend. The two of them had countless arguments over it whenever he came over to visit them, which was as frequent as once a month. Shizun watched the interaction between the two legends as she tried her best to heal the injured man. Tsunade-sama, please, he needs your help. Jiraiya ignored Shizun fretting over him and looked at his ex-teammate, wondering how exactly was he going to break this information to her. This was not something that could be considered insignificant by any chance, especially since Tsunade thought of herself to be the last of the Senju. So, he chose the only method that he knew. The Senju bloodline still lives painfully blunt. What? Two days passed since the end of the Chunin exams. 
Naruto and his team were on their way out of the village of Kumo, moving towards the fire country. The two days were given for the finalists to rest and recover. Samui and Darui were promoted to Chunin rank by the Rakage, but since the other leaders had already left for their respective villages, none of the others were promoted as of yet. Kakashi was taking point as the three of them followed him, his book nowhere in sight. The past few days have been mentally tiring for him, to say. The talk with the Hokage had been more than informative for him. He subtly looked over to the blonde haired Genin from the corner of his eye as he tried to wrap his mind around the situation. Kakashi stood in attention in front of his leader. The two of them were standing at an isolated spot near the border of Kumo as they conversed. He was feeling a little unease because of the old leader's silence, but his posture did not show his nervousness. The masked Janin had expressed his findings and theories in front of the Hokage. His intuition was telling him that there was something that connected his teacher with the younger boy. And he had learned to trust his intuition instead of the facts a long time ago. You know, Kakashi, the Hokage said slowly, turning away from his subordinate. His tone was filled with sorrow as he spoke, Minato did have a son, once upon a time. Kakashi snapped his head back to his leader, his mouth half open under his mask. The Hokage took a deep breath as his shoulders drooped low. The old man seemed to age right in front of the young Jonin's eyes. What? He didn't even realize that he had spoken out loud. A nod from the Hokage. Yes, but the child died shortly after his birth. It was the day that Minato changed forever. He was still kind to his people, but he was needlessly merciless to his enemies. He used to hesitate at his every kill, the guilt used to eat at him. But after that incident, he shook his head. Minato became a nightmare on the battlefield, a nightmare that killed its foes beautifully. A nightmare to his allies and enemies, all the same. Kakashi had been shocked to his core. His teacher had never talked about this. To some extent, he felt betrayed that Minato didn't trust him enough. But Kakashi knew enough about scars. Poking at them would only end in hurt. Kakashi knew enough about scars, for he had too many of them to count. He still wasn't ready to give up on his theory, but he would wait for now. What's wrong with Kakashi-san? Tenzo asked his teammates as the three of them followed their squad leader. He seems disturbed. Izumi spied the Janin, noticing his tense shoulders and stiff movements as she furrowed her brow. He's conflicted, she spoke softly, her voice even. Between what and what? Tenzo waited for an answer, but he was ignored by Izumi as she tilted her head to look at her friend, who was looking ahead attentively. You know, she spoke, I still don't know when you made that last shadow clone. Naruto blinked as he realized that he was being asked a question. A cheeky smile came over his face something that she had become incredibly familiar with. When you were growling. He laughed as she elbowed him in the ribs. Uchiha Izumi never growled. Anyone who claimed otherwise was clearly out of their mind. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.